good morning, everybody. Right on time, 9 o'clock. Uh, do uh, we have any uh, public speakers? Good morning, Mr. Chair. We have four members of the public registered to speak That's today. Okay. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware of the clock in the front of the room and the warning light you will see, reminding you that you have 30 seconds left to conclude your remarks. The first speaker will be Jason Anthony. Following will be Charlton D'Souza, followed by Murray Bowden. Good morning, Danny. Good morning, David. Happy holidays. Thank you, and good morning to you, too. Always good to see you with nice a smile. See, nice to see you, too, David. Uh, Jason Anthony here, another month this time in person. Uh, Danny, why you guys don't change the traffic patterns to the Queens Midtown Tunnel in Manhattan? Because every time I go through there, especially on the Manhattan side, it's a nightmare. Especially on 2nd Avenue and 34th Street. Because it's always a traffic nightmare. Every time I take the M34 set at bus service, either the regular or the A, it takes me over 30 minutes to get from Midtown West to Midtown East. It takes me forever to take to my doctor's appointments due to the traffic patterns of the Queen's Midtown Tunnel. Why you guys don't come out to another alternative to the traffic patterns that drivers don't make a left when they are at 2nd Avenue to access the Queen's Midtown Tunnel? Because every time I walk north on 2nd Avenue between 34th and 38th Street, I see drivers making left to access the Queens Midtown Tunnel instead of making right to access the Queens Midtown Tunnel. Why do you guys don't change the traffic patterns to access the Queens Midtown Tunnel? That make it easier to alleviate traffic along 34th Street and 2nd Avenue. Because it will make it much easier to alleviate traffic, especially uh, on a major cross town street like 34th Street. I'll see you guys on the commuter rails. Thank you. The next speaker is Charlton D'Souza, followed by Murray Bowden. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Charlton D'Souza, president of uh, Passengers United. And what I want to talk about is how is congestion pricing going to be implemented properly because you have so many people around the city with license plates that they have tape on them, they're painting them, they're blocking the numbers, and the MT is losing money from toll evaders. So this is something that really has to be cracked down on. Um, I don't think it's fair that someone gets arrested in the subway. Obviously, you know, we have to get subway crime under control. I understand that. But at the same time, you have you know, hundreds of people every day dodging the fares, I mean, dodging the tolls on the uh, roadways. And that is going to lead to a financial, really bad problem down the road. So we have to get this under control. Um, and also we need to figure out, you know, um, with the exemptions now and all the stuff has to be figured out. Um, I think New Jersey, like I said before, should get some funding for the PAT train and for New Jersey Transit if we are to make congestion pricing successful. And we also have to give Connecticut some money as well. So like this, because their drivers are coming in the city, they shouldn't have to, you know, take up uh, the burden. And also we need to really improve our express bus service. Um, and this is with all the redesigns. And I think the LIE, um, the Brooklyn Battery, all these, uh, uh, bridges and tunnels, they need to have better bus lanes. Um, that is something that really the MT needs to work on, at least for next year. Um, 
otherwise the gridlock, uh, the holiday gridlock that we've all been experiencing, uh, it is bad out there. Um, the other day I was stuck on a bus for like 35 minutes coming into the Midtown Tunnel. So yeah, we've got to get that traffic under control. Well, hopefully another week or so it'll be under control. Um, I just wanted to wish all of you, uh, David and the whole committee, a very uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you. The next speaker is Murray Bowden, followed by Christopher Greif. Well, for more years than I care to remember, I've been standing here saying, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? Why don't you fix the road lines? I've been talking about the wrong problem. The real problem is this little thing. It's a receptacle. It goes on a wall where you plug everything in. They, uh, Danny, turn around. Right behind you is this little thing. There's only one thing wrong with that one behind you. The law says the hole has to be on the bottom, not at the top. And if you look at the card, it says, check it out yourself. The building code, you all know that when you plug something in now, the cord is a flat cord. It isn't straight out anymore. And it all points down. So why is the one behind you right there? Turn around. It's up. It holds up. Because I had somebody check it before I thought of this. And that's the story of the road lines. Those traffic engineers have been doing it wrong for years and years and years, and nobody bothered to said the hole has to be on the bottom. Danny, you're the president. It's your team that's making the mistake. As I said to Rick Cotton, it's your job to fix. That's what we pay you for. Your team is breaking the law with the road lines. If you can't get your team in order, uh, Dave, you'll have to get a new president from Bridges and Tunnels. Danny, it's your responsibility to make sure that team follows the law as currently written. <clears throat> yeah, there are errors in the manual. We'll fix them. But start at fate, the one that, this early dementia, fellas. Um, as it's written now, with its errors, follow it. Because there's enough in there. Start to change. I'll be back. Thank you. The next speaker is Christopher Greif. Good morning. I'm Christopher D. Greif. Happy holidays to everyone. I want to thank the bridge and tunnels because due to the fact the work had to be done on the Marine Park Bridge, there was plenty of notices going out to other parts of Brooklyn to warn customers that the bridge will be closed from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So I do want to thank that that was being done because there were some issues with the Marine Park Bridge, especially the Q35 bus. Thank God we did have a detour for that bus during those times. So I do want to thank Bridge and Tunnels on that because that bridge is the one that goes from Queens to Brooklyn, but I will call it the back end of Queens into the front of part of Brooklyn which is a upside down, confusing way. But the bottom line was the work had to be done. Electrical work had to be done because of winter season. There was always some issue with the bridge getting stuck or getting non-stuck. Especially, I do want to wish everyone a happy holidays. And again, thank you, Bridge and Tunnels, for fixing the Marine Park Bridge because a lot of people were pleased on that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, that concludes the public comment. Okay, again, uh, also, I want to wish everyone a happy holiday uh, season, healthy, healthy one too. Um, uh, I need an approval of the minutes. Uh, <clears throat> I need a motion. Uh, any, uh, <clears throat> any questions, corrections? Andrew, nothing today? Okay, good. <clears throat> okay. Uh, <clears throat> committee chair, uh, uh, <clears throat> President uh, Danny, will you take care of uh, <clears throat> the uh, the agenda? Thank you, Chair Mack. So just to start off um, about changes in the committee work plan, you know, annually in December, uh, this meeting, the B&T committee work plan for the following year is proposed, and then any changes 
are approved in the January meeting. B&T's proposed 2023 work plan starts on page eight of the committee book and has been updated with the following changes to the committee agenda. The November 2022 financial report is included in this month's committee materials. Reporting of the final review of the 2022 year-end operating results will occur in May of 2023, which is consistent with the reporting of the other agencies. The third quarter 2022 diversity report for bridges and tunnels is included in this month's committee materials. I've been advised that there will be an MTA-wide diversity report provided by the Department of Diversity and Civil Rights at the Diversity Committee. With that being said, I'll start on my, my uh, December remarks. So good morning. Thank you. So good morning and welcome to the December 2022 MTA Bridges and Tunnels Committee meeting. I would like to start this final B&T Committee meeting of 2022 by acknowledging the efforts of B&T employees throughout yet another challenging year. From the early Omicron variant surge to the current more normal, our workforce focused on the goals set forth in early of 2022, which was customer and employee safety and improved customer experience, revenue recovery and protection of critical toll revenue that B&T generates, which supports more than ever mass transit. As the year progressed and our traffic rebounded, the pre-pandemic levels, we found ourselves getting back to basics, all while ensuring a high level of service, whether in the field or the back office. I'm very proud of this agency and recognize the team's tremendous efforts, especially as we adapted and changed with each new challenge. As we close the door in 2022, I'd like to touch upon some of the milestones and achievements based on the goals that I outlined. Safety. Relative to safety of our employees and customer, customers, our overall collision rate so far this year has improved from 2021 by a little over 1%. When compared to 2019, we are seeing a 36% improvement. So when you look at the traffic from 2019, record-breaking traffic, and where we are today, uh, that shows that the work we've done since 2019 through the pandemic is, uh, is, is still there uh, with a 1% below last year. Our employee loss time injury rate has also improved year over year, which uh, Eric will go through in a little while in the uh, safety report. Regarding customer experience, our workforce in the field kept pivoting throughout the year to accommodate challenging traffic tra trends during the COVID-19 cycles as the traffic rebounded to pre-pandemic numbers. So getting back to basics, providing time timely and correct customer messaging, quick response to disabled vehicles and other incidents, maintaining clear roadways and clean facilities. All these things are noticed by customers and underscore a sense of safety and a security for our customer environment. So I'm proud to say that going back to basics and when we go through our maintenance report in a couple of months, you'll see the work that was being done throughout the course of the year to keep those facilities clean and safe. Revenue recovery and protection. We have a layered approach to revenue recovery and protection, utilizing all B&T departments and coordinating with our city and state law enforcement partners and other agencies such as the New York Department of Motor Vehicles. Through these efforts, we are moving the needle in the right direction on covered obstructed license plate enforcement. I look forward to sharing more of these achievements in 2023 and providing some detail as we close out the year. For now, I'd like to share that our enforcement of persistent toll violators whose registrations have been suspended has resulted in a $20 million recovery so far this year, which is the highest single year recovery and one third of the $60 million that we have recovered since 2016. Again, more on those stats in the coming months as we close out the year. Shifting to current news, on the last day of November, we passed a noteworthy milestone with 300 million vehicle crossings. In comparison, our record highest traffic year of 2019, with more than 330 million crossings, we also reached that 300 million mark in late November. So we're on track to that pre-pandemic record-breaking year. As I mentioned, 2022 was a productive year on all accounts for B&T, and I would like to thank all of our employees for their hard work and dedication across operations, maintenance, security, and safety and health. I also want to acknowledge the expanding role of the Intelligent Transportation Systems and Tolling Team for their fine work and heavy lifting they've been doing, especially over the past year. In addition, I'd like to extend gratitude to our consolidated business partners chiefly construction and development, human resources, labor relations, law and procurement, the Office of Management and Budget, as well as many departments within MTA headquarters. 
We work closely with them every day and appreciate their support of our mission. I would also like to thank all of you, our commissioners, the entire MTA board, and Chair Jana Lieber for your ongoing guidance and support throughout the year. I speak, for, I speak on behalf of all my senior staff when I say we look forward to working together again next year with you and hopefully to share some new achievements and milestones. Finally, I wish everyone a peaceful, safe, healthy, and festive holiday season and a happy new year. This concludes my remarks. If there are no questions, I'll throw it to Vice President and Chief of Operations, Rich Hildebrand, for the report on operations. Any questions? Commissioner? Uh, no, uh, but I, I'm Hi. just going to make a comment. Yeah. Danny, congratulations to you and Rich. You've done a great job. <clears throat> and, uh, I personally have been here uh, 30 years or so <clears throat> more. Congratulations to both of you. I know you're uh, both a long time, but we do need more <clears throat> bridge and tunnel offices. The fare evasion is wild. The covered plates, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, defamed plates painted over, I see it all the time. I'm in the city. I'm in Long Island, I'm in New Jersey, uh, and all I can tell you is that we need more bridge and tunnel offices. We can't depend upon, unfortunately, the police department or the MTA, they have, uh, MTA police, they have a more important job to do, and that's to protect our transit system, and we can't distract from that. So uh, let us all get on the same bus <laughs> and car, and let's put in for it. That's it. Thank you. Commissioner so, Matt. So, Commissioner, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I just want to, uh, uh, Commissioner, I'm sorry. I see you on the screen. Just to speak to what Commissioner Max says, you stole a little bit of my thunder. So I was, I was, <laughs> I was waiting for this year to come to a close, and, uh, you know, because the numbers are always coming in. So when, when we're sending people toll bills and people are going through toll lanes, it's not an automatic, you know, like a toll booth back in the day when we knew exactly what was coming and going. So it takes a little while for the numbers to develop. But when I said we're moving the needle, you know, looking at the covered and obstructed plates, um, you know, I agree with you, more enforcement is better. Uh, that's why we've been working closely with our, our consolidated partners in law enforcement throughout the year. You saw me back in May uh, hold up a... a uh, clear, protected uh, cover, plate cover, you know, saying that this is illegal if this is on your car, because part of that was the enforce, uh, the education piece. So there's an enforcement piece and an ed education piece. And all the consolid uh, partners in our, uh, uh, for our regional policing and law enforcement, which is the state police, the sheriff's office, uh, the New York, uh, New York City uh, uh, Police Department, state police, Port Authority police, looking at this specific uh, cause of covered plates for different reasons, right? Because a covered plate is not specific to tolling, but it does impact tolling because there's a whole bunch of reasons why people cover their plates. So having that uh, push in May, working with Department of Motor Vehicles, working with the Motor Vehicle Commission in New Jersey, uh, I could say that the needle started to move and talking to my tolling group, we were able to bill uh, another million transactions compared to last year. And that, that could equate to another $10 million that we wouldn't have had last year. So I'm not lighting the cigar. I'm not running it off and, you know, taking my helmet off and screaming to the fans. But I just wanted to make a point that those efforts, and, and I'll, next month I'm going to go into a little more detail because a whole layered approach when it comes to that. But we are seeing that. So I applaud and I thank you for your support because, yes, the enforcement piece is a big piece of that. And again, it's a layered approach. And having all the regional partners working on one effort is, is uh, it, that helps us. So, uh, but thank you. Um, I'm sorry, there was, I'm sorry, there was a, yeah. somebody on the Hi, screen. Danny. So. Danny, this is Midori Valdivia. Um, can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, so yes. one, I wanted to extend my gratitude to all of you, the senior management team, but the people out in the field doing work. I know the snow season is coming up. And so I know there's a lot um, that you, you will all have to tackle. So Danny, um, you, your senior team, the amount of professionalism that you always show and um, your responsiveness to the commissioners really applaud that. So thank you so much. And then two, you know, I, you know, I understand you, you have big goals for 2023 
2023, um, given some of the data that you gave me back in November regarding traffic counts and how congested our bridges and tunnels are. Um, would love to talk more about, you know, the different ways that we would alleviate that and reduce travel times for all because, you know, they are paying a toll and, and we also have to make sure that we're working to reduce congestion. So thank you so much to your team for that. And I just wanted to voice my appreciation. No, thank you. And def that'll definitely be part of the narrative coming in, in 2023. Thank you so much. Commissioner Albert. So on this toll evasion fiasco that's going on everywhere, are photographs taken of the offending vehicles and are, are time of day and day of week check to see if this if these are repeat offenders and then you maybe could catch them when they come back at a specific time or day? Uh, I'm going to answer that. Uh, uh, I've been with uh, three police departments, law enforcement, for the last 60 years uh, in management. Uh, Andrew, you cannot track the plate. The only way you can get them is if you are there when the commits, the crime commits. Uh, time, effort, the numbers are blocked. So That's why I asked, uh, yeah, do you take a photo of the car so you have the color, absolutely. the description? So, right, so what Commissioner Mack is saying, so we call it unbuild, right, because mm -hmm. we're not getting a DMV hit back. Right. But through the task force that we put together, so, so during the course of, uh, of during COVID, we saw an, an increase of these covered plates. We asked our regional police partners, you've seen the same thing, the city, the state, everybody was seeing the same thing, sheriff's office, right? Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, how can we combat this? How can we look at this? So when we put the task force together, which is basically all my department heads and, and, and their representatives, um, you know, we looked at a, the, the tolling group looking at patterns, traffic patterns. So although we couldn't get a hit, like Commissioner Mack is saying, we're able to look at when are we seeing the most, when, when's the, the time and the place where we see the, the most unbillable coming through? And then we would put our resources there. So to, to give you an example, back in... Um, uh, June of 21, when we put together our task force, when we started seeing this increasing, within, within 30 minutes, we arrested three people for a fraudulent plate. And it was based on not the direct plate because we couldn't pick it up, but it was based on information of when they were coming through and what facility. So we said, okay, we saw it at this time. We put six, seven officers up there, and we made three arrests in a half hour. The reason I asked that was if somebody obscures their plate in the Hugh Carey Tunnel uh, toll area, and then you catch that same, by, by camera, that same vehicle evading the toll on the RFK mm -hmm. later in the day. You know, you have the car description. Could you then wait for that car? At, and that's, at what, and that's, that's how we use that information. And, we, and we're, we're looking at ways that when we do get them on the plaza, because now we have an interdiction, we're getting their pedigree now. Excellent. And now we can look back and to work with our tolling unit. And it's very labor intensive, but we have been back charging when we can. So. That's why I always say we're chasing the money. So we're chasing the money in, in different, different ways. Sounds like you know what you have to do. It sounds great. <laughs> Thank, you. Uh, Thank you. Andrew, and it is big money, uh, the, t uh, the tolls. Uh, I travel uh, back and forth from Jersey. My office is Jersey, Queens, and Long Island. <clears throat> I mean, it is just outrageous. But again, there is no solution except more bridge and tunnel offices to enforce not only the place for safety. There's no substitute for a uniform to deter any type of crime. No substitute, and that's 60 years. One more question. Um, it, they used to have it for toll evasion uh, when you went through a booth and you didn't pay, something lit up. Um, is there anything like any sound or any special light happening when a vehicle goes through and their plate is obscured, which is the same as not paying, for instance? Right. Not, not specifically for a plate being covered, but our persistent toll violator enforcement uses license plate reader technology, and an alert goes right into the officer's vehicle for the persistent toll violator. That's not specific to the The officer's ve vehicle is nowhere near that crossing, though, right? right. It could, the officer's vehicle could be anywhere on the facility could and would get anywhere. a ping to the car for the persistent toll violator. Everything, a lot of the other enforcement is done by observation and by the metrics that I described. Right. Thanks. Commissioner Glucksman, you had, you had something? 
you finally get the the person who has evaded the tolls, the but they have to pay it's exactly that amount plus fees. You don't do discounts or anything when negotiations. They just have to pay. Whatever. Well, if, if there's there's different ways. So if, so when we send a bill, it's similar to getting your cable bill, your phone bill, right? So if you don't pay for a while and then we send you fees, people may call and talk to our customer service uh, department and say, hey, I owe this, I owe that. How can I reconcile this? That's above and beyond what you know. What we what we are asking for, I'm asking for the toll. I want the toll. So as long as long as I get the toll money, that means I'm getting 100% of what you're supposed to owe me. Everything else is is the fees. That's part of the layered approach of combating the toll evasion. Sure. Thank you very much. You are. I don't know who was first. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you for all this this information. Have you seen? any reason why or patterns that people say that they are engaging in this behavior? Is it people that just want to just get slick? Or is it people that are saying, I'm in financial hardship, therefore I'm unable to pay, but I still need to make it to my place of work or something else? Are there patterns or reasons why people are telling once they get caught that they are doing this? So I, I know from reading the reports that Richie's group and operation sends me, but there's a, there's a, I mean, Rich, if you want to elaborate a little bit, but I know we get the spontaneous uh, the statement that the motorist makes and we record that. So we've heard from, I know I'm just about, well, the check's in the mail. Okay, that's a big one. Um, you know, I know I owe you money. Uh, I have no idea this is in my car. Like these are the type of things we, we hear. On the other end, to, to answer your question is specifically, through our customer service center, yes, I've seen complaints, not complaints come in, but inquiries come in of people saying that, uh, you know, I, maybe I lost my job or this happened or that happened, and then those are investigated and looked at through the customer service center. No, I, I didn't see that one yet, that they stole the car, no. This is uh, a petty theft, uh, but it's rampant. Commissioner Brown, you had something? Sorry. Yeah, not much. Uh, congratulations. It's a, it's a lot of scroll you're uh, collecting there. Um, I'm curious as to who the – so when you when you bust a guy for obscured plate, or you – I don't know, some bust is probably an overstatement. You, you know, you uh, summons a guy over uh, – um, an obscured plate, is he just liable for the, you know, fine for that element, or do you go back and trace how many we've seen of this particular distorted plate? Um, I mean, you're, you're going in the right direction. Uh, you know, I haven't heard any of this from any of the other agencies, but I'm sure Port Authority must have similar um, operation, but it's it's a lot of money, you know. Uh, just um, so, just what Commissioner Albert was asking, s similar to th that question a little bit. So, uh, with the covered plate, you know, and we thank the governor. So, last it wasn't last November, November before that, uh, the, the fines were increased uh, for covered obstructed plates. So that helps us. And there's other legislation out there that's trying. We're trying to. Uh, we're putting out there to try to combat this. Um, but if we do see someone with a, like I mentioned before, a, a covered plate, and we have them, and, we, and we're getting their pedigree now, we have them on our facility. Um, we do make special cases where it goes to our tolling group and our tolling group looks at these and we could build them back. So we could build them for maybe not as many and maybe not every single one, but we can go back and start to build them for what they, what they might have owed us based on the pictures that are being taken. So we're looking at that. That's part of our late approach. Rich, anything additional to that or? No, which is when you don't get a hit on the plate because it's obstructed or, you know, or, or modified. We don't have that frame of reference, but patterns, you know, we, we do identify some patterns and, and look at it, and in, in certain cases we can, you know, kind of backtrack. And uh, Port Authority, uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you what they do uh, as a former Port Authority commissioner. <clears throat> um, they have a police officer, Port Authority police officer, on every toll. So and as soon <clears throat> as they see an obstructed plate on the camera, it flashes as well as a no hit on a uh, easy pass, someone that hasn't paid. They're, as I said, they have <clears throat> a camera and they have a police officer there. 
And sometimes I see two or three officers because I go over the bridge at least three or four times a week <clears throat> and so forth. Again, Rich and Danny, this is, don't put whipped cream on it. You have to have enforcement. If you don't have people out there and you can't take the state police and you can't take MTA police <clears throat> and you can't take well, New York City police if you have anyone after the retirement <laughs> and, the, and everyone leaving, uh, uh, especially right now, as you could see, there's a new law that was passed in New York City. <clears throat> and that will not allow an officer to put in his computer when he stops someone whether there's formal violations. And, and that was passed, I think, last week or whatever. But well, anyway, nothing is substitute for bridge and tunnel officers at and believe me, you'll more than pay for it, as well as getting, giving the summons, that's revenue, as well as getting back our tolls. <coughs> and you won't have repeat violators. These people do it every day. So it's just, not once. The other committees are going to hate me, so I'm going to try to move this <laughs> along a little bit. Yeah. Um, so just uh, so thank you for the questions. I hope I answered your questions. Enough for me, so I'm going to turn it over to Rich of Report on Operations. Thank you very much, President DiCrescenzo, and thank you everyone for your support. The report on operations in this month's committee materials begins on page 14. Out of vehicular crossings, B&T continued to experience strong traffic counts that were slightly above pre-pandemic levels for the first full month of autumn. Paid vehicle traffic for October of 2022 was 28.3 million vehicles, an increase of 0.9% over the 28.1 million crossings we had in October of 2021, or about 8,000 more vehicles per day, and was 15.9% higher than October of 2020, with 3.9 million more crossings for the month, or 126,000 additional vehicles per day. When compared to the pre-pandemic month of October 2019, October of this year was 0.8% higher, with approximately 7,000 more vehicles per day authority-wide. Easy Pass market share was 95.2% for October of this year, which was slightly above both last year and two years ago. For November of 2022, preliminary B&T traffic was 0.3% higher than November of 21, 22.9% higher than November of 2020. Per preliminary traffic data, traffic for this year in November was essentially the same when compared to pre-pandemic traffic of November of 2019. Gasoline prices continue to decrease to an average of $3.73 per gallon in October of this year, and weather was not a significant factor on B&T's delivery of service. With the 2022 winter holiday season in full motion, we here at Bridges and Tunnels strive to provide safe and efficient travel for those heading out to visit family and friends in the coming weeks. As we look forward to the start of 2023 and the beginning of a brand new year, I'd like to thank my entire operations department at B&T, as well as our partner departments, for their support and coordination throughout the year. Without everyone working together, we could not do what we do. We look forward to a new year of continued safe and efficient delivery of service to our customers and wish everyone the happiest holiday season. And if there are no questions, that concludes this month's and this year's reports on operations. Thank you, Rich. <clears throat> um, next for the report on safety, Eric Osses. Thanks, Danny. The October 20, <clears throat> sorry, the October 2022 report maintains performance metrics to be generally positive as traffic volume continues to trend toward and within pre-pandemic pre levels. Uh, the highlights are as follows. BNT October 2022 total collision rate was 3.92 per million vehicles, low, lower than rolling year of 2019-2020, representing the beginning of the pandemic period. When compared to last year, results are the same. The collision with injury rate was 0.80 per million vehicles on par with year rolling year 2019-20, but higher than last year. However, the rate is still less than one collision per million crossings and below the two-year average of 0.86. Employee safety metrics for the 12-month periods are as follows. The employee lost time injury rate was 5.4 incidents per 200,000 work hours, lower than both last year and rolling year 1920. So that, that concludes the safety report. Yes, sir. So I, I notice every month when we look at these, and 
I'm, I'm guessing because it says per million vehicles, it isn't because there's just more vehicles on the Verrazano, but the highest collision rate can see, can, always seems to be on the Verrazano. Is there something in the traffic movement or the layout that is contributing to, to the higher rate than all the other bridges or tunnels? Because it's not just more traffic because this says per million vehicles. Right, so it's normalized per million vehicles. We're, we're constantly looking at the traffic patterns as well as behavior patterns that are going on in all of our assets. Uh, right now, I would say that we're in the middle of a paradigm shift, uh, how people are viewing work, how um, uh, schedules are being modified as a result of that, and we're looking to see if there are absolute patterns that can be associated with uh, different law enforcement strategies, different education strategies, a lot of it is just not one particular condition. Sometimes we may have a condition off property that uh, contributes to the uh, uh, total collision count for that month. So it's not just one thing. It's, uh, it's a constant evaluation of conditions. It's a constant evaluation of change that's occurring right now on how we are looking at work and how uh, our properties are recalibrating itself in relation to that paradigm shift. If an accident occurs either on the Belt Parkway or the Staten Island Expressway on the approaches to the bridge, is that considered a bridge accident? No, that's considered off property to, to my understanding. So if it's to the, it, it, our, our property lines are, are very uh, distinct and uh, we have an understanding of where the uh, uh, boundaries begin and end and how that's recorded in our statistics. Rich, if you, please, if you want to uh, render an opinion. No, Eric, you, you hit on the, uh, off, a lot of it's off property causing stop and go conditions on our bridges. To answer your off property, we work very well with our NYPD partners. And if what, you know, on occasion we will handle an accident report, a crash report for NYPD that's close to our property line, but we do have that line of demarcation where it does get either charged to the bridge or or not, um, but everything impacts traffic. So we, we we always work with our regional partners to to make that you know uh, safer and, and and more smooth as we consider you know the corridors between our facilities and between key points around the region. So we're constantly striving, constantly working on that. I just had a meeting with NYPD Highway District last week to discuss regional mobility and some improvements there. So I appreciate all of their partnership as well that they bring to the table. Uh, so with that, uh, there are no procurements this month for B and T. And if it's okay with you, Chair Mack, uh, that concludes my report for B&T. Oh, well, we got everyone hear me? Well, uh, I'd like a motion to adjourn and uh, thank everyone. And again, we'll see you next year.
We'll begin. I'm the uh, substitute chairman today, and I want to put it out front. I am not getting out of title pay. So uh, let's begin with a safety briefing, please. Your safety is of the foremost importance to the MTA. Therefore, we ask that you listen and adhere to the following instructions. If you witness an emergency, notify emergency personnel in the room and call 911 immediately. Please follow any audible instructions provided through the public address system or visually on screens in the event of an emergency. If an alarm sounds, wait for a public address announcement and follow instructions. If told to go to another floor or to evacuate the building, leave all unessential items behind and use stairwell A just across the main hallway or stairwell B down the hallway past the elevators. If you have a mobility disability or cannot self-evacuate, please proceed down stairwell D or E if instructed to go to another floor or evacuate the building. MTA staff or emergency personnel will assist you from there. An automated external defibrillator, AED, for use by trained personnel is in the main hallway just past the elevators. If you need assistance during an evacuation, please tell an MTA staff member or emergency personnel. Thank you and have a safe day. Okay, we'll begin with the public comments. Is there anyone here to speak today? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we have 11 members of the public registered to speak today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness, we will limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. We have seven in-person speakers and four remote speakers today. We will alternate two in-person and then two remote speakers. The first speaker will be Bruce Hain, followed by Jack Nirenberg. Good morning. This is the first time I've spoken in front of the Long Island Railroad, uh, Long Island Metro North uh, Railroad uh, Committee, and um, I'm hoping to double my minutes because I, <laughs> uh, the comment is directed to the um, uh, uh, Capital Projects uh, Committee as well. Um, it's d even with four minutes, it's, it's so impossible for me to write it down and then try and spiel it off or um, just try and spiel without knowing what I'm going to say because there are too many details. And to make it clear, you could find more clear uh, communication of what I'm trying to say on my website, which is called Bruce Haynes. So I'll use this as an opportunity to give my name as well as not my website, the YouTube channel, Bruce Hain, B R U C E E H A I N. So we've gotten that far, and um, now what was the next thing? Um, let's get one thing straight. Jamaica Station, all the platforms at Jamaica Station are 1,000 feet long. All the pre-existing platforms are 1,000 feet long. Now, nobody's going to contradict me on that, although people have. People at the station all think you can't stop a 12-car train at one of those platforms and have all the doors opposite the platform, but you can. All the people at the station seem to think that, and somebody, it seems to me, is propagandizing them to think it. But uh, the operators know better. And the reason you can't stay, you, you, you've had 12-car trains for 50 years with 85-foot cars. But you don't have any signal. The signals are in the middle of, of the platform. They're, sometimes they're near the end of the platform, but they're not out front where they need to be to stop 12-car trains. Now, with the current track configuration, you could expand platform A and platform B both to take 14-car trains if you want. So what is the big deal? And you wouldn't do that with uh, expanding the canopy. Just expand the platform if you need 14-car four uh, trains. But I don't think you do. 
I think you need not to change the configuration of those platforms. And as far as uh, the bridge, you know, there's no elevators in there, and I don't know if that's close as practically possible or not, practicably possible. But anyway, you're introducing these ladder tracks to get from Elmont to, um, to the main line. You are introducing directional conflicts on the main line of the Long Island Railroad. Now, I hope you people can understand. You don't want to introduce directional conflicts there. You should be working to get rid of directional conflicts. That's Queens interlocking. It should have been grade separated. It could have been grade separated with the Belmont Terminal grade separated as well. And not for a lot of money. It's easy to do that kind of stuff now. There is enough uh, linear feet there to do that, except the Elmont uh, uh, station, the platform there, where you jacked up the bridge and shored it up and moved the bridge over so that you could have a st five stations in the space of a mile. That platform blocks it, so it's very difficult to get it grade separated going west. So that's too bad. And the one that's already built, Oh, I guess we're finished. I never get to that one. I'm always about to talk about it. The next speaker is Jack Nirenberg, followed by Charlton D'Souza. Good morning, everyone. I am Jack Nirenberg, and I'm the Vice President of Passengers United. So if you recall, a, uh, a few months back, I was uh, explain that there's a need for uh, better passenger information displays, more particularly on the uh, M7 and M9 fleets where we have those uh, digital screens that are currently just showing advertising. And I mentioned that I have uh, renderings of what those uh, information displays could look like, so here they are. If, if, I'm not sure if you can see it here, but this is for the record. So as you can see, this would show a uh, much more comprehensive overview of uh, the train route, uh, ETAs as well, not just uh, the next stop, but upcoming stops as well, giving a much more, uh, a much better overview of uh, the uh, overall trip, as well as which cars would platform at those stations as well. And it would not just be uh, one single color. I think I, there was a misprint, but if you look at the uh, Babylon line, for example, it would show like this. Again, very readable. And uh, not only would you be uh, seeing those, but at major stations like Jamaica, for example, where uh, you have multiple tracks, many connections, and especially with the uh, new east side access timetables, which speaking of which, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the uh, Grand Central Direct program before the new timetables go out. But at these major stations, where if the schedules have not changed since the uh, draft, there would be no more timed connections at Jamaica. So this would show not just what the uh, upcoming connections are, but what tracks those would be on for uh, better mobility and uh, better information. I'm gonna be speaking to the second committee as well. And uh, also, let's say a train is delayed by uh, whatever number of minutes. That would be reflected as well, and the ETA would be updating in real time. So this is, uh, I mentioned, this is based off of uh, existing systems that I've seen in uh, the Netherlands, in Belgium, and uh, just all over. And I think it's especially overdue for, uh, for the Long Island Railroad, which is the busiest, if I'm not mistaken, the busiest commuter rail network in the U.S. and uh, I think possibly, possibly the world. And we have the screens already, but what this would be, I'm proposing, would be a uh, separate uh, information uh, system that would either work, uh, that would either be connected to the existing uh, ASI system, I'm not sure what exactly the manufacturer is for the M9s, but I'm not sure if It'll, it could possibly work in some way. I know it works in, uh, in Europe, 
but it would be uh, either working with the existing systems or independently from them. But I know it is possible. We have the screens already, so all we have to do is just put together a uh, system that'll uh, provide this information that is so essential to everyday commuters. And that's it for me. Happy holidays, and thank you very much. The next speaker is Charlton D'Souza, followed by the Savior of Jamaica. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to speak about Metro North, and then I'll transfer the other two minutes to talk about LIRR. Um, so with Metro North, the complaints that we're getting with Metro North is that they need more express service uh, from New Haven into Grand Central. And these express trains should be better timed with Shoreline East trains. Uh, that is a complaint that I'm getting. And I'm hoping that you guys will look at that schedule because uh, Shoreline East, you know, with the new M8s being placed there, the service is beginning to pick up. Um, so you definitely need to have that flexibility, um, especially have more late trains. Um, and now with Grand Central Madison opening, you know, there, there's going to be people wanting to switch to the LIRR. And the other uh, thing that I want to bring up is city ticket. Um, there needs to be a universal city ticket between the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. So now with, you know, LIRR and Metro North merging um, into Grand Central, you have that there. It would be great to have a ticket where you could ride from Fordham all the way to Jamaica. Um, so that's something that the railroad needs to look at. And also one of the things that people were asking was uh, they want to know in the schedules if there is a way that they could put in the walking times from the uh, Metro North concourse to the LIRR platforms um, so that people could better plan their schedules. I don't know if you guys can put that into the apps somehow, but that would be uh, helpful. Um, and the other request that we're also getting is you need, you know, better cross honoring because uh, I know the D train's been out um, in the Bronx and people wanted cross honoring for Metro North. So that's a, a big issue. Um, so now I'm going to get into my LIRR time if I can. Um, so with the Long Island Railroad, uh, we just heard a big announcement on Twitter that you guys are thinking about running shuttle trains. Um, we're excited about that. Um, we would have wished it would have been open, but sometimes you want to take your time and get it done right. Um, so we understand why the railroad has to work out, you know, all the uh, systems in Grand Central. But one thing I would hope is that there's more service or at least adequate service for people in Queens um, and even, uh, you know, Brooklyn. Because when you guys make, you know, when you guys open up Grand Central, you'll need to give time to people so they can plan the schedules. Because remember, the shuttle trains are still running to Atlantic under your plan. Um, so you guys should release the schedules now because uh, you guys should have the schedules ready so that we can understand what's coming when Grand Central opens up. Um, and also, I think that that should also be on the apps. One thing people were telling me, it would be nice on the mobile app to have a $3.75 ticket, a $3.75 ticket, to either Grand Central or Penn Station on the mobile app, but you know, $5 on the vending machine, obviously, because it's hard to make change. So that is a good, great suggestion. Um, but I think communication for Grand Central, it needs to start two or three weeks before the opening. And so like this, people can, you know, plan their schedules, make adjustments, and also the ticket machines. You guys have to get that ready. Um, and I was going to throw in something, maybe the first day of Grand Central Madison, y'all can make it free so that everyone can enjoy it and come on in and check it out. And maybe y'all should even have a community day where people can come and tour the station uh, like y'all did with the Second Avenue subway. Um, I want to wish all of you a very uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And thank you, everyone. The next speaker is the savior of Jamaica, followed by Jason Anthony. Hey, good uh, well, good morning. I mean, I'd like to say good evening. We're live here from the beautiful city of Doha, Qatar, after the World Cup final. You know, Charleston people are at. 
But yeah, good afternoon. Um, I want to uh, make the announcement that I'm very proud that Grand Central Madison will be opening for shuttle service. Like the previous speaker said, uh, you, you should guys should release the schedule, you know, a couple of weeks in advance so, so people can plan out, you know. And yeah, we do need to increase uh, like a unified city ticket. Like, for example, if I could go from, let's say, Hollis to, let's say, Yankee Stadium on the Metro North. Now, that, that would really help really well. And, it, and also will save time for people, you know, making those. Sometimes it could be tight connections between LA double R trains and Metro North trains. So I'm very looking forward to for service to Grand Central Madison. And, and, and you guys need to fix up Hollis Station because that station is absolute abysmal. It's, it, that, that station is an absolute joy. Every time I go there, I just feel so embarrassed, so sad on the way. Wooden platform? What is it, the 1800s? Nah, no, nah, that's completely unacceptable in the 21st century with the MT um, having bail money of billions and billions and billions of dollars. It's completely unacceptable, man. Oh, you should guys uh, uh, look into retrofitting the, the M7s and M9 and C3 cards with the seats. Uh, they're like leather seats that I saw on the Qatar subway. Those those shoes look beautiful. But yeah, let's get to the situation with John Minch. No, finally, guy taking the pictures inside the Jamaica LA double R station and the air train section. That's illegal. And this, that's prohibited. So you guys should take a look into that. And, and, and try to get rid of them because you guys keep going to the parking lot. So that's all I got to say. Happy Merry Christmas. Happy New Year's. Vamos Argentina, three-time champion. And have a safe Christmas and New Year's, guys. So take care. The next speaker is Jason Anthony, followed by Christopher Greif. Good morning, Jason Anthony here. Yet again, people like the previous speaker shouldn't be allowed to speak in this in any MTA board meetings because cyber bullies shouldn't be allowed because when Public figures like myself that attend meetings like this are exposed to cyber bullies. But let's get to the issues. First to Long Island Railroad. Last night I was at Penn Station like always. Around midnight, Amtrak with their shenanigans, they closed the access to the bathrooms. Since October, they have been doing this. And now, they literally, they are denying access to the restrooms for those that rely on the LIRR. I have sent to Hector Garcia images of this. Kathy, what are you going to do about this? Since that the restrooms in Penn Station are closed. Because I have asked Amtrak police about this. I will get an answer from them. And at the same time, Last night, I was at Grand Central, too. Let's go to Metro North. Because at the same time, I was at Grand Central. I'm very excited to see East Side Access open. But I still see homeless people wandering around in both stations and Penn Station in a Grand Central, but no homeless outreach personnel from BRC. It's totally disgraceful. As a native New Yorker, born in the Southview section of the Bronx, see no BRC or no 
city personnel and both commuter hubs. Why? Do I need to call the NYPD commissioner to resign again like I did with the previous NYPD commissioner? Do I need to do that again? I might have to do it at Christmas. Because as a New Yorker that uses mass transit since I was a kid, and I don't need a tu tourist that visits the Big Apple seeing our biggest transit hubs, Penn Station and Grand Central, totally disgusted by seeing people want lowering our two transit hubs. Kathy. Let's see if we can start 2023 with the right foot, not with the left foot. I'll see you guys in transit. The next speaker is Christopher Greif, followed by Andy Pollack. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Christopher D. Greif. Happy holidays to everyone. Uh, one thing I would like to uh, bring up is um, on a good note. First of all, I do want to thank Long Island Railroad with fantastic work we've seen with Long Island Cares at stations and glad to see them at certain other parts of Penn Station. That one thing I do want to say that it's great to see them there. MTA, uh, Chief, I want to thank you also because during the holidays yesterday, the holiday train had some of your officers there, and a lot of little kids were having fun. So I do want to thank you on behalf of your, all your officers and the ones who are downstairs and the security guards who are in this building. Thank you for always protecting us in this building and always give us the courtesy and respect in the building. So I don't want to thank every law enforcement here. And we also need to always remember, work together with the community and let's solve these problems. Some of these problems, as the person before me, we need to also make sure that our officials are up to speed and making sure that we're getting, they're getting necessary help. And we know that help needs to be help on Long Island Railroad, Metro North, and on the subways. And that's something we have to always bow our elected officials. The law enforcement do the best they can, but their hands are tied and it's not easy for them. Trust me, I, I'm an advocate for people with disabilities. It is not easy sometimes. It's called a challenge. I'm also very hope that next year in the 2023 budgets and for the railroads that we see more accessibility special buttons. As you know, Long Island Cares is only at the certain terminals. But in all other stations, you may have it on the Long Island Railroad, those special accessibility buttons that alerts the customers that there is an accessible customer. That could be a senior or a person with a disability. I hope to see that on the Metro North. Hope to see more in the railroad in the Suffolk County turf at the same time, as well as the Metro North end, because the more that customers who want to go on the train and may want to come down to the, the Manhattan or go up north or east to those islands, they will help them very much to continue to have conclude support. your remarks. Oh, I'm, I thought I was doing both railroads. Okay, continue. Okay. Um, the bottom line, what I want to say is, is the accessibility community with representing both ADA task force is extremely important to make sure that conductors see a walker or a wheelchair or any mobile devices on these stations. It is extremely important that next year we can hopefully increase it very much so people can go to Grand Central Madison and connect to a Metro North or Long Island Railroad to explore different things in New York. More tourist attraction will give a great way. But I understand that we still have to make sure we do the combo. So I am supporting the PCAC's combo for both tickets for the Metro North and Long Island Railroad because this will give accessibility and optional to help them to get where they want to go. Because as you see, yeah, it's maybe winter and the holiday season is just soon coming at the end, but spring and summer, people want to get a chance to go out. 
Everyone, I want to wish everyone a happy, healthy holiday, and please be safe. Thank you. The next speaker is Andy Pollack, followed by Sally Wolf. Okay. Hello there, everyone. My name is Andy Pollack, and I am a member of Passengers United. So I'm going to make one brief Metro North point for this month. I'm glad that news came out that Metro North is going to be adding new stations in the East Bronx, which will include Hunts Point, Park Chester Van Nest, Morris Park, and of course, the transit desert known as Co-op City. For these Bronx residents, it's going to save a lot of time on their commute. Sure, it's a good start, but let's hope we can be on time with this 2027 estimated completion date. Okay, now we're going to go to Long Island Railroad. My main talking point today, we have to keep the freedom ticket because many of you know I lived in the transit desert known as Fresh Meadows and Queens. And our closest Long Island Railroad station is in Auburndale. We desperately need to keep city ticket. And especially because when Grand Central opens, we will have half hourly service to points east along the Port Washington branch. And lastly, I want to discuss Grand Central Madison. So there is some good and there is some bad. As to be expected, it looks like Grand Central will not be opening until sometime in 2023. That was expected. But for a start, at least operating the shuttle trains between Jamaica and Grand Central will be a good lead way into the full opening. And I'm glad that the MTA is going to be transparent with us and give us at least a three week opening notice date of when the new station will open. So I'm going to conclude my remarks. Thank you all very much. Have a happy Halloween holiday season. And I will be speaking at New York City Transit later on. The next speaker is Sally Wolf, followed by Liam Blank. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sally Wolf. I live in Flatiron, although I'm actually zooming in for my parents' house in Great Neck, having gotten here on the LIRR. Happy and healthy holidays to you all, and thank you again for this opportunity to speak. It's my fourth time here, my fourth month. When I first came in September, I didn't expect to keep returning. Time is precious, both for you and for me, and yet here we are. I'm back again to voice the same idea, to create safe spaces, masked cars, or sections of cars for anyone still feeling cautious. To the extent of my knowledge, nothing has been created, no broad attempt to implement or even to pilot the idea in a smaller way, despite the simplicity and the lack of expense it would require. When I ride the trains as I did last night to get to Great Neck, it's to see the people I love most. I am a daughter, a sister, an auntie, a friend. The trains connect me literally to the people I love. They are a passage to the best sources of joy in my life, my parents, my siblings, my nephew, my nieces, my friends. The trains deliver hugs and love and time together. You all deliver that to each of us who rides them. And now you have a chance to help deliver it more safely. Not only safety on the tracks, which is so great, but also safety within the cars. And I'm asking, what will it take to change? Headlines every day about the current triple-demic are up. Just this morning, my Manhattan building sent an email about three new cases just within our building. This idea is practical, simple, inexpensive. Only signage is required. It builds on you do you. It lets people like me ride more safely, eliminating physical anxiety, physical and mental anxiety. And it starts with you. And I really, I welcome the opportunity to talk further, to help you with any rollout. I, I just really would appreciate it. And on a good note, I just wanted to compliment. I spent time in Moynihan Hall yesterday before riding out. It was my first time there and it is stunning and such a wonderful addition. Thank you. Happy and healthy holidays to you all. The next speaker is Liam Blank, followed by Jesse Figueroa. Good morning. 
Uh, my name is Liam Blank. I'm the new associate director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, also known as PCAC. We applaud the Long Island Railroad for making great progress on Grand Central Madison, which will provide riders to and from Long Island with direct access to East Midtown. We're also encouraged by Metro North Railroad's latest advancements on the Penn Station Access Project, which will connect West Westchester County and the Bronx with Penn Station. We hope to also see a new ticket that allows transfers between the railroads as a testament to the inter interconnectivity that these expansion projects will provide. We were also thrilled by the announcement at the new New York panel about expansion of city ticket to cover all commuter rail trips at the same low fare, regardless of time or day, within New York City. Of course, PCAC will continue to advocate for freedom ticket, which would be a weekly ticket option with transfers to buses and subways. On their own, these projects will improve rail accessibility and affordability for a greater share of the region's residents. Together, they represent one giant leap toward the gold standard, an integrated regional rail network that provides easy access for all residents of New York City and its surrounding suburbs. Achieving this goal means continuing to prioritize and invest in the projects that make transit a seamless experience for its riders. More trust from the public can later translate to greater investment from the state. That is achievable with more transparency about project timelines. For example, although Grand Central Madison is now nearing completion, we still don't know exactly when it's set to open to the public. We understand that these projects are complex and require a lot of planning and preparation, but it's important that we know when they will be finished so we can ensure accountability and riders can prepare for the upcoming service changes. I appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you today. The work that you are doing is essential in improving public transit for millions of people living in our region, and we encourage you to continue your efforts toward making transit safer, faster, cleaner, and more affordable than ever before. Thank you. The next speaker is Jesse Figueroa, followed by Mary Bowden. Yeah. Morning, everybody. I am a disabled, vet uh, disabled veteran. I served in the uh, National Guard during Ground Zero and then went to Iraq in 03. Um, I'm also a voluntary advocate with the MTA because I help people need what they got to go and all that stuff. The only thing I want to bring about is that I was harassed by home, a homeless guy at Atlantic Terminal. That I, and uh, I'd like to address it here to this committee. So I'm just asking if there's the way that this can end so we can get where we got to go, point A to point B, safe and sound. That's all I got, so I'll see you at the Subway and Buses Committee. Thank you. The final speaker is Mary Bowden. <clears throat> Kathy, it's your responsibility to see that your team follows the law as currently written. Can't make up stuff because you think it works better for railroads and not for the rest of the people. And I'm speaking specifically at this point, the Roaring Brook Crossing. For years, you had a red box in there, no matter what I said. You used the red box because you liked it. But the driver was not informed. Please stop the clock. I recognize that you have things to do, and, but it doesn't come out of my time. The don't block the box is a black and white design because people, colorblind people can't see red. It's used in more places today than it has been before because it's significant. It gives people the right to turn left across traffic because an intersection isn't blocked. Roaring Brook requires for the safety of drivers and everybody else the white don't block the box design. Railroads are not special. The driver needs to have consistent information. You have a railroad crossing, you have gates, 
Too many times you have flashing red lights, which were designed before traffic lights were invented. You go across the Willis Avenue Bridge, there's gates and traffic lights. You go to Florida, every crossing of a canal has gates and traffic lights. So why doesn't Long Island Railroad at all the crossings where there are gates, why aren't there lights, traffic lights, with a camera up there, to take pictures. Drivers today are distracted and, and aggressive. Safety requires consistency. That was taught to me by a former executive of the New York State Thruway who works in this building. So it's your responsibility to see that your team follows the safest requirements on the books today. Yes, the manual uniform traffic involved. It has many errors in it, but we have to start somewhere because this is a biggie. Now, if you can't have your team use correct lines at Roaring Brook and traffic lights on Long Island, then it's time for you to retire and let somebody else do it. There are a whole series of younger people today who are doing it correctly. Somebody recently told me, thank you for planting trees. I plant trees. The box is a tree. It provides safety for the next generation beyond my grandchildren. That concludes the public speakers for today. Thank you, and thank you to all of our uh, this morning's speakers. I want to move on to the approval of the joint mi meeting minutes from our November 29th. May I have a motion and a second? Motion, second. Any questions or comments on the meeting minutes? If not, um, all in favor to approve? Yes, okay. Meeting minutes approved. Um, there aren't any changes on the work plans. Nope, no changes to either so work plan. So we can go ahead with the agency reports. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, before we actually get into my prepared remarks and the PowerPoint, which was going to be a retrospective on 2022 for both railroads, uh, we're going to look ahead a little bit because there's been some news today on Grand Central Madison, which I want to catch this committee up on uh, if they haven't read Newsday or had the chance to watch the Today Show this morning. Um, but, uh, you know, we're very excited to be a couple weeks out in terms of the inaugural service at GCM. Um, as Jamie Torres Springer reported last month, and Jana's been talking about a little bit for the past few weeks, um, there's some system testing that's still underway, um, which is going. I, that's, it's a C&D project, so they're the ones who are, are, you know, really making sure that the systems are safe for opening day. That work is going on now. And once that work is done, the expectation is within the next couple weeks we will be inaugurating a shuttle service between Grand Central, Madison, and Jamaica, um, which we are calling Grand Central Direct. Um, at that time, we will continue to run the full service independent that we're running now. Uh, so this is really just a way of getting our customers acclimated to the new space, acclimated to the new service, excited about the new service. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about the new service. Uh, and then the expectation would be um, that we would not do the switch over to the full GCM schedule for a minimum of three weeks, maybe a little bit longer, just to give our customers the opportunity to, to kind of get the lay of the land and plan their travel accordingly. Um, so more on this, obviously. We'll keep everybody up to speed, but that's the current plan. Um, there was a good article in Newsday about it this morning, and uh, you know we continue to work very, very hard to be able to uh, commence the shuttle service within the next couple weeks, uh, and then make the switch over to the full GCM service, you know, a minimum of three weeks after that. Um, so before I actually go to the rest of my remarks, maybe I'll just pause for questions if there are any about that from the committee. Oh, okay. All right, great. All right, so now we get to the looking back portion of our program this morning. As we put a bow on 2022 and prepare for our very special grand opening for GCM, uh, we want to look back in appreciation at the fine accomplishments of both of the railroads for the last 12 months. 
Long Island Railroad is literally a bigger railroad than it was in January of 2022, which feels like a million years ago now, with major expansion initiatives and infrastructure growth rivaling that of any other year in its long and storied existence. However, both railroads had more than their fair share of success stories in 2022, and I'm going to go through some of the highlights. Back in February, both railroads, in an effort to bring COVID-weary customers back to our system, rolled out brand new fare programs featuring wallet-friendly discounts such as 10% off our monthly tickets, 20% off a new 20-trip peak ticket, and a newly expanded city ticket, which was now valid during all off-peak hours, not just weekends. In March, C&D and Metro North wrapped up a six-month renewal project to replace the 110-year-old Wickers Creek Culvert and Dobbs Ferry, which was destroyed by Tropical Storm Ida the previous September. As part of that project, they rebuilt the entire four-track right-of-way above it, reinstalling rails, ties, ballast, third rail, and making sure that signals and PTC systems operated flawlessly. The completion of the project meant faster travel times and increased capacity on the Hudson Line, as we had had to imp uh, implement a reduced schedule in order to accommodate the six months of repair work. Also in March, Metro North announced the start of construction on a full slate of improvements to three Harlem Line stations, Hartsdale, Scarsdale, and Purdy's. The upgrades will include street and platform elevators, ADA-compliant sidewalks and curb ramps, new staircases and closed-circuit TV, as well as increased electrical capacity. Hartsdale and Scarsdale are scheduled for substantial completion in the second quarter, Purdy's in quarter three. In April, uh, sorry, on April 26th at Stanford, Metro North held its first Connect With Us customer outreach program since the 2021 onset of Omicron. For those unfamiliar with our program, it gives customers a chance to discuss ways to improve train service and the customer experience directly with executive staff. Two, uh, two days later, I was proud to join Long Island Railroad re leadership in transportation, customer communications, community affairs, and other departments to meet and chat with customers at Hicksville at the inaugural Connect With Us event for the Long Island Railroad. In May, Metro North presented a warm weather gift to outdoor enthusiasts with the reopening of Breakneck Ridge Station following safety enhancement work. This weekend only stop along the Hudson Line gives uh, adventurers direct access to some of the most beautiful hiking in the state. And these station improvements are part of the comprehensive Breakneck Connector segment of the planned 7.5 mile Hudson Highlands Fjord Trail Linear Park, which will flank the river and connect the village of Cold Spring with the city of Beacon. Breakneck Bridge Station will again close until the anticipated completion of trans, uh, construction in 2025, but once completed, it, along with our Beacon and Cold Spring stations, will provide direct access to the Fjord Trail. We're very excited about that. In May, uh, the end of May, May 31st, MTA Chairman Jano Lieber and I joined Go uh, Governor Kathy Hochul as she announced that the new 700,000 square foot Long Island Railroad Terminal nearing completion below Grand Central Terminal shall be known as Grand Central Madison, a nod both to GCT above it as well as the famed Madison Avenue corridor. Only a couple days later, on June 2nd, we released our proposed systems times tables that incorporate the substantial and robust service increases that the future GCM and mainline third track would offer customers once both were online. Never was it more apparent that the constraints that we have always faced as a railroad when it came to major service increases were now falling by the wayside. In August, our brand new train time app was introduced to very positive customer reviews. For the very first time, Metro North and Long Island Railroad customers are now able to plan their trips, track train movement, car capacity, as well as buy tickets all in a single app. The new train time app replaces the former MTA eTix and individual trip planning apps for each railroad. We're really proud of our 4.9 star app store rating, plus the fact that it was developed with entirely in-house resources by people who know our system and our customer needs the very best. In September, we said goodbye to the Sea of Construction plywood, or at least part of the Sea of Construction plywood, and unveiled a dramatically more modern and spacious Long Island Railroad concourse at Penn Station. Higher, wider, and brighter is the name of the game as crews widened the concourse to 57 feet, nearly doubling the amount of walking space, and raised the now illuminated ceilings to 18 feet. It's still a work in progress, and you'll start seeing the retail and dining options opening their doors along the corridor in the near future. But the on-time and on-budget reopening of this highly utilized space within Penn Station is a big step forward towards the full-scale trans full transformation of Penn Station into a modern, spacious, world-class, and single-level terminal. 
Turning now to ridership, which has been a great story this year, customer traffic certainly looks much different in the latter portion of 2022 than it did at the beginning of the year. More and more people returned to in-person employment and enjoyment. Pandemic era records were being shattered all over the place, not just for weekday peak travel, but on weekends as well. On September 13th, Metro North broke its pandemic era record set the Wednesday before with 180,200 customers, 68.6% of our pre-COVID average. That record was again surpassed on October 11th, which saw almost 192,900 customers. That's our current record for weekdays. But just this past weekend, uh, we scored our highest weekend travel ever, the highest Saturday at 123,285 riders, and then the highest total for the weekend at more than 200. 1,000 riders, which surpasses our previous high for a weekend, which had been October 22nd and 23rd. Long Island Railroad saw its second highest weekday total of 2022 on Wednesday, September 21st, surpassed only by the current pandemic era record, which was the day before Thanksgiving, uh, of 210,400 riders. Both Saturday and Sunday one-day pandemic era ridership records were set on separate weekends in June, which is unsurprising given the usual warm weather travel and excitement for the new summer season out on Long Island. October was a big month for major projects, headlined on the 3rd of October by the celebration surrounding the completion of the third and final segment of the long-awaited third track between Floral Park and Hicksville. The governor was again on hand to christen the new 9.8-mile span that gives Long Island Railroad more operational flexibility, improving safety, minimizing disruptions, and increasing uh, system-wide service by 41% once the full GCM service goes live. It also creates true two-way and reverse peak service along the main line, which is a true boon to regional economic growth efforts. On October 6th, we announced that both east and westbound trains could now stop at Elmont UBS, the first new Long Island Railroad station in almost 50 years, and what has already become a destination for hockey fans and concert goers. Come implementation of the full GCM schedule, commuters will also call Elmont UBS station home as it will become a regular Hempstead branch stop 650, 650, 365 days of the year, thanks to the 15-month Belrose ladder switch installation project, which culminated with the October 29th and 30th signal cutover and subsequent testing. November saw the completion, we're getting, we're getting there, we're in November. November saw the completion of work on the Great Napaka Track, yet another GCM readiness project in which the segment of track beneath the new Colonial Road Bridge was extended 1,100 feet to accommodate an additional 12 car train. This much needed additional trackage helps us meet the robust service strategy we have on tap for the Port Washington branch when GCM service goes live. Late last month, as we discussed at last month's committee meeting, we rebranded Metro North's customer call-ahead assistance program as Metro North Care to align it with the existing Long Island Railroad care service. This ensures customers with mobility impairments that they have the same resources and assistance available to them, whether they're on the Hudson Line or the Hempstead branch. As was also the case with the new train time app, finding commonality between the two railroads has never made any more sense than it does right now. And then on December 9th, uh, which is, uh, was just last week, residents of transit-starved areas of the East and South Bronx got an early holiday present as we broke ground on the new Penn Access Project. As we all know, this project involves the construction of four new ADA-compliant Metro North stations on Amtrak's Hellgate Line. Upon completion, it will serve as an extension of the New Haven Line from New Rochelle to Penn Station. This exciting and important project enables us to offer new transit options and must, much faster commutes in both directions for East and South Bronx residents. It's estimated that 500,000 people live within one mile of the four new stations in Hunts Point, Parkchester, Van Nest, Morris Park, and Co-op City. A couple Grand Central Madison milestones in addition to what I've already discussed. On December 9th, CND turned over the new terminal and the new system to us. Their major work complete except for the systems testing I've already alluded to and some punch list items. So Grand Central Madison is now a railroad. Last month, we briefly touched upon some of the readiness activities. Um, I want to thank all of the departments and the support that we've been getting from the CND folks to bring these milestones uh, to fruition. Just this past weekend, we completed our final FRA-mandated pre-revenue tra uh, train simulations. This really was an all-hands-on-deck hand effort. I want to thank everybody who was involved. The FRA has approved our pre-revenue safety validation plan, so once that system testing is done, we're ready to start service. Um, 
The last bit of um, news on this front uh, relates to the combo ticket that we're launching. It was sort of talked about in passing by some of the public speakers. Um, the combo ticket, once we go live with the full service, will make it even easier for Long Islanders to check out the Yankee games in the spring or go hiking in the beautiful Hudson Valley in the fall and for Metro North customers to visit the best of Long Island or catch events at UBS Arena. The new combo ticket will be available on the Train Time app, ticket vending machines, and ticket offices. Essentially, it is a, an instrument that allows customers to buy an off-peak ticket on the first railroad. It's a single-day ticket like the city, uh, like a city ticket. Uh, and then the connecting service on the other railroad is an $8 flat fare. Um, so this is a pilot. It'll go for a couple months. We want to really get people excited about the possibilities for travel on both railroads, and we'll see how it goes before making a permanent decision with respect to whether we would continue it. Finally, now that I'm done with the retrospective, I do want to tell a, a story of bravery involving two of our Long Island Railroad employees who happen to be here today. At around 6.45 a.m. on Wednesday, November 30th, Long Island Railroad Corporate Safety Investiga Investigations Managers Felix Moreau and Jerry Burtzel were driving by exit 49 on the westbound LIE on their way to a morning meeting in Jamaica when traffic slowed a bit and they noticed smoke and an orange glow from behind the big rig to their right. Felix, who is himself a volunteer fireman for the Bohemia Fire Department, knew that he had seen this type of smoke before. And once the big rig no longer obscured their view, it was apparent that they were approaching a very fresh one-car crash. Without a second thought, Jerry and Felix pulled off the highway and flew into action. For reasons unclear at the time, a jeep had veered off the side of the highway, flattening a light pole and landing atop an electrical box before catching fire at the Pine Lawn Road underpass. When they arrived, two other Good Samaritans had just started dragging the stunned driver from his car, and yet another was in the process of dialing 911. Felix immediately grabbed his 20-pound Long Island Railroad-issued fire extinguisher and began knocking down the fire, giving Jerry both the time and visibility to search the burning car for any additional passengers. Felix figures he had the initial fire about 90% doused when his extinguisher ran out of product, enabling the flames to build once again and eventually engulf the car. While with the car search, there were no other passengers, and the fire mom momentarily tamped down, the men quickly made their way over to the bloody driver, a schoolteacher named Mike, who was set down alongside the road some distance away. Mike was dazed and had a broken ankle, and our heroes weren't quite sure where the initial Good Samaritans had gone or whether they were still at the scene. Jerry managed to get Mike's wife's phone number, uh, and whose phone was still in the burning car. He called Mike's wife, broke the news, and made sure she was completely in the know and that EMS knew Mike's pertinent health info upon their arrival. He also made sure that the wife had the contact information and twice confirmed for her that, his hus that the husband was going to Nassau University Medical Center. While all this was going on, Felix stayed by Mike to comfort and reassure him that he was safe. Once the scene was secured by PD, fire, and EMS, and that they were comfortable that they had done all they could do to help Mike and his wife, they left and went back to work. <laughs> uh, of course, still making their meeting on time because this is the Long Island Railroad. We are so proud of these two selfless and courageous employees who exemplify the very best of our workforce and all the qualities that we want them to possess. This morning they are here and I invite them to come up and be recognized at this time by the committee for their quick thinking and their bravery. And that concludes the President's report. And just before I break, I do want to wish everybody a very, very happy holiday, happy, healthy new year. Yes, questions. You know, on the uh, combo tickets, so the off-peak is any time of day if you're going to buy. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's available peak and off-peak. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we're moving on to our operations report. Uh, presented by Robert Free uh, for the Long Island Railroad and then by Justin Vonischek from Metro North Rail. Good morning. Total on-time performance for the month of November was 94.4% and year-to-date as of November was 95.8%, both above goal of 94%. Five branches operated at or above goal for the month of November 
and 10 branches operated at or above goal for the year to date as of November. Um, slippery rail conditions impacted uh, branch performance, as you can see, by only five branches meeting their goal. Um, for major events which result in 10 or more late trains, there were 12 incidents for the month of November, <clears throat> Excuse me. the most significant of which was an Amtrak signal problem in Penn Station during the PM rush hour on November 29th. This event negatively impacted on-time performance by 0.2%, excuse me. Um, for fleet performance, uh, our MDBF for the month of October was 212,920 miles, and year-to-date as of October was 218,953 miles, both above goal of 190,000 miles. For service delivery, we completed 99.6% of our trips in November, and year-to-date as of November, we completed 99.7% of our trips. Uh, for the upcoming holiday season, we're going to be operating uh, some extra service on Friday, December 23rd, and Friday, December 30th, we'll be operating our early release program, which provides 13 additional eastbound trains beginning in early afternoon. On Saturday and Sunday, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we'll be operating our normal weekend service, and on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, we'll be operating weekend service as well. However, on New Year's Eve, we'll provide 10 additional westbound trains into Penn Station. And on New Year's Day, beginning just after the ball drop, after midnight, we'll provide 15 additional extra eastbound trains out of Penn Station with the capacity to run more trains if necessary. Uh, and just as a reminder, there will be an alcohol ban on Long Island Railroad trains for New Year's Eve. And finally, uh, last Wednesday, the MTA conducted its all-agency winter storm preparedness drill, which both railroads participated in, uh, simulating various scenarios, testing our responses and oversight. It was an extremely successful drill, showcasing our uh, interagency communication and cooperation, as well as outside agency as well. So that uh, concludes my report. I'll take any questions you may have. Any questions? No. Okay. Mr. Bonacek? All right, good morning. The operations report begins on page 24. System-wide on-time performance for the month of November was 97%, above goal of 94%. Year-to-date on-time performance through November is also above goal at 97.1%. There were three major incidents that negatively impacted on-time performance during the month of November by 0.5%. Two of those were related to weather, and the third was due to heavy loading for customers attending the Cortica Jug football game between SUNY Cortland and Ithaca at Yankee Stadium on November 12th. Regarding fleet, the mean distance between failures for October was 337,000 miles, and year-to-date performance through October was 228,000 miles, both above goal of 175,000 miles. Metro-North will also be operating our special holiday service to accommodate customers during the Christmas and New Year's holidays. Customers can check the train time app or Metro-North website for complete schedule details. And additionally, service will be provided for the Pinstripe Bowl at Yankee Stadium on December 29th. That concludes my remarks, unless there's any questions. Any questions? Okay, moving on to safety reports. We have Chris Go to go first for Long Island Rail, and then Shelly Prettyman for uh, Metro North. Right, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, Long Island Railroad safety report, including the performance indicators, can be found on page 18 of your committee books. In the interest of time, I'll move right to the year in summary. The Long Island Railroad continues to take steps to improve our safety performance indicators through our range of existing programs and initiatives. Um, from a customer outreach perspective um, and in collaboration with the MTAPD, we continue to expand our in-person outreach. Today we've uh, reached out to approximately 47,000 members of the public who attended our tracks, Operation Lifesaver, Railroad Safety Awareness events. In addition, we've also made presentations to all ages at different schools in addition to outreach tables at community events throughout the year. From our operational perspective, our roadway worker staff has performed over 1,000 observations at locations along the right of way. We continue to work with our operating departments and labor partners to identify and manage hazards. Um, from our fire marshal's office, they've performed over 900 inspections to keep our fire life safety system um, adequate. And in addition, we've trained over 1,400 first responders so far. On the environmental side, we've uh, performed approximately 350 field inspections at various locations in our network. Um, the areas assessed include ha for hazardous waste, stormwater, petroleum bulk storage, and capital projects. Um, in our safety management system, we continue to enhance that. Uh, this year, we successfully transitioned our system safety program to the FRA. 
um, Federal Railroad Administration regulation. Um, to note, we have had a system safety program plan since 1986, but we transitioned um, th this year to the FRA's uh, 270 uh, requirement, and the implementation process is currently underway. Um, as indicated by President Rinaldi, um, Long Island Railroad is undergoing significant expansion, so our team have working in collaboration with MTA C and D, uh, work through many projects, and we continue to evolve our infrastructure. Um, this required increased engagement and collaboration with our agency partners and employees to manage all the activities and deliverables that affect the safety of our, of our operation. Um, that concludes my report. Happy to take any questions. Yes, Commissioner Brigham. Okay. <clears throat> yes, I have uh, two items. Uh, one is, most of you know, I'm also the chairman of the PCAC, so this may be a little self-serving, but uh, we sent a letter to the MTA board uh, last week uh, requesting that the MTA upgrade their public service announcements with the upcoming tridemic uh, to encourage mask use on trains. We're not asking for a mandate. We're not asking for mask cars. We're just asking for a much stronger message to be sent out to ridership. Uh, to wear, to wear masks, um, and we want to use the word strongly recommend. Again, not asking for a mandate, but we want to strongly recommend it. Again, it's a tridemic right now. We're, we're still dealing with COVID. We got this RSV, and now it's flu season. So anything that can be done in that regard would be greatly appreciated. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is, you know, the homeless problem persists in Penn Station, and we understand with the cold weather, the homeless are going to look for some place warm to come. Um, but we really need to stay on top of this. I don't know if we still have a contract with BRC. Uh, if we do, someone has to really light a fire under their butts because they don't seem to be doing it. Um, I got off the train uh, 8.30 this morning, and there were four members, four apparently homeless individuals in the center corridor. You know, so that's, that's really unacceptable. So that's something we really have to stay on top of. And that's it. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions? If not, Shelley. Okay, good morning. Metro North Safety Report is on page 28 of the committee book, and uh, the safety to, 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 excuse me, statistics for the month can be found there. And uh, likewise, in the interest of time, I'll move right to the year on high whites. So Metro North has also continued to take steps to reduce customer employee injury rates, including specific steps in preparation for winter weather. So as one step, the Office of System Safety reviewed recent trends and included relevant information in the agenda for the fourth quarter safety focus week, which we held December 5th to 11th. Throughout the week, managers held interactive discussions with employees, which included seasonally focused reminders on motor vehicle safety, avoiding slips, trips, and falls, and safely mounting and dismounting equipment. Taking a broader look back at the past year, we've continued to pursue a range of programs and initiatives to improve safety trends as well as to maintain system-wide fire life safety. So I'll just touch on a few key, light, key highlights here. So Metro North also continued to expand in-person customer safety outreach across our territory, including presentations for all ages at schools, libraries, daycare centers, and the like, and outreach tables at community events. And we conducted station outreach to customers to increase awareness of safe behaviors as well as uh, outreach at grade crossings. So we had five grade crossing outreach events reaching 345 people and 58 station events reaching 13,828 customers. To support suicide prevention, Metro North has continued to deliver question persuade refer suicide prevention awareness training to employees. With the support of MTA Communications, digital and printed posters on display throughout the territory have been updated to add the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline number, and we are now discussing translating those posters into Spanish. One key initiative led by Field Safety Operations and Investigations is the Roadway Worker Audit Group. The group includes managers from the operating departments as well as rules, operations, training, and of course safety. They spend an entire shift conducting audits on and about the tracks to ensure field employees are complying with roadway worker protection rules and MNR safety rules. And the audits also give field employees an opportunity to ask the group questions and get detailed feedback. So the group was launched in mid-2021, and this year has conducted 27 of those audits system-wide to date. And operational incidents involving roadway workers in both maintenance of way and transportation have decreased from 21 last year to 12 this year, a 42% decrease. 
and the field safety staff has also completed over 1,200 system-wide safety audits and inspections at shops, yards, stations, and locations along the right-of-way. Findings are shared with the department and safety plans established from those findings as well. A Grand Central Terminal yard cleanup was held on Saturday, December 10th, following an earlier event in June, and these cleanups are also a collaboration among the operating departments and safety. And for the year, overall, 144 bags of common debris or trash were collected, that's lighter items, and over 2.5 tons of construction debris, such as metal, concrete, plywood, and stone. For emergency management throughout 2022, um, MNR Emergency Management delivered 98 public safety classes system-wide with 1,900 first responders uh, attending. These classes provide emergency response, safety, and railroad familiarization training for police, fire, and EMS departments. And I want to note that the Grand Central Fire Brigade monitors li fire life safety systems and responds to fire and EMS alerts throughout the terminal 24-7. In 2022, they continued their excellent work responding to 1,042 fire and EMS callouts with an average response time of two minutes and 15 seconds for the year to date. And that's in addition to their ongoing work to conduct inspections and ensure code compliance in the terminal. For environmental compliance, um, we completed over 300 field audit inspections at various Metro North properties, including, including yards, repair shops, and substations. And another notable step, um, as my colleague uh, Chris Go mentioned, FRA also approved Metro North Systems Safety Program Plan, submitted in response to the new regulation, and we've begun the implementation process. And of course, Metro North and Long Island Railroad are collaborating closely on that effort. Those are just a few of the highlights, of course, but I want to take the opportunity to thank my staff and all of our colleagues in operations for their uh, partnership and their efforts throughout the year. That concludes my report. I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Yes, Commissioner Brown. Yeah, uh, could you go over the statistics again for the fire brigade? Um, how many times they were called out in the last year? Would sure. You say that again. So um, for the year to date, they've responded to 1,042 fire and EMS callouts with an average response time of two minutes and 15 seconds for the year to date. So that's like two and a half times a day they get called out? It's quite frequent, yes. And what's the bulk of those um, incidents? Well, the bulk are, are um, I would say, EMS um, responses, and uh, for that's for customers. Sick well. passenger, this and that, right? Sure, and, and folks moving through the terminal. I'd be happy to get you more details on that if you'd like more information. I, I had a terrible vision of like three fires a day breaking out in there. So. <laughs> no, no, the vast majority are um, EMS callouts for um, customers and, and others in the terminal, visitors to the terminal who may not be feeling well and to ensure that they get the help that they need. Thank you. Very nice report. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Shelly, I want to thank you and your staff for the suicide prevention training that you offered and that I was fortunate to participate along with other several commissioners last Monday. It was very informative, and we learned a lot about what Metro North is doing. Well, thank you very much. It was our pleasure. And actually, that's another effort that we're partnering with Long Island Railroad on as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, now to give the MTA police report, Chief Mueller. Good morning, everyone. Uh, your uh, MTA PD activity can be found in the uh, safety and security book on pages 19 and 29, respectively. Uh, of note, uh, of the 28 felonies that occurred in our entire system for the month of November, uh, fully 64% of those were uh, grand larceny, uh, and half of those, nine, uh, were the result of unattended property. So we're still asking for vigilance um, throughout the system when you're looking at your, you know, looking after your property. I want to share with the uh, committee um, a great collaborative effort that we had uh, in the month of November with uh, SEPTED training, which is crime prevention through environmental design. Uh, the MTAPD hosted this uh, course, and I think what's special and unique about it is is that we included and, and asked uh, to have our Metro North and our Long Island Railroad partners, I believe eight Metro North uh, partners attended, and oh, I'm sorry, eight Long Island Railroad partners attended and four uh, Metro North partners attended. And the purpose of this training, it's a five-day, 40-hour course, is to look at space and identify different things that could be done through design to make it safer and more secure. 
So, for example, you know, an easy one to be to, to explain how this is done is to improve lighting, uh, cut back shrubbery so sight lines are improved. At the end of the five days, uh, nine teams went out of the 47 graduates of the SEPTED training, uh, and they were mixed and matched. So we had representatives from the MTA PD, Long Island Railroad, and the Metro North Railroad working, in, you know, uh, as part of teams. They went out, they looked at Tarrytown uh, Station, they looked at Ronkonkoma, Grand Central, Penn, I believe, and uh, they did some really fantastic work in respect to recommendations to make the... Uh, make our stations and our spaces much safer. So we, we intend to leverage this uh, new knowledge with, uh, as we go forward when we're identifying crime patterns and quality of life issues throughout the system uh, by deploying these teams and sending them out so that they can do assessments on the different properties that are, that are uh, somewhat problematic. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Mack. Uh, uh, Chief, uh, I got to compliment you again uh, <coughs> for your initiatives to work with the partners on Long Island, uh, I imagine you're doing the same uh, upstate as well, but uh, I compliment you. We are still the first responders, <coughs> Nassau and Suffolk, and I compliment you again for your uh, <coughs> vision to work with our teams in Long Island. Good job. Merry Thanks, Christmas. Sir. Any other questions? Yes, Commissioner Swarm. Just one quick one. Congratulations. I love the fact that you're looking forward to see the issues that arise. But once the recommendations are made, what's the turnaround time to address them? So that depends on what the recommendations are. So there, there are some that are easier and some are more difficult, the sliding scale. So it's easy to change lights and cut shrubbery. We can do that relatively quickly. Embedding, the fact that we embedded Long Island Railroad and Metro North personnel has made it that much easier. In fact, one of the, the nice benefits and values we've seen from doing this collaborative training is that they're talking to each other and now they're interacting. So depending on what it is, uh, you know, but we move as quickly as we, as we can. So for example, I know that uh, Hicksville has a, a bike theft issue. Not a huge bike theft issue, but when, when the folks looked at that station, it appeared that the bike rack was in the wrong spot. So what we'll do is we'll move the bike rack where it's under camera, it's more visible and more of a deterrent, and then we'd like to circle back a year from now, same time, you want to compare apples to apples, and then take a look and see if, if, if that adjustment um, drove our, uh, our metrics in the right direction. Thank you so much. Continue the great work. Thank you. And for the remaining information items for Long Island Rail and Metro North, I will hand it over to President Rinaldi. Um, so there are five Long Island Railroad information items which are in your committee materials, the 2023 final proposed budget, the 2023 proposed committee work plan, the diversity and EEO report for the third quarter of 2022, a memo on year-end holiday service, and the review of the committee charter. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have on any of those information items, but they're in the book for your consideration. Okay. There are two Metro North action items that do require a vote today. The first is authorization to accept the NISDOT uh, CMAC grant for connecting services. And the other is approval of the ferry landing parking agreement with the city of Newburgh in connection with the Newburgh Beacon Ferry Service. So I guess we need a motion and a vote on both of those. We have a motion? Yes. Um, Harry and Randy, yes, in a sec. Oh, he did the second. Any questions or comments? If not, may I take a vote? All in favor? Everyone's in agreement. Motion passes. Okay. There are four Metro North information items, the 2023 final proposed budget, the 2023 proposed committee work plan, the diversity and EEO report for the third quarter 2022, and the review of the committee charter. Uh, we can answer any questions any might have, anybody might have about any of those four information items. Okay. The um, finance reports for both agencies are in the book, and there is one procurement, um, which Anthony Gardner here is to it, it can explain. It's on behalf of both railroads, both Metro North and Long Island. Yes, good morning. Uh, there is one uh, procurement item 
approval is requested to implement a one-year contract extension to the competitively led joint Metro North Long Island Railroad contract with Sperry Rail in a not to exceed amount of $7 million, which is split $4 million M&R and $3 million Long Island Railroad. During the contract extension period, Sperry will continue to provide Federal Railroad Administration mandated ultrasonic rail testing and joint bar detection services for both railroads. For services beyond 2023, Long Island Railroad on behalf of itself and Metro North will conduct a new joint competitive procurement which will include an industry review of available technologies and service providers prior to selection and award recommendation back to the board. Funding for services during the one-year contract extension is available in each railroad's operating budget. Um, as a note of Metro North's $4 million total, the Connecticut Department of Transportation is responsible for approximately 33% or $1.3 million of the spend. Are there any questions? First, may I have a motion for it, and then we can do the questions. Motion in a second by, yes, and now we can do any questions or comments. Okay, now that procurement, that's not all inclusive, right? Don't we, don't the railroads have to provide the operators to operate their? Uh... Surrey, Surrey provides the operators. The railroad um, force, forces do the repairs that are detected by the Sperry ultrasonic testing. Is this a change from previous procedures? No. That's the current program. This is an extension of the current program. Uh, I'll ask the question in private later. Any other questions? If not, can we take a vote? All in uh, favor for accepting these two procurements? Great. Thank you. Motion passes. That concludes the agenda. I just want to express my thanks to the committee for all your support this this year. It's been quite a year, uh, and and the, uh, the support from both of the railroads. And uh, you know, we we really appreciate everything that you do for us, and uh, wish everybody a very very happy happy holiday and a happy new year. Thank you very much. Um, and now I may take a motion and a second to adjourn our meeting. Lisa, yes, second. All in favor? Thank you very much. Have a happy holiday, prosperous new year, and we are adjourned.
I would like to get started. Morning. I'd like to call to order the New York City Transit Committee meeting. Uh, let's get started. I think we have a new safety announcement. Your safety is of the foremost importance to the MTA. Therefore, we ask that you listen and adhere to the following instructions. If you witness an emergency, notify emergency personnel in the room and call 911 immediately. Please follow any audible instructions provided through the public address system or visually on screens in the event of an emergency. If an alarm sounds, wait for a public address announcement and follow instructions. If told to go to another floor or to evacuate the building, leave all unessential items behind and use stairwell A just across the main hallway or stairwell B down the hallway past the elevators. If you have a mobility disability or cannot self-evacuate, please proceed down stairwell D or E if instructed to go to another floor or evacuate the building. MTA staff or emergency personnel will assist you from there. An automated external defibrillator, AED, for use by trained personnel is in the main hallway just past the elevators. If you need assistance during an evacuation, please tell an MTA staff member or emergency personnel. Thank you and have a safe day. Thank you, everyone. Let's move to our public speakers. Good morning. We have 17 members of the public registered to speak today. We ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. As a reminder to the public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. The first speaker will be Canela Gomez, followed by Aaron Morrison. Exactly, like, like this is train operators and conductors. Like, I don't understand. No, I get it. I, I, I'm not. This is just a conversation. Like I told him, it's not an argument. It's just a conversation. Just a conversation. Thank you. Good morning, Demetrius. How you doing? <laughs> oh man, and don't beat me when that 30 seconds thing go either. All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Canella Gomez. I'm the RTO Vice President, TWU Local 100. Hopefully everybody's having a good day. So here, here we go again. It was brought to TWU Local 100 attention that there are planned and rumored service cuts for Monday and Friday eventually. You may call it a service adjustment, but if you know extended headways for people to have to wait longer on platforms, that's a service cut. And we are opposed to any service cuts now and in the future. I can't even comprehend or understand where this idea even arose from. How does longer waits on the platform and longer, longer running times not equal service cuts? 
off script, even today as I was going through you guys' little nice pamphlet that's put together very well, on page nine, it says that about 45% of customers are unsatisfied with the waiting time for trains, but we're thinking about service cuts, if the rumors are true. All right. Construction workers, restaurant workers, healthcare providers, teachers, grocery store workers, transit workers, and the list goes on and on and on, will be adversely affected by these service cuts because they can't work home just like I can't work home, just like none of my fellow co-workers can, can't work home. If these rumors are true, it is clear, I told you don't beat me. If these rumors are true, it is clear that the MTA is not on the same, is not on the same wavelength as the mayor, the governor, transit workers, and the riding public. We are greatly against these service cuts, and I hope the rumors aren't true. Thank you. Saturday night, we had a conductor punched in the face at 179th Street. And Sunday night, a conductor was punched in the face on the A-line by Canal Street, if I'm not mistaken. You know, we have to really start working together and get a real plan of strategy for these assaults. Thank you very much. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker is Canela Gomez. Oh no, I, I'm sorry. Uh, Aaron Morrison, my apologies, my apologies. Cut the mic back on, too late. I want to talk about, since you gave me another two minutes, I want to elaborate on these assaults really quick because these assaults are greatly affecting myself and my coworkers. I'm not sure if all of you guys are notified whenever there's an assault in the system, but whenever one of my coworkers get assaulted, I'm notified. So I find out about all the assaults. Right now, I will say, I'm very happy to see that the plan to have NYPD finally stand by the conductor position instead of by the fare box or down the platform. I'm happy that that's going on. And with that taking place, things have gotten better. Are they where they need to be? No. But the police are finally doing the right thing. And I hope that you guys use your influence and we're able to work with John and Richie Davis, the new president of TW Lo Local 100, to continue to put pressure on NYPD to keep them by the conductor position. That's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your remarks. Uh, our next speaker is Aaron Morrison, followed by Charlton D'Souza. Good morning, everyone. So unfortunately, we joined by the hemp. The, the hip, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Aaron Morrison. I'm a TWU representative for the Local 100, um, B Division Vice Chair, but most importantly, my name is Aaron Morrison. I'm a New York City Transit train operator. Um, we have a little saying in pop culture that says, uh, make it make sense. And just candidly, ladies and gentlemen, service cuts, you got to make it make sense. Um, assaults are on the rise, the ridership is increasing. You got to make it make sense. And we understand that you guys have a difficult task of cutting service and snipping the budget and things of that nature, but you just got to make it make sense. Service cuts at this time, um, this day and age, it just doesn't make sense. Um, we have that grandmother that has to go to dialysis um, three times a week. We have those kids that have to go to school. Everybody can't work from home, as my VP said. You just have to make it make sense. So. Um, at this time, we just implore you guys to make the right decisions, do the right thing, and of course, make it make sense. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Charlton D'Souza will be our next speaker, followed by Andy Pollack. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlton D'Souza. I'm the president of Passengers United, and I am outraged that station agents are going to be allowed to be outside and roam the stations by themselves. Look at the two assaults that happened on Saturday night. The subway is not safe. And I don't know why Local 100 would agree to that. 
um, without having a full conversation with all the station agents. Um, you guys sold the station agents out. And for that, I say that that's a safety hazard because these two agents that were assaulted on Saturday, it's my understanding they were inside the boat. So, I mean, this is crazy. And the subways are not safe. Subways are not safe. We're gonna keep calling for better safety measures. And the police this weekend, I only saw cops once, that was it. And so the overnight, there needs to be better police patrols. And I see the cops standing by the turnstiles. You'll need to have them walking the trains. We need to have train sweeps. This needs to be done overnight. Um, and in terms of the other things going on with the Brooklyn bus redesign, um, the fact that you guys don't have a bus route that goes from Manhattan to Brooklyn overnight um, is kind of ridiculous. I would have preferred to have a bus route, you know, a night owl bus route, because right now the only night owl bus routes are through Queens. So I just want to say to this board, I want to thank all of you for supporting us at Passengers United. And um, I'm so proud of all of you. But this year is going to be a challenge and we do not need any service cuts or fare increases. So please, any rumors of a service cut should not be happening and no fare increases. Um, we need mass transit for everyone and we need flexibility to get in the city and we need safety. With that, Happy New Year, Merry Christmas. Thank you for your remarks. Andy Pollack will be our next speaker followed by David Kupferberg. Okay, hello there everyone. My name is Andy Pollock and I am a member of Passengers United. So let's get into a couple of things I wanna discuss before the end of this year. Number one is of course, safety, safety, safety. Yes, even though assaults and transit are still going up this year, there's been a couple of positives that I have been seeing specifically from Transit District 20 this year. Number one, the concerns of mine about homeless panhandling at Kew Gardens Union Turnpike over the years are finally being addressed. This calendar year, particularly at the Kew Gardens Union Turnpike subway station on the E and the F line, particularly, like I've mentioned in the past, off-peak weekdays, I have been noticing barely any panhandling, which is a good sign. I've been feeling a little bit more safer using that station this calendar year, just for the record. And also, I have been noticing a lot more cops have been patrolling Flushing Main Street on the 7 and at Jackson Heights Roosevelt Avenue. So let's keep safety as a focus of emphasis in the new year. And also going into the new year, we still need to address operator availability issues. Mm -hmm. Because last week, the Q12 and the Q13 routes, operator availability, Q27 last week, same situation, and a couple of Q46 limited trips going eastbound to Long Island Jewish Hospital last week. Some of those trips didn't even get filled because of operator availability issues. So operator availability and safety need to be the emphasis of what we talk about going into the new year. So... I'm going to wish everybody a happy holiday, and I will be speaking more in 2023. Thank you very much for letting me speak today. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be David Kupferberg, followed by Gene Ryland. New York City's mass transit peers are London, Paris, Tokyo, and the island nation of Singapore. Our philosophy is choosing between ridership and coverage. It's like a prisoner who has not eaten and drank for 24 hours if that person wants either food or water. We believe that ridership and coverage are important to a well-functioning mass transit network. We eschew the diversion of resources from one neighborhood to another and think that if a mass transit entity could afford to do an enhancement, that entity could do similar enhancements elsewhere but we are different than our peers in the sense of bus stop spacing. We prefer to give people a shorter distance to walk to a bus stop. We prefer two to three blocks, street blocks apart. But MTA service planners and NYC DOT think otherwise. 
For example, NYCDOT has made the distance between bus stops along Northern Boulevard and 35th Avenue in Queens four to five street blocks apart. The people who live in the surrounding neighborhoods hate it. Many are demanding that some stops be restored. The Brooklyn Bus Network redesign draft plan is worse than the current service. For example, the diversion of the B-16 from 56, 57 streets to 60th Street has been on MTA's wish list for the past 20 years. This was not done then because the surrounding community wanted access for the WIC program my Maimonides Center maintained, and uh, the change had virtually no support. The community, however, is willing to sacrifice this route path if and only if the B-16 becomes a true Fort Hamilton Parkway service. The B-64 is still long and secure this. It should be streamlined. As that 13th Avenue, 14th Avenue service must be maintained, new services would have to be provided. My preference for my enhancements for Central and Southern Brooklyn, provided as appendices, have not changed one iota. Go back to the drawing board. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker will be Jean Ryland, followed by Alita Dupree. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the new emergency announcement is an improvement, but it needs a little bit of tweaking because I'm still not going to go to a stairway. Uh, you have to tell us exactly where to go, and when I hear stairway, I know I can't do it. Um, so it needs a little tweaking. Thank you, though, for working on it. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about the elephant in the room, maybe two elephants, because it's an important safety issue with accessoride brokers. What's happening is that rides are canceled while the passengers are still in the vehicle going to their destination. The drivers tell the passengers to get out because the, the ride is canceled en route. And nobody wants to drive somebody someplace and not get paid. And if the ride is canceled, they won't get paid. So, uh, but how are we going to get to our destination by getting out of the vehicle? On the other hand, they, the drivers don't want to drive if the ride is canceled. So w w there has to be some kind of solution that is developed. But one of the issues is that the drivers cannot understand the dispatchers and the dispatchers cannot communicate with the drivers because of a language issue. So <clears throat> some other way, if it's not language, if it's some other way has to be figured out that does not involve language, maybe pictures or something like that, because you can't have people being kicked out of the vehicles. And I know three people already, just me personally, not me, but I know three people who've been kicked out of their vehicles or told to get out because the ride was canceled. So I'm, I'm sure that the brokers and Accessoride can come up with a solution to this problem so that the dispatchers know someone's in the vehicle and don't cancel the ride. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Alita Dupree will be our next speaker, followed by Michael Ortiz. Um, thank you again, the chair. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, my pronouns are she and her. Good to be back with you. How about some BART for you today? Still haven't made it to New York, but I have written a lot on a system called BART. It's in the Bay Area. Perhaps some of you got to see it. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you two months ago for initiating the reduced fare protocol for Omni. And there was a very good video on how to do that. I watched it and I have set up my visa card to work with Omni. So when I do get to New York, I'm, I'm going to use it and I take advantage of my reduced fare benefit. I'm very happy. I'm not going to have to worry about any more damaged MetroCard stories. Appreciate it. So on to other things. Um, I, I'm just looking forward to getting back. And uh, I hope to ride on some of these new new rail cars. And I've seen videos of them in testing. And uh, I think they're stately. 
I do think they hold to stately and legendary ideals. Um, and I'm, I'm going to get out there and face it. I'm an old soldier. I'm going to use the subway and I'm going to use it a lot, day and night, and use that as my primary means to get around the city that I am from, it's New York. And uh, I believe we have to continue pushing very hard with our ADA work. Uh, you know, I've climbed up some stairs in BART stations, and, uh, but many can't, so we have to accelerate that. And the future of renewable energy in New York City is powering our subway. Uh, we're still producing lots of emissions, and it's not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, but BART has virtually greenhouse gas-free power. I think we can do that on our subway. So I appreciate it, and I look forward to riding on this system steeped in tradition that holds up to the idea of being legendary. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be uh, Michael Ortiz, followed by Jesse Figueroa. Good morning to the board today. Um, so today we're going to be talking more about the Brooklyn bus network redesign. Now, today I've been hearing that the B-16 bus route that runs on 13th and 14th Avenue will now be diverted towards 60th Street. I think that's a good idea because 57th and 56th Streets are completely narrow. Now, why do I say it's narrow? because there are some times that the bus has had to back up on 57th Street because there's an illegally parked car blocked over there. My second part is extending the route east. Why are you extending the route east if it's only gonna cause bunching along Clarkson Avenue? The next thing I wanna talk about is having the route maybe extend a little further up north to Medgar Evers College so that way it could connect with the two, three, four, and five and the Franklin Avenue shuttle. That's a much better way than having the newer the than the proposed route the next thing i want to talk about is the b35 the b35 should be an sbs and should become a route to jfk the reason being is because it could benefit both borough park riders and sunset park riders maybe have the route start at the 36th street d and and r lines so that it can benefit those riders as well along with the ones that use the f and g and then it can benefit an sbs corridor along church avenue where it can run to JFK much more quickly. Lastly, you know, there's more things going on. And other than that, there's some things on the redesign that need to be fixed. The 35 has to be an SBS and the B16 needs to be into a more revised schedule. Other than that, I like the proposed schedule for the 16 and the proposed map. Other than that, that, that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Jesse Figueroa followed by Joseph Rappaport. Good morning, everybody. My, um, I'm a disabled veteran. I am a voluntary MT advocate because I like to help people where they got to go. And if there's a problem, I help them out as much as I can. I'm here to address multiple problems. I'm going to try and squeeze it in. <laughs> Number one, subway surfing is still going on. I caught two delinquents on the R train on 4th Avenue. I addressed it. They fled because they saw, they saw me with my patch. They thought I was an MTA employee. By, so I, I notified the train conductor and all that. There's also problems on certain on buses. They got fare evaders sneaking in the back door. And, and mostly in Brooklyn, like B6 or uh, B70 for example, and in other boroughs, I've seen it, and it's gone out of control. So I had to ask people to get off. So other than that, uh, we had a, a DOA this morning at Grand Central. It was a, a person committed suicide, and it's gone out of control. It's And homelessness, too, is a big problem. And, and, and I don't know what happened to the homeless outreach program. I work with homelessness, especially I'm homeless veterans. So... And then, last but not least, um, I've had a 14-year-old kid who's a, a consider a son. He was harassed by a Grand Avenue bus depot driver over a student metro card problem. He was threatened to be arrested and all that, and he, I believe he was profiled. I have that in evidence. So other than that, um, I'd like to wish all of you a happy 
holidays, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, and happy Kwanzaa. Oh, and one more thing with uh, photography, or you, is, if there's been problems addressed to me about it, all you gotta do is just ask the bus driver permission to take a photo or a video. Thank you, that's all I got. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Joseph Rappaport, followed by Sally Wolf. Hey, 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 it's COVID. Just back from covering up a few license plates. I, uh, of course, I never left, especially since you are really doing your part here to keep me around. It's a holiday blessing. Uh, this time I decided to bring a couple of my uh, buddies. Governor Hochul is calling us the triple threat and we are so honored. Uh, you know, let me introduce first RSV. Now RSV mostly hangs out, out around kids, but wanted to make a special appearance today. Thank you so much for helping me and my buddies around the city. It's an honor to be with all of you, and I love that most of you don't wear masks at these meetings. So smart, it's genius. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let me uh, now move on to the third uh, member of our team, the flu. Hold on. Thanks, COVID. You know, it's a couple of, year, a couple of years ago when there was a, uh, a mask mandate. I didn't get around nearly as much. Uh, so thank you for not having the fortitude to put a mask mandate in place and thank Governor Hochul for her, how can I say this, a leadership on this issue. It's getting a little complicated here. Um, in f <laughs> Thanks, Flu, and I have to admit, I was worried that the MTA or Governor Hochul would impose a mask mandate in some kind of a strategic strike against us this winter. After all, an AP poll earlier this year uh, showed that New Yorkers are strongly, strongly support mask mandates on transit. But I didn't have to worry, did I? In fact, I keep hearing bus announcements that masks are optional and we should respect people's choices. And let me tell you, I respect your choice and Governor Hochul's choice and Mayor Adams's choice not to protect people. That is fantastic because it helps me and my buddies. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Sally Wolf, followed by Ulysses Fernandez. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Sally Wolf. I live in Flatiron. Happy and healthy holidays. And thank you for this opportunity to speak again. It's the fourth time that I've been at these committee and board meetings. And when I first came in September, I didn't expect or plan to keep returning. Our time is precious, yours and mine too. Yet here we are. And I'm back again to voice the same idea to create safe spaces, masked cars or sections of cars for anyone still feeling cautious. I don't have Joe's props, but I share his mission. And to the extent of my knowledge, nothing has been created, no broad attempt to implement or even pilot the idea, despite its simplicity and the lack of expense it would require. When I ride the subway, it's for one of two reasons, usually. To see the people I love most, I am a daughter, a sister, an auntie, a friend, or to see my doctors, people I appreciate deeply and need to see as a stage four cancer patient. The trains connect me literally to the most important people in my life. They are a passage to sources of joy, my parents, siblings, nephew, nieces, friends. They are a passage to health. And you all deliver that, the joy, the hugs, the love, the health. And focusing on health, I want to invite you to think about a time that you desperately needed to see a doctor. And I'm guessing your biggest concern wasn't whether you could get to that doctor safely. It's unnecessary to have to worry about that on top of whatever health issues people are juggling. So I'm asking, what will it take for a change? We are in a triple-demic, a tridemic, call it what you want. Just this morning alone in my Manhattan building, I got an email about three new cases just in my building. This is practical. It lets all of us do ourselves. It's you do you but it lets us do it safely in areas of cars or in cars that feel good. 
Thank you so much. I am happy to help implement this or brainstorm, et cetera. Happy and healthy holidays to you all. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Ulysses Fernandez, followed by Christopher D. Greif. Good morning, members of this committee. As you may have heard previously by other callers in this meeting, our transit isn't the best that it can be. We are dealing with the subway stations that are seriously neglected in many aspects, from tiles and paint coming off the walls to rats running around the station, with no real improvement for years to any of these concerns. In addition to the new surge of violent crime and homelessness plaguing the stations that we use to commute, all of these problems should be looked into by this committee. Also, the height of the COVID pandemic has passed and people don't wanna be wearing masks for the foreseeable future. So that's best not to listen to the COVID Karens that are proposing bringing them back during this holiday seasons, as they are a small fringe of New Yorkers. No credible data has come out in favor of preventing masks for COVID transition. Even the World Health Organization refuted preventing the, the spread of masks used by the virus. It's baffling to me that some people want to keep the man, mask mandates in our city indefinitely with no time frame when all the restrictions will be ended. Also, we have a problem with MTA's employees, specifically bus drivers, not appearing at scheduled times, but instead starting their route at the same time back to back in order to finish their runs at the same time with their friends in order for both of them to get lunch. They do not do so and there is no strict supervision as put in place by supervisors who put their friendships over their jobs and customers and passengers also raising the fare is something that is not coming off good with new yorkers that is a hard burden for all new yorkers especially minorities and disabled who may not have funds for a price hike this problem with raising the fare will definitely cause people to skip it more and also will surge in violent crime I give my time up. Thank you. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Christopher Greif, followed by Cara Girl. Good morning, everyone. Happy holidays. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, first, I wanted to make sure that we are supporting the Omni because Omni Reduced Fear is coming around the corner and continuing advocating. It's also important that we also, with these new customer service centers, we got to make sure that not just police, but security, because some stations you have on that list, maybe is good spots, but some spots I'm going to say it may not be safe. So we need to make sure the environment is safe for customer services for anyone as well. I am still supporting it because it will make it easier for people not to come all the way down to Stone Street because it's very congested on the tunnels and bridges to get through. It is not fair for the accessory because accessory does try to get on time, but with cars adding in, sanitation trucks, school buses, it causes congestion. I also want to thank our NYPD from yesterday because we had the holiday train, the major credit one, and, and Demetrius saw, got my email, I know that, and he's happy because... A lot of children enjoy the holiday train. They had a great time, and they really enjoyed it because it was different colors, learning the history, and the one line as well. And I want to thank them very much. And for the union, please, let's make sure we work together because the one issue we don't want to see is a fair hike because seniors and people with disabilities must be added into this. If we do a proposal for fair, any fair hike, reduced fair must be in there because Social Security, disability, etc. SI and low-income families have to make sure the budget is in them. It does link to their health insurance and Social Security so they can budget to get on a bus and a subway. So we have to work on that for any person with a senior and a person with a disability. Happy holidays, everyone, and let's keep the holiday spirit still. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Cara Girl, followed by Robert Whitaker. Good morning, I'm Kara Girl, Research and Communications Associate at the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, PCAC. Communicating with riders is key to a positive transit experience, and that includes having transit workers nearby to share information or assistance. This month's announcement that station agents will leave the booth to interact with riders by turnstiles, on platforms, and anywhere else they may need help is a big step in the right direction. Station agents are often the first face of the MTA that riders see when they enter the transit system. 
making them even more visible throughout the, the station helps signal that rider communications is a top priority. It's also great to hear that customer service centers will be established around the five boroughs. Anyone who has made the trek to the MTA's Stone Street Customer Service Center knows how important it is to have centers for riders to get help with reduced fare metro cards, upgrade to Omni, or other assistance right in their own neighborhoods. This focus on rider communications is particularly important with the ongoing transition to Omni. It's clear that more information and outreach is needed to show riders that Omni will be a welcome change. We continue to hear questions and misinformation from riders who wrongly believe that they'll only be able to use Omni with a smartphone, others who complain that they'll no longer be able to use cash to pay, and confusion about whether the $5 Omni card fee can be used for the fare. We think it should to avoid an, an additional burden on those who may need to pay with cash. Omni will open more possibilities for fare discounts, but it's important that the MTA reaches the many riders who may need more targeted outreach and communications to have their questions answered. Today, you'll also be voting on some important new needs requests as part of the November financial plan. We're particularly excited about initiatives that can help improve service, like the availability unit that will hopefully reduce delays caused by staffing shortages and improving maintenance management to get ahead of potential issues. Together with a better rider communications, these initiatives will help create a faster, more reliable, and more enjoyable transit experience. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Robert Whitaker followed by Murray Bowden. Um, Robert is not with us over Zoom, so our next speaker will be Murray Bowden, and then our final speaker for today will be Jason Anthony. Without a doubt, today has been one of the best days I have ever come to meetings. You have shown a flexibility to think out of the box and go forward, and that's important. I'm interested in safety. You've been giving out hats to your crews for years and years and years. That's the way it should be. A yellow hat with your both, so we can see you people. All kinds of people have shown the flexibility today that hasn't been here before. You've heard a lot of bad things. I want to tell you that the people that use you, that I talk to, my grandson and his generation who use this regularly, they're very happy. People are coming back to New York City because they want to be here. They feel comfortable. And you've heard things, yes, there are financial problems. I know that. They'll be solved because this area, this leadership, is leading in change. There needs to be flexibility. What you saw before where there were, somebody would back, well, I brought a backdrop, that's flexibility. Yes, there were strict rules, but those strict rules were before this, the cell phone camera. It changed the way information is distributed. Be honest with people. Tell them the truth. They ain't stupid. Early dementia, I can't keep track of what I'm supposed to say. I want to thank all of the people who took the time to teach me. I'm not that smart. There were people all over taught me to pay attention and to focus. This place is going forward. Yes, there are problems, but the problems are being solved. Thank you all. Thank you for your remarks. Our final speaker for today will be Jason Anthony. Good morning, Rich. Good morning, Hayda. John, resurrected from the dead. One question that I have this very morning. Where is the NYPD commissioner? Where is she? I've been asking this simple question for several months. 
she is hiding from commuters like myself. I see among the public the press person from the AYPD, but she is not here. Why? Because I'm tired of seeing her, Kishan Sung, doing photo ops in our beloved subway system and not seeing police officers when I commute to my beloved, to my job, Amazon, from where I spoke at last month and being pushed at on a daily basis when I take the bus five days a week where people obey the fare in a forgotten borough called Staten Island where the Eagle team doesn't go there anymore. Where I start my day at Atlantic Avenue Barclay Center when I don't see cops. We have to do something, Rich, and we have to do it now. I'll see you guys later. That concludes our public comment session. Thank you to all our speakers. I will now make a motion to approve the minutes from the November 22 meeting. Thank you. Second. Second. Oh, hold on a second. Andrew has a correction. Sorry, Andrew. No problem. Uh, on page 49 under President's report, the first line, he stated that customers have re reported varying customer satisfaction opinions with respect. The word two is missing after that. Two. Okay. Okay. Can I entertain a motion to accept the minutes as amended? Okay. Second. Motion. All those second. in favor? Okay. Aye. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rich. We'll move on to the work plan. Any changes to the work plan? No changes this month, Madam Chair. Okay. Well, you want to start us with the President's report? Yes, thank you so much. So good morning, everyone. Subway customer experience ratings continue to trend positively and demonstrate an increase of six percentage points over the last six months. In November, overall customer satisfaction in subways was 58%, a 2% increase compared to October. Service delivered was 94.5% in November, the highest in 18 months. As our accelerated hiring, training, and availability initiatives continue to result in better service for our customers. Customer journey time performance reached 84.1%, the second highest since May of 2021, also in the last 18 months. The positive results for customer journey time metrics reflects our commitment to managing service even when unplanned incidents occur, such as this morning where, sadly, at 8.30 this morning, we had a young woman jump in front of a train on the 6 uh, at Grand Central, which disrupted service. This is a difficult time for many people. For many of us, the holidays are a time of joy. For others, it's a time of sadness. So please keep her, her family, and those in mind. We continue efforts to move the needle on customer satisfaction by listening to our customers and meeting them where they are which is why I am most pleased to announce or re-announce a historic agreement with the TWU that station agents will be coming out of the booth to directly engage with our riders throughout the system. Demetrius will give a presentation shortly to give a little more detail on that. And he'll be asking for this committee's approval on a staff summary to hold a, a public hearing to discuss the details of the agreement. We also announced the next phase of enhanced customer service through the opening of 15 comprehensive customer service centers in the subway system, designed to provide additional customer support in targeted high traffic subway stations across the five boroughs. Customer service centers will be a resource for assisting customers with Omni, a big change management moment we have coming soon, reduced fare support, among other customer needs. The service centers will open in six subway stations in early 2023, with nine additional stations expected to have the centers opening later in the year. Customer service centers will provide uh, historically services historically provided by the MTA exclusively at Three Stone Street, which one of our customers mentioned in their testimony here in the building, the only place right now where a customer can get um, uh, good point service. Uh, as I said, Demetrius will go into greater detail in just a moment. As part of our Faster, Cleaner, Safer plan, Demetrius, you can see a theme emerging today, will also uh, touch upon year-end results from the SPEED unit established in October 2021. 
This group works with all departments in New York City Transit to increase tra train speeds, reduce delays, improve operating efficiency, all with safety first and foremost. In addition, Demetrius will also present a comprehensive plan to transform the way we are cleaning our stations and train cars in order to reach our goal of increasing customer satisfaction by at least 10% uh, in 2024. Demetrius, I will hand you the mic, and I think I have uh, the clicker, so to speak. So I'll guide you through. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Rich. Uh, thank you, Ada. This month, we're going to touch on several aspects of President Davies' vision for establishing a faster, cleaner, and safer system. For December, we will just discuss three elements that are fundamental to that mission. The first is the effect of speeding up the system safely uh, with an update on the work that's been done to date. Uh, two would be cleaning transition plan. How will we transition from COVID cleaning to in-house terminal and station cleaning? And then third, how we'll be prioritizing customer service of the future. Uh, to get things started, I'd like to introduce Bill Amorosa. Bill uh, replaced Jackie Cools as the Vice President and Chief Officer of Operations Support. Fantastic addition to the team. Bill. Great. Thank you, Demetrius, and good morning, committee. Uh, I'd like to speak a little bit about the SPEED unit. Um, SPEED was created as an ad hoc unit in 2018. Uh, primarily using resources that were borrowed from other areas, mostly service delivery. They made great progress understanding the issue of gray timer signals and what became known as slow clearing signals. Um, they were able to look at this problem, understand how it was not only slowing down the system, but reducing the confidence of our operators to operate at the posted speeds. Um, by understanding the problem, identifying those slow clearing signals, working with our partners in maintenance of way to repair those signals, uh, we've been able to increase average running speeds in those areas. Uh, that team also began looking at civil speed improvements where we could not just operate at the posted speeds but also increase those speeds where it was safe to do so. As Rich said, the team was formally established in October 2021 to permanently continue the work that had been started and make sure we didn't backslide and to look at new areas for speeding up the system. I'm proud to have members of the team here today, um, including Bobby Lal, who is our first director of the team and has now been promoted to be a general superintendent in service delivery, spreading uh, what we've done in speed to the operation directly. Uh, we also have Max Diamond, who is a conductor and an analyst on the team, working to review the signal system, and train service supervisors Azare Taylor and Jason Vasquez, uh, who are all excellent members of the team and have done great work over the past year and a half. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Go to... So I want to speak a little bit more about grade time signals or speed control signals. Uh, these are signals that were installed in the system to ensure we're operating safely and that trains are not exceeding the safe speed. Over time, the mechanical devices that were installed began to slow down. So a signal that was supposed to clear at 20 miles an hour may have slowed down to 19 or 18 or 17. And over time, operators adjusted the way they were running their trains to run more slowly and avoid uh, being stopped by those signals and having their trains go into an emergency brake application. Uh, we went through an effort to test all of the signals throughout the entire system, understand where there were signals clearing slowly, correct those issues, recalibrate the signals, and upgrade them from mechanical to digital timers. The mission of the SPEED team now is to twice annually retest all of those signals, um, and we are very pleased to see that the corrections are holding up and we only find a very small percentage of signals that are failing that retesting and when we identify them we work with our partners in maintenance of way and engineering to very quickly correct them that's building confidence among our train operators and allowing the system to operate faster as we've corrected these issues we've also been able to move on to other uh, improvements that allow us to uh, speed up service. Um, you'll see on here terminal communications improvements. This is a very simple concept to provide more information to our 
uh, train crews about when they're, which trains they were scheduled to operate on. So these signs have gone up in select crew rooms and they've become very popular with our operating crews. Uh, something as simple as cleaning signs along the right of way makes them more visible, makes it easier for the operator to know what that speed is that he or she should be targeting. And the unit is also working on policy improvements where, you know, as we install CBTC, which gives us new opportunities for speed control to make sure that we're setting the right limits, um, following the recommendations of the engineers on what the highest safe speed is uh, to operate the system. Um, another area that I'm really proud of is coaching employees, both our operators and supervisors. The coaching is all about positive uh, reinforcement and working with people to understand when they're not operating optimally. Uh, we were able to use some data to identify certain operators whose running times were statistically different from their peers and were able to go into the field, observe their operation, talk to them, understand why they were operating that way, and then coach them to improve their operation. That again is building confidence in the signs and signals, clarifying the expectations and the rules, and really being a positive way to improve the operation of the system. Just as importantly, we've been working with all new train service supervisors to do a one-day workshop, making sure that they understand the technical workings of the signal system, not just how to operate within it, but understanding how it works, uh, which gives them the skills to go out to their operators and coach them on how to operate more efficiently. Uh, speed team is only four people. Uh, but when you train 57 TSSs and then move on to the other 300 or so over the next year, that's going to build the confidence throughout the system and allow things to improve throughout. Um, one of the other areas that uh, I, I think people are very aware of and that has been very positive is civil speed improvements. Uh, we had identified many areas throughout the system where there were speed limits posted over the years, some of them uh, for reasons that have since changed and we're able to speed up operations. In other areas, we've rebuilt tracks, rebuilt signals to uh, allow faster operating speeds. Uh, we've reviewed 767 of these proposals so far, approved 418 of them, and implemented over 350 of them in the system. And when we look at the running times of the, the various lines that are affected, we see that there are improvements on those lines and that this is having a positive effect on the system. And you can see in the image there, um, so sort of simple image of cutting off the 20 mile an hour sign, installing it at 35 and speeding up trains. Um, I'd like to close with just a few examples of the improvements that we've seen over 2022. Uh, these are occurring on all lines throughout the system in all four boroughs. Um, in the Central Business District, as you'll see with uh, some of the improvements at West 4th Street, um, we increased operation of the Downtown 4 in the Bronx near 138th Street. Uh, a pretty significant increase on the G line entering Fulton Street. It's one of the lines I use, and I can tell you from my personal experience, that train is much faster now. Um, so we hope that our customers are seeing these improvements, and we're going to continue working on them into 2023. Great. Thank you. Um, Andrew, before the, but th so thank you, William, and thank you for identifying the team, and congratulations, guys, and keep up the good work in 2023. Okay, Andrew. Thank you um, for that really interesting report. Um, are you checking all equipment types for undue lateral sway? at some of these higher speeds. Um, I've, I have reported on occasion something to Demetrius and there was undue lateral sway. Maybe it was an older car equipment, uh, you know, maybe it was an R46 for instance or something, but are you checking lateral sway? Uh, not specifically, but the engineers do go throughout the system. We have inspections on the tracks and structures on a regular basis. Uh, the car equipment folks are inspecting the cars on a regular basis. So if there is any issue related to the increased speeds, we're picking up on it and addressing it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I see Midori's hand up, and Sharif has a question. Midori. Hi, Bill. Thank you so much for this presentation. I'm really excited, Demetrius and Rich, because I think this is one of the most tangible things that, you know, 
can speed up things without too much of an impact on the budget. So thank you for that. Question for you, um, Bill. So at the end of your presentation, you talked about um, the impacts on certain lines. I'm interested, can you make any statement at all about um, what percentage increase in speed we've seen either averages across the system or by line? Uh, I can't speak specifically to individual lines. Uh, when we've looked at overall running times during the peak period, we do see that they have decreased across the system on all lines and there is a correlation with the speed increases. Um, I have my analytical team in the performance analysis unit working on a more detailed analysis to look at what individual speed increases yield in terms of speed, but I can't give you a specific percentage for the system. Okay, thank you. Sharif? I too want to commend you and the team for the work that has been done so far. Just a quick question about um, your engagement with labor in this. Um, I think, you know, you know at, uh, as you mentioned, there were some of these restrictions in place for years. So how do you engage labor to the point where there's a comfort level in some of these changes that are being made? Yeah, so I think there, there's three areas. Uh, one is we have a communication system set up where we're actively soliciting feedback from the field. So the email address for the speed unit is posted in all of the crew rooms. Uh, we've been spreading the word that if they see an area that they believe should be sped up or that should be looked at, we're encouraging them to contact us and then we're following up on those recommendations. Uh, whenever a speed change is made, a bulletin goes out and the word is spread again through the crew rooms but also through line management supervision down to the operators to ensure that they know that uh, what has changed and uh, to be aware of the, the change in speed. So it's not that a sign just changes one day, but they're notified about it in advance and encouraged to follow the new limits. Any other questions? If not, thank you again, Bill. It was thank great. You. Looking forward to hearing from you in 2023. Demetrius, you'll continue or? Yes, I will. Okay. Um, so just wanted to say thanks again, Bill, as well. Um, fantastic work for you and the team. Um, you know, a, a lot of times we see what our folks in the, in the front line do, um, but we don't necessarily see the work that these folks do. You just feel it in the way we operate. So. Um, appreciate your work, appreciate the work that you've done in working with maintenance of way, signals, um, track, um, C&D, service delivery. Um, it, is, it is without question a huge tackle to just make one adjustment. Um, so each of these adjustments requires, requires the help of several individuals. Um, and, and just to go back to your point, Sharif, sometimes it's not, just, it's not just how do we get this specific track. The folks may tell you, the area is not well lit. Um, I can't see coming into this, this specific curve, and yet it's a, it's, it's a faster curve. They may say the placement of, the, of where the, the uh, car stop marker is, is, is difficult to see. Um, but these folks are able to kind of facilitate that change. They're the voice of, of some people in, in the field. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about cleaning at this point. Um, having and maintaining a clean environment both in cars and in the station environment is critical specifically as it pertains to improving upon customer satisfaction. Uh, this is especially so given the fact that where we were um, just a short while back during the COVID, um, the hiring freeze impacted the cleaner population like it did every other title that we talked about. We supplemented our existing cleaners during that time with a contractor a workforce where they focused on sanitizing the assets. So this right now, this time presents a unique opportunity as we transition away from contract to cleaners to building our internal force and, um, and how do we do so. So the cleaning plan involves bringing on um, over 800 cleaners for both stations and terminal cleaners. Uh, to do so, the plan involves uh, a team from HR. Uh, let's see, sorry. To do so, the plan, it brings uh, from HR, 
uh, brings on internal adjustments. They made internal adjustments to improve the population that are eligible to come in as, as individual candidates. Um, they started this process where they removed the fee for applications. Um, that garnered 75,000 uh, individuals who were now eligible to be cleaners within our system. Um, those applicants were then chosen as part of a lottery. And then um, in order to onboard this huge number of people, we tripled our, our training capacity by adding additional trainings both day and night um, rather than before where we had done it on one tour. Uh, we're now hiring roughly 48 station cleaners and 100 terminal cleaners a month going forward. Part of that is the training itself. The training itself was revamped. We evaluated our internal processes, the cleaning, and the tools that are used for cleaning, um, and, and we put those against the contractors and what they were utilizing. So the areas during this evaluation, the areas that the contractors had done better, they evaluated better than our cleaners, we modified our training programs to address in instances where they mopped a little more. It wasn't necessarily that they're better at mopping, but the way that they structured their time for mocking, mopping um, impacted uh, the way they were rated better. Um, so that was, in, include, in cha that was changed into our uh, training program, and we anticipate to be at full staff uh, by the third quarter of 2023. The Cleaning Transformation Plan is set forth on three bullets of success. The first is to set standards, what makes sense, how it makes sense, and how do we do it to succeed. Um, the goal is to improve customer satisfaction. Ultimately, cleaning is one of those aspects that people see as soon as they come into the system or when they come on trains. Um, so there's opportunity to improve upon our customers' perception. The second bullet is getting the resources in place. We talked about the training, um, having the training with the special tools to do what they need to do, um, and then able to meet what the customer's expectation is. And the third part is how do we supervise those results, the quality and consistency, um, to audit the performance, and also to empower people um, with the ability to do the right thing. Um, and at the end of the day, we have to recognize those who, are go, who go above and beyond in doing the performance of their duties. It's one of the areas that we, we, we do fall short from time to time. The next step would be opening up uh, nine of the public bathrooms. Uh, in January of 2023, we'll be opening bathrooms at nine stations, two in the Bronx, two in Brooklyn, two in Queens, and uh, three in Manhattan. Currently, we're doing the, the maintenance uh, to prepare these rooms for, restrooms for service. But as you can see, we, we utilized uh, a pretty broad brush when uh, covering the boroughs for uh, rolling out the public bathrooms. Uh, as many of you are already aware, we recently announced a plan for the future of station agents radically changing how we intend to deliver customer service. The days of the station agent delivering customer service behind a piece of thick glass through a sometimes less than audible uh, microphone will be behind us. Mm -hmm. Agents will greet customers outside of the booth, provide assistance or guidance as needed, but also providing an extra pair of eyes who can alert the control center if and when there is an incident or safety concern. To prepare agents for this transition, we've developed a new training curriculum for customer service agents. Uh, the training will have some technical skills, uh, training on Omni and observing and reporting anomalies in the system, dealing with elevator and escalator issues, not replacing the elevator and escalator folks, but how do you report them, um, but also requires some soft skills, um, providing customer service, um, it also includes how do you deal or assist uh, with customers that have disabilities and seniors. Um, they will be given a mobile device with apps to allow them to provide additional info on service, to assist in wayfinding, um, and also to assist those who may have uh, English as other than their first language. The 
The next step is establishing customer service centers. Uh, in this phase, of custom, we'll be establishing customer service systems centers throughout the system uh, and many different locations, 15 different locations. Many of you are familiar with the trek to Stone Street uh, for, uh, for assistance. Well, we're bringing that specific ask where a person can go and needs a specific assistance. It will be closer to them than going to the Stone Street. It will be closer to their home locations. At these locations, agents will be able to provide additional level of service, helping customers trade in expired cards, enroll in reduced fare programs, or transitioning from MetroCard to open loop, loop only. Uh, this is a breakdown of what you expect to see out there. Uh, there'll be 11 booths uh, that will be modified or upgraded to customer service centers and four new build outs. Uh, some of them include like a retail sp type space uh, with seating, um, you know, locations where people can fill out uh, forms as necessary. And here is a breakdown of the stations where customer service uh, centers will be located. Um, they're in each borough, three in Brooklyn, three in the Bronx, three in Queens, four in Manhattan, and one in Staten Island. So the benefits we discussed with the station agents and this agreement that we have in place are transferable to the customer service centers. Uh, you can see the same tools that it, that that will be utilized will still be utilized to provide customer service in those those areas. Um, but you also note that some there are some additional uh, a functional be, a bit availability like delay verification that an agent would be able to provide. While the new strategy aggressively challenges how we will provide customer service, clearly showing our commitment to customer service being the North Star, the plan uh, is also fiscally responsive to our current challenges we face with the looming fiscal cliff. The plan saves $10.5 million annually and offsets a $1 an hour increase to fund the customer service agents of the future. Next steps, things that need to still be done. We will calendar a public hearing as we effectuate how the station agent's role will be rolled out along with the coverage assignments. Um, stay tuned for dates announcing customer service centers as they're rolled out across the boroughs. And then we'll be followed up with new customer service model. Um, what you will see, how you will see, the, 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 the garb that they will don, um, it's, uh, it's all going to be good to see. So now I'll pass it on to Rich. Unless you have any questions, we'll talk about the ridership trends. I think Mr. Jones has a question. Yeah, just a couple. Um, it's been raised. I don't agree with the public speaker, but the question of the safety of these individuals, uh, particularly are they going to be touring alone or in pairs late at night and, and the rest? And I guess as a follow-up, do they have immediate communication to the NYPD? Uh, on their person, how they trained in that. So, and then finally, I'll do it all at once. The customer service stations that you're, are they linking to fair fares in terms of enrolling people who come up if they're eligible, um, at least through the city vehicles, because we have very slow take up beyond the 276,000 people who've enrolled. And clearly it's become John Owen system's advantage if we can get more people into the program. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. So, so part of the agreement um, that we reached with the TWU is to evaluate the locations on a case-by-case -case basis, meet with the union, uh, walk around to locations. So if locations are determined to be unsafe, if there's a, an unsafe element at a specific location, it's our obligation to get that addressed. Um, but I think that communication between labor and management is like critical. Um, if, if we do not have that communication, then what you say is, is absolutely possible. Um, but so that, that collaborative, and it's part of the agreement itself that that is to happen. Um, I think the second question you asked about the communication. So uh, we talked about the, the cell phone devices that they will have. Um, in the booth itself, they'll still have access. They're not getting rid of the booth. So if an agent needs to get into the booth for safety, the booth will still be there. 
Um, they still have access to the EBS system, which will contact the control center, and the phones themselves will still be able to contact the police if necessary, if there's an immediate need. Um, but remember, they have access to the control center. There's an officer in the control center. They dispatch the, the, the police like almost immediately uh, for, for issues. And the, and the final thing is fair fares. What is the relationship now in terms of promulgating that through these new uh, station uh, agents? So, so I think what we did was a lot of what customer service is and what the new customer service model will, will, will do is really yet to be set. We, we've, we've set the, the, the baseline for what we want to do, which is model it after, after Stone Street, um, but the actual functions can be built upon over time. So there's really no limit. I'll check, in, check into fair fares to see how we can accommodate. Be just a follow-on to Number Judd. So, um, one, of course, the safety question, as Demetrius mentioned, we actually have established uh, certain hours and number of folks per week to be walking out to make sure. So, it's a joint management safety team. We take that very seriously. Of course, we have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of station cleaners who are out, of course, themselves, um, you know, on a daily basis. But, you know, as mentioned before, employee assaults. One is too many. We have a lot more than one. It is outrageous and something we're going to keep a close eye on. On fair fares, I think it's it's a it's a great point you raised. Um, we've been doing these transit talks now every couple of weeks, and the city has joined us and brought a fair fares table. And as I've made the joke, as popular as I'd like to think I am, the fair fares t table is far more uh, popular than anything that we're providing. Uh, in transit, so a lot of folks are signing up for the program. So, if it's information, great. But if we can actually facilitate the sign up for folks, um, it's it's an excellent point. Any other questions? Okay, if not, I move on. I guess I need to take a vote now. Yeah. So, um, what, what, you know, as Demetrius mentioned, um, we have within the 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 book a staff summary to authorize a public hearing for the proposed. Uh, the reduction or elimination of station agent service booth, literally getting out of the booth, um, and then the elimination of the station booth lunch relief, which were both part of the deal with the TLBU. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the staff summary? Motion. 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 Second. Second tree. All those in favor? Abstention. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, moving along, we saw last month that bus customer satisfaction also increased by three points to 68% uh, for October. The increase was driven in large part uh, by improvements around satisfaction with bus announcements. Should also be noted that despite the holiday gridlock we, we typically see these days, service reliability increased by two percentage points, and other service-related metrics remained consistent, wait time, travel time. This is a credit to the expertise of our dispatching team and the field management to keep service moving even during adverse conditions. The implementation of network redesigns is another critical piece to the puzzle to support our faster, cleaner, and safer strategic action plan. As many of you know, the MTA released a draft plan for the Brooklyn Bus Redesign Network, the first overhaul of Brooklyn bus service in decades, and another special feature in our, in our uh, board book uh, this month. The proposal, and I have to emphasize, it is a proposal. We will do a number of uh, workshops, customer workshops, uh, starting in January through March. Uh, but if you were to use a sports metaphor, this is the top of the first inning uh, for the Brooklyn bus redesign. So we want folks' uh, folks's feedback. Um, that was the Mets, by the way, Madam Chair. It was not a reference to any other sports teams. The proposal to create a simpler bus network to encourage bus uh, ridership, reduce travel time, and strengthen interborough bus travel it's a prioritized comment, by the way, received from the public in our initial outreach. In total, the plan proposes 69 local routes, 24 of which will have additional service, and 19 express routes. The borough's population has grown over 5% since 2010, and according to census data, about 55% of Brooklyn households do not own a vehicle. Taking a fresh look at the bus network is necessary as the final redesign will provide, we hope, a new baseline in which the MTA can build upon as the borough continues to evolve and change. To supplement an easier to follow bus network, the draft plan proposed five color-coded routes uh, to improve uh, the legibility and tailor routes to our customers' needs. Green for local, purple for rush, red for limited, blue for crosstown, and dark green for express routes. There will be a quiz later for this committee. <laughs> Brooklyn is the fourth borough to undergo a bus network redesign following Staten Island, the express, of course, Bronx, which was to great success this past June, and Queens, which we are knee-deep in the middle of now. 
Bronx and Staten Island redesigns that have been implemented, we have seen positive improvements so far. As an example, in November, AM weekday speeds were up 9% on change routes in the Bronx compared to 2019. Um, at that, I want to hand it over to Frank just to give a couple more milestones of what we've experienced in bus. So Frank, do you want to take it away? Yeah, thank you, Rich. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so a, another critical milestone for buses is our commitment to a zero emissions fleet by 2040. Uh, this capital program includes funding for the purchase of up to 500 all-electric buses and associated charging equipment. This month, we'll be moving one step closer to that goal with the public solicitation of bids for 470 battery electric buses. These buses are projected to be deployed at 11 depots throughout our system. Depot locations were selected through a rigorous alternative analysis process based on multiple selection criteria, including environmental justice, borough distribution, power capacity, facility space, and schedule feasibility, in addition to a detailed review of all depot locations. The buses are slated to de be delivered in two tranches, which first will be projection is in 2025 and then the second in 2026. Finally, this month we are requesting board approval to award a contract to Fleet Watch in the amount of $6.35 million to upgrade the fuel management systems at bus depots. Fleet Watch is currently deployed at Grand Avenue and Mother Clara Hale depots. This contract will enable it to be installed at all the remaining bus depots across the system over a two-year span. The current system has become obsolete from a, both a hardware and software perspective. A reliable fuel management system is critical for a Department of Buses to reconcile the fuel received to the fuel dispense amounts for New York State DEC mandated reconciliation purposes. The system is expected to last about 20 years, which will certainly exceed the need. Uh, at this time, I'll turn it back over to Rich. Thank you. No, Lisa has a question. You mentioned 11 depots for the new buses. Can you tell me how many of those are in the Bronx? Okay, I can as a matter of ah. fact. <laughs> okay, in the first tranche, there's going to be um, two in the Bronx, and then in the second, uh, there will be, that's it, there's two in the Bronx. Okay. Leads me to the next. Where are the other uh, nine? Okay, so we have uh, all across all boroughs. Bronx, Please. We have the uh, Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island. So uh, essentially all. And I'm sorry, there was actually a third Bronx one uh, in the second tranche. Thank you. Thank you. Selfishly, I always have to take care of my borough. There was a third Bronx one immediately after you asked the question. <laughs> Let me note that for the record. Um, that was the either or. So good job, the Frank. Or. Good job. Frank, <laughs> Frank once again, uh, quick on his feet. Uh, just a quick update for Accessor Ride. So customer satisfaction dipped a bit in November to 65%. Uh, but as a reminder, uh, paratransit performance data takes about 30 days to accurately reflect service delivering with a satisfaction rate. And I can tell you already what I've seen in November and December. We should expect an uptick in satisfaction. Chris and the team, despite the rise in ridership, we often don't talk about this. Paratransit is now close to 100% on some days, pre-pandemic levels. Um, we're getting excellent um, both on-time performance for 30 minutes and the new mark that Chris has set down for 20 minutes, which would be leading paratransit. So good news coming. Um, no, I just had a, a, a Frank, bus lanes, what's going on? We are... We're finishing up our 2022 right now, okay. um, and we're actually prioritizing. Some have been pushed over into 23 that are expected through to certain delays, but we continue to work with uh, DOT in prioritizing those and you know, working to hopefully expedite them quicker than we're moving right now. And what are the delays? Do you know? Is uh, it us? Is it them? Is it no, the I, th I think it's there. There's you know, there's delays from all different aspects, right? There, you have to, that we, community outreach is, is, has to be done, diligence there. Then there's also okay. co co some contractor delays, right? The okay. availability of contractors, um, you know, getting the contractors out there, the availability, and also, you know, hiring for employees, so. Okay, thank you. Um, 
And so on broker service, we completed 93% of our trips within the 30-minute window from the promised time, slightly under our goal. But the results, um, you know, we're still pushing uh, for improvement. Uh, overall, our no-show performance was a th per thousand scheduled trips has significantly improved, 72% on primary carrier and 24% from October 21. So over a year, we've significantly improved our paratransit uh, performance. Um, and, you know, I, before I close, I do want to move to the ridership trends question. I know this came up earlier um, and just want to uh, put down any rumors and be clear about uh, what we're looking at. And so I think when I took this job back six months ago, I promised this committee and the board that we would look at the data around ridership um, and just be very clear about what we were seeing. And what we're seeing is um, still uh, in this past fall, we've been watching closely as Mondays and Fridays, are softer uh, when it comes to ridership. Um, as you can see, the average ridership for Mondays is about 3.4 million, where Thursdays is now averaging over 3.8 million. And the days in which we tend to achieve our records, we achieved just shy of 4 million customers was a Thursday, two Thursdays ago. Um, that tends to be our highest ridership day. Um, and um, for AM peak, I think it's in particular to look at, we're seeing a significant, uh, you know, a significant change in, in, in ridership on Fridays as well. So, you know, Mondays tend to see a little bit better vis-a-vis um, -vis Friday. But again, if you look at our averages uh, for the weekday, Mondays and Fridays continue to be soft. Um, and then lastly, what I wanted to show is, is a percentage of ridership uh, pre-COVID uh, by day of week. And so while weekdays are in the 60, uh, you know, small, low 60 percent. Um, and Saturdays and Sundays are trending much higher, 75 percent on Saturdays and, and almost uh, 75 percent on Sundays. And so, you know, we don't have a board um, um, uh, action or uh, review today to be had. Uh, in fact, it's an informational item because the suggestion adjustments we're going to make will reflect this. But let me explain them uh, briefly. So. What we have uh, decided to do and what we'll be providing to the board as an informational item next month is um, enhancing weekend trips on the G, J, and M lines. Uh, enhancements like this will make it easier for folks in Brooklyn and Queens to get around the city to meet up with friends, family, and experience the millions of things New York City has to offer. The changes would increase scheduled trips on those three lines in the weekends, improving headways by two minutes. These three lines are used, as I said, by Brooklyn and Queens riders to transfer to other subway lines typically. So having longer headways on the weekends, in fact, impacts them as they transfer. We're also looking at an earlier start to weekday A and C express and local service to reflect post-COVID morning rush hour patterns. Manhattan-bound A express service will commence one trip earlier during the morning rush to help riders in East and Queens and the Rockaways blue-collar workers who need to get into downtown Manhattan before 7 a.m. To complement the early start to express service, one rush hour sea trip will be shifted to early in the morning. There are no impacts to customers there. We're also making minor service adjustments to reflect the, uh, the soft ridership on Mondays and Fridays on the 167, EFL, and Q lines. Subway ridership overall has been consistently lower on Mondays and Fridays than midweekdays, reflecting the growing trend of hybrid work. As a result, our suggested changes will add wait times from 3 to 30 seconds. Let me repeat that, 3 to 30 seconds um, for specific time periods affected by the change. These uh, service changes would go into effect in June of 2023. Due to our pick process with labor, we'll give uh, draft, um, draft changes to labor in January, and there would be a pick process that would go into effect in June. Um, I just want to point out that, um, you know, data has really driven this item. Um, and as I mentioned that, uh, you know, ridership, we have been running 100% pre-COVID uh, service for uh, ridership that is well below that. Um, and I think the changes reflect what our customers are asking for and how our customers are using our service, which is more weekend service proportional to pre-COVID and less um, on Mondays and Fridays. Um, the proposal itself um, the total cost impact is a savings, I think, of one and a half million dollars. So this is not about a budget uh, savings at all. As we know, the fiscal cliff is 
factors maybe of 100 of that. So this is not about saving money. This is about changing service that reflects our patent and ridership. Lastly, I would say uh, those who have been uh, with me at, or at MTA longer uh, than I have told me that this is a routine, that prior to COVID, these kinds of changes would be routine. I think the difference is, is that we're not making the changes throughout the week because our customers are riding the system very differently. Um, so with that, um, that ends my report. Uh, John, you have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> we, this just this landed on my radar roughly this morning. And um, I do want to let you know that the local is telling me they have no detailed information on this. So it is, it's difficult for us to make an assessment about the level, the exact nature of the cuts without specifics about it. So I would ask that you instruct your folks to give my folks the information They'll have it. it by the end of the day, John. I apologize right. for that. Yep, I appreciate that. that. And uh, wait, I'm not, I'm not done yet. The, there's an, all the difference in the world between negligible cuts or what I referred to you before as nibbling around the edges and cuts that require you to fulfill, you know, your mandatory obligations under New York State law, under the public authorities law. And again, it ties back to the first thing I said. We have no idea if that's the case. And frankly, we don't trust anybody to make that assessment except us. And um, the quicker it gets public, uh, the, the exact nature of the cuts, the quicker that the riding public can be involved and begin assessing, and certainly the quicker we can assess. And, you know, it's our work plans that are being affected by it. As you mentioned, it's our pick. And um, I think that's a bit, that's about it, other than to say that this is looking like there might be some action here. It's been rather dull since Larry Schwartz got tossed off the board. So looking, looking forward to the debate. All right. Midori, you have your hand up. <laughs> I yes, can't. yes, but I'm not sure how to follow that one. Um, but um, thank you, Rich, for clarifying. You know, of course, I, I haven't seen anything in writing, but I just want to make sure I understand. It sounds like what is happening, and, I, and I'm, you know, obviously going to be generous. It sounds like what is happening is you're seeing that subway ridership increase again on weekends, and you're trying to figure out kind of where to pivot the service. Um, so thank you for highlighting that it is, it is a savings, um, but you said it was like under 30 seconds in terms of wait time. So, so this sounds, and I just want to, is it appropriate to call this kind of operational tweaks or this isn't something that is going to flag what John mentioned, which was a public authorities law kind of process around hearings and all that. Is this just about the pick and the schedules that you're putting in the pick? Um, that's right, Victoria. So we believe this is an informational item only. Obviously, you know, others may have a different opinion, so we'll obviously give the information so it can be fully vetted. But, you know, as I'm told, I was not here, obviously, prior to, to COVID, but this was a bit of a routine uh, okay. that we want to take from time to time. I think the, the difference here that I've heard um, from our partners in labor that there's concern is that some employees will have a different work week, right, because the service we're running won't be the same every weekday, uh, which is reflective, obviously, of, of what our, how our customers are, are riding today. But certainly we will be uh, very transparent um, and, you know, wanted to start this process early, given that um, the pick process starts in, you know, late January, early February. This wouldn't go into effect until June. So the committee will have some time to, uh, to review it, the public as well, to comment. But to your specific question, we do not believe this rises to the level of a, of a public hearing. Okay. Well, thank you so much for letting us know. I forgot to add one thing, if I may. Go ahead. <clears throat> the, the construct that you're laying out here, even if it's preliminary, is, seems to be predicated upon a thought that you will increase weekend service off the backs of midday service. And I don't, I don't understand that at all. We just had a whole presentation about speed and the, and the quest to improve service delivery. And I, I don't understand why weekday service just can't be left the way it is, particularly in light of the fact that you're, you're talking about the very little savings that you'll achieve relative to the overall budget. So why increase weekend service off the backs of midweek service why leave it in place let, let you know kind of build that they will come no I, I appreciate that and that, that's a legitimate point I think we've built it for a long time and they, they haven't come on Mondays and Fridays and it's reflective um, of other you know statistics 
whether it's office, um, you know, vacancy rates on Mondays and Fridays, you know, other statistics, what we've seen. We're not build and just to your point, I think what we saw was an opportunity, as I, as I mentioned and promised when I started six months ago, we were going to look at ridership and let the data follow. It's clear our customers are coming back more frequently on weekends, which is why we're going to have the service. You might ask, why did we pick those three lines for weekend service? And, and the answer is we don't have construction work going on. And so, you know, we brought on Jose LaSalle to really help us provide better weekend service. And part of that is running the service we advertise, right? We, we have scheduled, I think, very good service on the weekends, but given all the construction impacts, we're not always, we're not always delivering it. And so there's, uh, to me, a twofold question here for weekend service. One is delivering what we advertise, and then two, increasing where we can, and that's the genesis of those three lines. Without work happening, we can actually go from 10 minute headways to eight he minute headways, which is the proposal. So <clears throat> I appreciate all of this. Um, I do understand where John is coming from. Um, the good news is that they may not be heading to the office, but you know, for discretionary travel on weekends, they're choosing to use the transit system. I had standing room only on every train I rode this past Saturday all over the place. So they are obviously riding. I don't know if it's the holidays and everybody's coming to see everything that's going on, but it was really packed. When you say the reduction on weekdays would would be like between 3 and 30 seconds or something like that, that's if everything is running like clockwork, obviously. Um, so if something is delayed for another reason, that those additional delays could build on that line, and you could have considerable delays, poss possibly. And then you said the increases you're doing on the weekends are on lines without construction. When those lines that are getting construction have the construction finished, will those lines be looked at to increase the level of service on weekends? Well, so I think of the second question, of course, but that obviously, you know, there's a there's a looming elephant in the room. We're talking about a million and a half dollars, and yeah. we've got a two and a half or two point eight billion dollar fiscal cliff. So, I think of putting that aside. Let's assume that's solved and something magical or mystical mystical occurs. Um, absolutely. Um, but I, you know, I, I think again, going back to the, uh, I mean, to your point, I mean, whatever service we advertise, if there are delays, you know, as a, unfortunately the person who, you know, seems to have committed suicide this morning whatever service we are advertising is going to be dramatically impacted. Um, I mean, again, I, I, you know, looking at the data, just purely at the data, a three to 30 second, um, I think, I mean, my, my, my perspective is um, if we didn't actually talk about it publicly, I don't think anybody would notice, um, to be honest. But obviously that's not what we're doing. We need to talk about any changes publicly um, and to be honest with, you know, with the committee and, 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 and the public. Mm -hmm. But... Um, as I said, you know, we look forward to providing the staff summary and sharing, you know, as John requested to the TWU, the very specifics um, of what we're proposing. Um, I do believe it's not a major impact. And, and uh, again, you know, just, just, just very sort of Joe Friday, what, what are the facts? The facts are people are coming back on the weekends. People are staying home in some respects on Mondays and Fridays. And that's what this very small proposal reflects. Now, according to one of your earlier statements, this wouldn't take effect until June. It's quite possible that in June, people might be coming back on the Mondays and Fridays. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and so nothing is set in stone. So again, putting aside the fiscal cliff, I mean, as I understand it, before I got here, this is not uh, unusual. You know, I look to Judy and Craig, Demetrius and others, that you'd be constantly looking at the service to see where ridership is and making, you know, adjustments and changes. So... Uh, you're absolutely right, Andrew. We will look. I mean, if if service, you know, if if, if putting again aside the fiscal issue, if if service does come back on Mondays and Fridays, or if there are other places where we need to add service, um, ultimately we're transit people. We love running more service. Any other questions? Okay. If not, we'll move on to Q. Thank you, and good afternoon. <clears throat> Twenty twenty two was a historic year for accessibility here at the MTA. Earlier in the year, Chairman Lieber presented the four core values of the MTA, of which accessibility was one of those values. And that means everything from making our stations and rolling stock infrastructure accessible 
to those with mobility disabilities, to designing visually accessible digital content, to training and resourcing our employees to provide great customer service to those with disabilities and with access needs. We put our money where our mouth is on accessibility this year and set the stage for the work for years to come. So today I want to take a look back a bit to what we've done this past year and do a, somewhat of a look forward to how we'll continue to build on this work in the future. Earlier this year, we welcomed our new <clears throat> uh, Vice President for Paratransit, Chris Pangolinian, who is bringing to life a vision for a modern paratransit system that can serve the needs of all paratransit customers. Like Chris, my team and I are working to bring a new holistic vision for accessibility to everything that we do at the MTA. As I said when I first joined here at my first board meeting, my vision for accessibility is universal, and, and that includes persons with disabilities as well as parents and caregivers with young children, aging New Yorkers, and those traveling with luggage or bikes, and many others. We launched several projects and programs this year that support this vision, including our open stroller pilot on buses, which is going very well, if I may add, and the Omni Reduced Fare program, which to date has seen over 9,000 reduced fare customers roll over to Omni. We also accelerated our work to install tactile warning strips on platform edges that don't already have this important safety and accessibility feature. I am extremely pleased to report that the subway department and <clears throat> the subway department internal construction team has installed tactile strips on more than 25 platforms across more than a dozen subway stations in this year alone. Two platforms receiving uh, uh, edges at two different edges this weekend alone, with many more projects on tap for the coming months. We also established a plan working across operating and capital departments to install tactile edges at every remaining station in the years to come. These initiatives are already making a great difference for thousands of our customers, and we'll be building on both of these and many other programs in the coming year. We are continuing to redefine what customer service looks like in our system, with big benefits for many riders with disabilities. I was proud to join President Davey and others earlier this month to announce the changing role of subway station agent, with agents spending most of their time outside of the booths starting early next year. Having agents more available and visible around our fare arrays and our stations means more eyes and ears to help customers with ac accessible waiting finding, support customers working to figure out both, both Metro cards and Omni payment options, report issues with things like elevator outages or auto gates uh, uh, working properly, and more. I see this change as part of the whole suite of infrastructure, technology, and personnel investments we are making to make the system more accessible. By making the AutoGate available for all who need it, piloting weight, finding apps like Navalence, and moving towards the Omni contactless payment system, we are giving all of our customers a whole suite of options available for them to travel with more independence and confidence throughout our system. I am particularly proud that, as part of the transition to this new role, all station agents are going through a multi-day training with major focus on accessibility on how to assist customers with using old and new accessible features in our systems. This follows on a new training for all of our 70,000 MTA employees that we launched early this year because we want to ensure that all of our colleagues, whether frontline or office based, are ready to help make our system and work environments feel safe and welcoming for all customers and colleagues. Last, but certainly not least, this summer, we announced an agreement with accessibility advocates to bring the subway systems to 95, we like to say 100% accessibility, over the course of the next three decades. We will be meeting with the disability community regularly, reporting on the progress towards our accessibility goals, and taking input on our future plans. And we are well on our way with 13 ADA projects in this current capital plan moving forward in the last two months alone, including a package of four station projects going before the board this week. The MTA continues to award ADA projects at a record pace, despite our ongoing fiscal challenges, with more than 30 ADA projects underway at stations across all five boroughs. I am particularly proud of the current investments we are making in accessibility at stations in northern Manhattan and the Bronx, servicing communities from college students to aging New Yorkers to whom we want to say you can now age in place, and ensuring that we make steady progress towards geographic equity on our accessibility station maps. When we say accessibility is a core value at the MTA, we mean it now more than ever. We set the groundwork 
this year for projects and investments that will make our systems more accessible for literally decades to come. And my team and I look forward to working with colleagues across the agency and with riders and advocates to see these projects come to fruition in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Q, and thank you and your team for all the hard work that you've been doing the last year and continue doing in 2023. Any questions for Q? Frankie? No? Okay. If not, um, we're going to move on. But before we go to our safety and security report, I'd like to welcome new chief, Chief Michael Kempler. Welcome, Chief. Looking forward to working with you and uh, building on the progress that we've made over the past couple of months. Welcome. Thank you very much. You're next. Well, good morning to all, and thank you for having me here today. Let me formally introduce myself. My name is Michael Kemper. I'm the new Acting Chief of Transit for the New York City Police Department. Before I begin, I would like to publicly acknowledge and thank Police Commissioner Sewell for promoting me to this position and having the confidence in me to lead the men and women of the NYPD Transit Bureau, an exceptional group of people who are committed to the task at hand. That's to ensure public safety in the New York City subway system. This meeting is an excellent opportunity for me to introduce myself to you, as I just started in this role on December 6th. I will also discuss the topic of crime in the New York City subway system as we sit here now. Growing up, I always wanted to be a cop, and my dream became a reality over 31 years ago in April of 1991 when I was appointed to the NYPD at 20 years old. I began my career as a patrol cop in the 6-2 precinct and the 7-1 precinct, both in Brooklyn. I was promoted to sergeant on December 20th, 1995, and since then I have served in multiple different ranks and assignments and roles encompassing all five boroughs. I was promoted to captain in 2003, and since then I have served in many executive positions, including I was the executive officer of the 83rd precinct and the 75th precinct. I was a precinct commander for approximately seven years, commanding the 76th precinct and the 90th precincts. I served as the executive officer of Detective Borough Bronx and Detective Borough Brooklyn. I served as the borough commander of Detective Borough Queen South and the borough commander of Detective Borough Brooklyn North. And I was the executive officer for the entire Detective Bureau citywide. And finally, just prior to my new assignment, I was the patrol borough commander for Brooklyn South. In my new role as Acting Chief of Transit, I am tasked with delivering on the Governor and Mayor Adams' vision for a safe transit system through the Subway Safety Plan. It has been a very busy introduction to the world of the Transit Bureau. I've already had the pleasure of meeting several members of the MTA leadership team, including Chair Lieber, President Davey, and Vice President Deal, just to name a few. And obviously, I have met with my leadership team at the Transit Bureau. I am extremely impressed by what I have seen so far from the team at the NYPD Transit Bureau. Their knowledge of mass transit security will be, an in, will be invaluable as I take on this important new role entrusted in me by Police Commissioner Sewell. I am also encouraged by what I am seeing in relation to the current overall crime stat picture in the New York City subway system. The recent deployment of, an additional uniform, of additional uniform personnel into the subways from platforms to the train cars and to the turnstiles are all part of an unprecedented investment in the safety of the subway system, and the immediate results are quite encouraging. I am pleased to announce that crime in the New York subway system is down for the sixth consecutive week. I believe you have in front of you the crime stats for the month of November, where it details an overall crime reduction of 12.8% in overall major crime in the subway system when compared to last year. When looking at the most recent CompStat four-week period, which is November 14th through December 11th, overall major crime in the subway system has been reduced 23.5% versus last year. The crime experiencing the largest reduction this period is robbery, where robberies are down 50.6% versus last year. This is followed by rape that is down 33.3% and grand larceny is down 15.6%. When comparing the same period, when comparing this same period versus 2019 pre-COVID, overall major crime is down 27%. Matter of fact, when comparing this same period this year, we would have to go back to 2014 to find a lower number of crime reported. When looking citywide where the crimes are occurring, 
occurred during this most recent four-week period, crime is down in all four boroughs. Simply put, all four boroughs in which the New York City subway system operates are experiencing crime reductions during this most recent four-week period. Grand larceny is the highest reported crime this period and year to date. Grand larceny accounts for 47.9% of all reported crime this period in the transit system and 48.5% of all reported crime year to date. When looking at where the crimes are occurring during this most recent four week period, 50.3% occurred on the train and 49.7% occurred off a train, meaning either a mezzanine, platform, or stairwell. And when comparing all crimes reported citywide during this period, crimes in transit account for 1.8% of the citywide total. Overall arrests are up year to date and for this most recent four week period. Focusing solely on the most recent four week period, overall arrests in the transit system are up 40.6% this year versus last year. Felony arrests are up 13.2% and misdemeanor arrests are up 46.3%. Summonses are up year to date and for this most recent period as well. Focusing on this most recent period, tab summonses are up 74.9% versus last year, and criminal court summonses are up 133% versus last year. Year to date, this year versus last year, enforcement action for fare evasion, when combining tab summonses, criminal court summonses, and arrests has increased 40.2%. So as you can see, between the investment of increased uh, police presence, coupled with a lot of hard work from the men and women of the NYPD, our plan is paying dividends, and our goal is to continue with this trend. By no way misinterpret what I'm saying. We are not claiming victory yet. We realize there is still a lot of work to get done. But what I can say, the NYPD is staffed with the greatest cops on earth, and we are committed to continuing to work alongside the MTA, our other partners, and the community we serve to reduce crime further in the subway system. We cannot allow our riders to be subjected to acts of lawlessness, disorder, or violence, and we cannot allow them to feel unsafe. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak before you today, and I wish each and every one in this room a happy holidays. Thank you, Chief. Um, we have a question from David Jones. Chief, and welcome. Um, I've been concerned for the last six years, uh, particularly with uh, summonses for fair evasion and uh, of the in fact, six years ago, I found that 95% of the tab summonses were being issued to people of color, with the understanding that we know that other parts of the system have very serious problems, particularly on the buses, in terms of fare evasion. Uh, I'd be interested in knowing the statistics on uh, how the demographics of who's being given tab summonses with the search. Uh, you don't have to do it now, you've just started, and it no may, way means, uh, since my daughter and I all run, uh, go on the subway and we want safety, but I have been worried about the over-enforcement on fare evasion, particularly in areas uh, with low income. Thank you. Understood. I, I, I do not have those statistics in front of me, uh, but we, we, we don't uh, write summonses based on race gender, sex, uh, that, that's not uh, what we do. Matter of fact, I thought an interesting statistic, uh, which is a factual uh, stat that I do have, is 97% uh, of uh, the people that we come in contact with uh, and we stop for uh, turnstile jumping or fare evading, uh, they're released within uh, minutes uh, with a summons. Randy, you had a question? Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you, Chief. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Um, my my uh, comments are um, not subway, but you have colleagues in the city police. And uh, last week, my wife and I were in the city. We took a ride on the M7 bus. Um, I could not believe how violated the bus lanes were. There was a, I took pictures and I was sending to Frank uh, and Carol. There was a FedEx truck parked in a bus lane and the guy was sorting his packages out in the bus lane with how they would be delivered. There is such a, an abuse. I, I, there were places the driver told me he couldn't get close to the curb and he was thankful 
that the people who were going to board the bus didn't need for him to extend the ramp to bring a wheelchair because he said he wouldn't have been able to do it. They were all able to walk to the third lane to get on the bus. There has to be some info. I mean, it is holiday season and there's a lot of deliveries, but something needs to be done so our buses can get where they're supposed to be on time. The trip took 55 minutes to where we were going, and it's scheduled for approximately 33 minutes. So that's we need to do a better job on, on getting the enforcement of um, that they don't violate the bus lanes and trucks and everything. Thank you. Will do. Any other questions for Chief? Thank you, Chief. Looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Lou, you're next. Yes, thank you. Uh, the New York City Transit Procurement Package includes three actions in the estimated amount of $27.1 million. The first is an award of a competitive, competitively solicited five-year miscellaneous service contracts that includes a five-year option for the removal and disposal of obsolete subway and rail cars. This is a multi-agency contract addressing the combined needs of New York City Transit, Long Island Railroad, and Metro North Railroad. The award for New York City Transit will be the Sims Medal in the estimated amount of $9.4 million. The award for Long Island Railroad and Metro North will be to Frontier Industrial Corporation in the estimated amounts of $3.1 million and $4.02 million, respectively. After evaluation of the technical proposals, the selection committee determined that both Frontier and Sims were technically qualified to perform the work. Pricing is based upon a fixed price per car for the transportation, dismantling, scrapping, abatement, and disposal, where the credit for scrap material will be netted against the overall price for the car disposal. The contract, including the option to extend for an additional five years, totals $16.6 million. The next item is the modification of a contract with Therodynamics Rehab Management, which provides eligibility assessment services for both paratransit and the reduced fare unit. This modification will add a second assessment center in Brooklyn in the total estimated amount of $4.1 million for a base of four years with a two-year option. The December 2021 board approved the award of three competitively solicited contracts to provide assessment centers in Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Staten Island, as well as Queens. Therodynamics received a contract to provide this service for the Bronx and Queens. Um, as two locations are required for Brooklyn, efforts continue to identify and procure additional an additional Brooklyn location, which this modification will, will provide. Incumbent providers were invited to propose a Brooklyn location, with the offering from Therodynamics being the most favorable considering facility location and pricing within the competitive range. The facility located in Bedford-Stuyvesant is convenient to North Brooklyn areas such as downtown Brooklyn, Williamsburg, and Greenpoint. Pricing is based on a per assessment rate for each assessment category for both paratransit and reduced fare. Uh, the remaining item, uh, Frank mentioned this earlier and stole my thunder to the extent there's thunder associated with a fuel management system. Uh, is a ratification of an immediate operating need for an award of a contract to SNA Systems. Uh, this will co consist of 78 terminals, operating software and hardware, and warranty of the system for a period of five years in the estimated amount of $6.3 million. The existing fuel management uh, system in use by Department of Buses and MTA bus uh, company has exceeded its use for life. Uh, and as Frank indicated, the operating life of the new system will be 20 to 25 years and it uses a universal design well established in the industry in both the public and commercial trucking sectors. An industry outreach was conducted to identify companies that provide fuel management systems. It resulted in two companies participating in a pilot program uh, that was installed and uh, their systems were installed and evaluated by New York City Transit with the system from SNA, the Fleet Watch system deemed uh, superior and negotiations were conducted uh, considering the scale of this project. Favorable pricing was obtained, uh, deemed fair and reasonable, and a most favored customer clause was provided by SNA. Uh, and as Frank indicated, the systems will be installed in each of the New York City Transit and MTA bus depots over a two-year period. I submit these procurements for board approval. Lou, I have a question on the first one. Yes. So Sims is gonna do away with the New York City Transit cars? Yes. And Frontier is going to do. The, uh, why couldn't the they do? 
Go ahead. Well, th there are some differences in the process that each company uses. Uh, Sims, and as well as other companies that, that were attracted to this, was absolutely not interested in doing the, uh, the cause for the railroads. And why uh, is that, do you know? The, they're, they're, as I said, their process is different. They lacked familiarity with those cause. And as much as we, we aggressively tried to pursue them uh, to do it, uh, they, they wanted no part of it. Okay. Uh, Fr Frontier is currently doing work for the railroads under an existing contract. And we were able to negotiate with them to get a more favorable price than what we're currently paying. So what are we voting on? To give Sims for us? Uh, and Sims then to for just New York City back? Transit right. and, and the railroads uh, front. No, no, I understand yeah. that. But the mechanics were just increasing the frontier contracts? No, no, no. It's a, new, it's a new solicitation, new even solicitation. though they have been doing work for us before. Okay. And we're the lead agency, which is why it's coming exactly. here? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. It's a joint procurement. We're trying to Great. consolidate requirements Perfect. from a category okay. management standpoint. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions on any other procurements? If not, do I have a motion to move the procurements? S second. Okay, so move. Thank you. Okay, I need a motion to adjourn the meeting so we can move on. Second. All those in favor? Great. Let's go. Diversity starts now. Right? Mm -hmm.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to call the meeting of the Diversity Committee to order, please. My name is Elizabeth Velez, Chair of the Diversity Committee. At this time, I'd like to welcome Frankie Miranda, Midori Valdivia on uh, Zoom, and um, I believe Neil Zuckerman uh, is not present for this meeting. Michael, are there any public speakers today? Yes, it's my understanding that there's two. Good afternoon. We have two members of the public register to speak today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. The first speaker would be Jason Anthony, who will be in person, followed by Andrew Simmons, who's virtual. Good morning, Elis good afternoon, Elizabeth. Uh, good, mo good afternoon, Michael and Midori, who is virtual. Jason Anthony here once again, this time in person uh, after speaking virtually last month at work in Amazon. Uh, I have to bring up a uh, lack of inclusion because um, as a native New Yorker, I should say New Yorkan, uh, inclusion is, uh, I'll say, part of my nature. And living in a city that's a melting pot that's a title of a book written by Esmeralda Santiago that I strongly recommend everybody to read. Um, we experience in our daily lives people that speak different languages. And myself as a transit girl uh, see people that speak different languages. And New York City Transit and the MTA as a whole should have people that speak different languages because New York City has diversity. And the MTA as a whole should have more inclusion, inclusion, I should say, not exclusion. So with that, I'll conclude my remarks, and I'll see you guys in Capital Construction. The, f the final speaker is Andrew Simmons. Okay, my name is Andrew Simmons, and I'm the owner of two, MBD, two MDBE firms, Lachey's Construction and a &S Rebar, which is a one-stop shop together, those two businesses. Lachey's is a construction company and A&S Rebar is a supplier of fabricated and a manufacturer of reinforcement steel rebar. So I, I worked on projects as a general contract. I worked on Rector Street. I worked on Avenue and Avenue X. I worked on Port Jervis train station. I worked on Queensman Town Tunnel. And um, another big project that I'm proud to mention is East Side Access that I worked on for about eight years of building a whole new line, subway station, the Grand Central. I think that it was imperative. I benefited from working, doing probably over 500 projects as a subcontractor through my 20 years with MTA. And once the program had came out, it taught me and showed me how to become a general contractor. So without those, uh, those uh, um, um, classes and, and, and having real life experience of doing contracts out in the field and learning how you know to deal with your submittals, how to deal with your drawings, how to deal with the culture of MTA would have been pretty tough without you know getting that type of lessons. I believe about I would say about 50 percent of my work comes from the MTA. Well I'm just excited you know I'm thankful for the leadership of Michael Garner of, uh, you know, I came with him from School Construction Authority and being a subcontractor over here at MTA, I never dreamed of being a general contractor. Most of their contracts was usually 50 million, 100 million. And, you know, Mike came here under his leadership and broke it down to 2 million, 3 million to smaller 
you know, small parts. And now being a general contractor here, I took it to another level. And now I'm over in New York, Please New conclude Jersey, your Port remarks. Authority, doing pretty big jobs over there. World's Trade Center. The, uh, I um, did a project at their uh, control center and um, did that for them. So I think it was a great lesson, great training. And Please conclude you know, your remarks. actually an asset for me to be able to be my own general contractor. That was really a big thing for me. Chair, that concludes the public comment session. Thank you, and thank you for the public speakers that came in, and it's always great to hear about the impact of uh, the work of the MTA on, uh, on diversity. I want to acknowledge that we have another board member with us, uh, Gerard Bringman. Thank you very much for, for coming in. Normally, as a matter of course, we would approve uh, the meetings, meeting minutes from the September board meeting, but unfortunately, we do not have quorum, so we will take that up uh, at, the last, at the next meeting. Uh, are there any updates? Uh, Michael, on the 2022 work plan. Yes, so that the, the 2023 EEO, ADA, and sexual and other discriminatory harassment policy statements and the all agency Title VI statement will be presented next year. Okay, thank you. Are there any comments or questions from any of the committee members present and on uh, Zoom? Chair, I have one, sorry. Um, I had a door. question, Michael. Um, will we be able to get the Title VI statement as a draft um, to all the board members? As you know, it's obviously very pivotal and important in terms of how we um, how we approach anything like service changes, um, you know, new projects, things like that. Yes, it'll, it'll be forwarded over to the uh, board members in a very short period of time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Michael, can you take us uh, to the executive summary? Absolutely. And so we, you are, you're going to hear an update to um, our MWDBE programming. Uh, next page, please. We are going to talk about the MWDBE SDVOB program update, Regional Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Opportunity Day hiring update, and what's next. Next, please. Next. Our purpose, basically, we, we are here to ensure that, that, that we have equity and opportunity in MWDBEs and other marginalized communities. And in 2022 has been a banner year. Um, if you look at all of the payments that we paid, all of our MWDBE firms and SDVOP firms, that number was $1.5 billion. $1.5 billion were, were, were paid to all of our certified firms. As you know, the state of New York's uh, goal is 30% is MWBE. We are at 32.5% as of last year. The first three, I mean, the first two quarters of this year, we're currently at 36%, so we are trending upward. With, with respect to the MTA, FTA, DBE goal, we, we have an annual goal of 20%. We are at 17%. And we, we, we would be able to achieve our goal, but the FTA, they are pivoting and they're going to approve our, our TBDs to be determined because the, the FTA requires us to fully identify all of our DBE firms up front using the uh, design build model. We do not have that luxury. And so if we did have that luxury, we would currently be at 24%. And so the, the, the FTA is going to be approving the, the way that we do our, our TBDs in a very very, very short period of time. Next slide, please. And so we are, we are driving equity. If you look at the, the two previous years, the, the MTA has been responsible for $2.6 billion in payments, $2.6 billion in payments to our pool of certified MWDB firms. There was a recent uh, uh, NBC news story that indicated that women has been most adversely impacted by COVID-19. We were able to pay over $1 billion to New York State, w, um, New York, uh, State certified WBEs, over $1 billion in two year period. We are once again driving equity, uh, job creation, home ownership, better education opportunities and better healthcare options. Next slide, please. Uh, we, Hi, my name is Steven Rivera. I'm the CEO and founder of Century Management Solutions. We are a tech um, transportation company that provides service around logistics in transportation for non-emergency transportation in New York City. Um, we've been working with the MTA for the last um, year 
And since we started with the MTA, we've been able to participate in two different um, programs. One is the Broker Car Service um, Paratransit, which is the Accessory Program. And we also participate in a short pilot program um, that the MTA and the Department of Homeless Services had, which was um, transporting homeless people to shelters. Coming from a, uh, a minority um, community, being a minority myself, my partner, um, who's a female, um, Stella Mateo, um, we've actually have benefited from the um, from the programs, from the MWBE programs, um, which has provided us a lot of guidance and, and, and awareness of how to actually utilize the program. Um, so it's, it's helped our company um, grow tremendously in the last year. Right now, around 75% of our, our volume comes from the MTA. It's assisted our growth, and I think it um, had a domino effect on other businesses as well. Um, under our program, we have a lot of subcontract smaller companies that provide the transportation services. So the more volume of trips we, we receive, the more volume of trips we're actually distributing. Um, so it's, it's benefited us and benefit many other um, um, companies that we serve. <clears throat> Being a, a, a company in the Bronx, um, though we service multiple different areas um, throughout New York City, all the boroughs, um, we've been able to extend this, um, this arm to many other small local businesses in the five boroughs. The current contract we're working on right now with the MTA um, in our largest contract is with the Broker Service Paratransit under the Accessory Program for the MTA. Um, this is a three-year with a two-year extension um, um, contract that we were awarded and roughly around, just to round it off, around a $300 million contract. So we're very thankful for the uh, opportunity to work with the MTA. So this is just an example. This contract is the largest MTA contract ever awarded to a certified MWBE. It is the second largest contract in the history of the New York State's MWBE program, which was created by former Governor Mario Cuomo in July of 1998. And so um, this is the kind of work that, that, that we are doing. And this single contract allowed us to diversify our core business of transportation. And so this, this um, page right here, summary shows you that, that the MTA is ranked number one when it comes to dollars paid to a New York State certified MNWBE firms. We, are, we were at $826 million. The second agency is Empire State Development Corporation. They are at $240 million. We are quadruple everyone else. And that $826 million that represented 32.5% MWBE, we exceeded the governor's goal by 2.5%. Next page, please. And so if you look at our capital program, um, the, the amount of dollars that was paid, um, $686 million, almost $700 million, there were 16,000 jobs created in the MW and DBE sector. Next page, please. Um, how do we do it? Better use of technology. Uh, effective monitoring and enforcing of our MWDBE SDVOB goals. Effective integration of newly certified firms in our procurement process. What does that mean? That means that every quarter we bring all of our new certified firms under the guise of a new firm orientation. And our two entry points that we have, capital and non-core, uh, these newly certified firms have the opportunity to learn about uh, the upcoming projects that's coming up in addition to how they can can, can qualify and register to be forwarded um, over opportunities, RFPs and other type of opportunities. Um, we, we also went, went to Albany and we changed state laws. We changed the state law to, to create the MTA Small Business Mentoring Program. We changed uh, a policy which allowed the MTA to have the highest discretionary threshold in the state of New York and of, of the city of New York. That threshold is 1.5 million. And effective partnerships with our third party contractors and consultants. The, the uh, thought here is that any contract that's awarded, the expectation that the MTA has is that we award contracts, 
we basically monitor contracts and we expect those contracts to be finished safely, timely, unbudget, and inclusive of our MWDB goals. It is a partnership. Next page, please. And so um, if you look at the, the number of contracts that we are awarding to our New York State certified firms, these are uh, the largest contracts that, that we awarded um, during the recent quarter. And so on the state funded projects, $118 million contract. Um, on our DB side, a $41 million contract. And so what, what we're, we're doing is that we're showing the, the nation that we have the ability in this complicated infrastructure um, the construction agency that, that, that we reside, that we have the ability to once again finish our contracts and award our contracts in a diverse manner and finish those contracts safely, timely, and unbudget. Next, next page, please. My name is uh, Dwight McLeod. My business is Capstone Strategy Group. We are a technology consulting firm. We work specifically in the space of process improvement, helping, helping agencies, helping different groups get more efficient with how they do things. We've worked on both prime contracts, where we're the prime supplier of, of people. That, that's a contract where we're supplying them with technology resources to work on some of the projects that they're working on inside, like their help desk and different things of that nature. We've also worked as a subcontractor with another organization where we will be doing five years of maintenance support on a system that was built by them. So most of the maintenance, which means when something breaks down or when they need to add something to it, whatever, as long as it's not contractually bound to be renegotiated, we'll come in and do that kind of work for them with the team that we've put together. When I first started with Mike and the team, Mike had just come over from School Construction Authority, and we started on a small project up in Harlem, and we were a very small company. And since then, we've grown exponentially. So working with Mike and his team, where they kind of put a, a grounding underneath you and help lift you up and, and really teach you the ropes of what it means to work with a large organization to be accountable, to be responsible, and to be a good you know, vendor for what they need. I would say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 percent. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with outside forces, but the things that keep us whole and keep us going typically come from MTA. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we do what, what we do for the MTA with uh, Do It. We do it with ACS, we do it with other folks where we'll bring them in individuals to do some of the work that they don't have the staff appropriately trained to do. So we do staff augmentation with universities, we do it with other folks, and that all started with the MTA giving us the ability to do that. I believe that without Mike's leadership that a lot of this would not have happened. Mike just doesn't lead the charge in this. This is something that he's very passionate about. And, and what he does is he's able to get the leadership that he reports to to buy into the concept so that they walk the talk. They don't just talk the talk. So, yes, I think the program has been very good for so many of us. As in Capstone is, is an example from our uh, discretionary program. We, we went out with an RFP. We secured the services of 29 information technology companies. Um, all 29 firms have gotten assignments. Uh, the most recent metrics is that there's been o over 900 assignments for $171 million. So we're taking uh, the uh, discretionary threshold um, of $1.5 million, and we are um, having a great success, especially in the area of information technology. And so, um, once again, we went to uh, the state and we changed, a, a, uh, we changed the New York State finance law and we created the Small Business Mentoring Program. And so uh, since the program is inception, there's been 560 contracts awarded, totaling 587.5 million. This is given the MWDBE contractors, subcontractors, a chance to work directly for North America's largest transportation network, the MTA, as prime contractors. Next page, please. I was uh, raised like many kids in Dominican Republic, wanting to be a baseball player. But my family was very strict on studying. They always encouraged me to 
uh, to follow my dreams. And one of my dreams was to come here to the United States and be successful here. After a few years in the private sector, I joined the Small Business Mentoring Program. And that's how the growing of my company really started. It just exploded. The Small Business Mentoring Program changed the trajectory of a painting company and develop that painting company into a general contractor. Now I can bid the projects that I want. I can bid the projects that have the size that I want. It changed the entire structure of the business. This is a Limbro station. This project came out of the need of the community to have a renovated station, and I just happen to be part of that community. My office is one block away, and I am very proud of being part of the team that developed and deliver this project to the community. The Limbra station consists on installation of new canopies. It was painted completely. The platform was renovated. Just beautiful, the lighting system that was installed here. And we also installed a new waiting room with new benches, new AC system, even charging stations for cell phones. So we have work in over 20 projects for the MTA, from $200,000 to $20 million. We work on the rehabilitation of Broadway Junction, that was about $5 million project. We work in a Sandy project, rehabilitating a bus depot, the Far Rockaway bus depot to be exact, that was more than $7 million project. As a small business owned by minorities or women, we face many challenges. The Small Business Mentoring Program had a solution to all of them. Lacking of funding, the mentoring program partnered up with a bank that were funding us. The projects are too big for us to undertake. The mentoring program broke down those projects into a smaller projects so we can bid on them. That's what the MTA Small Business Mentoring Program have done for me, and it can do for you too. It is a program that has been tailor-made for us. It's just a decision, it's up to you to come and join the Small Business Development Program. So, so this is an example of what the MTA Small Business Mentoring Program is doing. Uh, when, when, when we first uh, started with this company, they had four employees, $245,000 uh, in annual sales. They are now up to 25 employees and $25 um, million in sales. So this program is allowing us to create a larger pool of diverse, diverse contractors who can finish our projects safely, timely, and on budget. Next page, please. Also, we are, we, are, we are going out and, and we're meeting companies. So l last fiscal year, we, we met 1,472 companies at our outreach events. Of those companies, we, we helped uh, get certified 672 firms, and those 672 firms were recipients of $374 million in both prime contracts and subcontract awards. Next page, please. And, and in our quest to um, go out and recruit a larger pool of MWDBE firms to keep track of our massive $54.8 billion capital plan, we have, we have uh, signed an agreement with ESD. Uh, we are retooling it. And so to, to date, we submitted 82 firms. 12 firms have been certified, and, and we're working in tandem with ESD to make sure that those numbers are going to increase. Next page, please. We, we hosted the region's first regional disadvantaged business enterprise day, better known as DBEs. We were in Washington and we spoke at a roundtable um, conference in Washington that was hosted by, by Congressman Payne from New Jersey, who is chair of infrastructure. And we, we meaning the, the Port Authority and the MTA, and all of the regional um, USDOT funding recipients, we had an opportunity date here, which was more than 231 individuals. Next page, please. And, and we talked about the more than $100 billion in opportunities that's going to be available for DB firms in this region. If you look at the Port Authorities and the MTA's budget, that's $86 billion in two agencies. As, a, as I indicated, that, that we have the ability to host Congressman uh, Payne 
I'm also Shelby Scales, who runs the DBE program for the US DOT secretary was here. We had a private meeting with her. They are taking a lot of our best practices and programming with a quest of expanding those, those, um, those programs nationally. So it is great when a recipient influences uh, uh, the, the, the uh, government and US DOT in some of the programs that, that we have success, successfully created here at the MTA. What's next? We, we will continue our MWDB dominance. We, we, we will continue recruiting additional MWDB firms to keep pace with our massive uh, uh, $54.8 billion capital plan. And we will work in tandem to secure more funding for the MTA because the more funding we have, that means the more opportunities we have for MWDBs. Dr. Green, take it away. Actually, before we do that, on MW, MBE and WBEs and SDVOBs. Do any of our board members have any questions? I do want to remind our board members that in the board book is a lot more granular detail on the uh, MWBE and SDVOB and DBE program. Frankie, did you have a question? Well, congratulations on the work done. Is there a specific uh, segment that you would like to concentrate uh, specifically for um, the next year? Yes, so, so once again, we need to recruit more MWDB firms uh, to support our, our capital program. And we're, we're looking for all sectors to assist us in operating a 24-7, uh, 365 uh, system. And so we, we would be more than happy to, to work with your organization and other organizations in, um, in a quest to, uh, in fact, recruit more MWDBs. Michael, I'll ask if you could please um, supply this presentation deck to the members of our committee because it's phenomenal uh, in context of the state. Yes, Board Member Ringman. Yes, <clears throat> when you mentioned ESD, is that Empire State Development? Yes, it is. Okay, just wanted to be sure. Thank you. Dr. Green. Good afternoon. As of September 30th, 2022, the MTA workforce consisted of 71,113 employees. These jobs provide economic stability for many communities throughout the New York region. Why is this important? Hmm. Well, entry level jobs provide a pathway to the middle class for individuals from racial and ethnically diverse communities. The MTA offers entry-level jobs with real growth potential. Although these jobs require minimum education and experience, they are the foundation for career and upward mobility. And the MTA's equal opportunity policies help ensure that these opportunities are available to everyone. Next slide, please. These are a couple of examples. Now, when we started looking for examples to share with the board, there were hundreds of examples. But these are a few examples from across all agencies of MTA employees that started out at entry-level positions and moved up and progressed to mid-level management, senior management, and executive-level management positions. I'm going to um, pass it over to Hugo to talk about some of the hiring challenges that we've faced in 2022. Thank you. Good afternoon and happy holidays. Uh, following the COVID uh, hiring crisis, the MTA really focused on a number of roles. Uh, the ones I'm going to highlight today are specifically uh, uh, operators and conductors, as well as setting up uh, or standing up the uh, staff for Grand Central Madison. Uh, next slide, please. A lot of this couldn't have been done without the um, remarkable teams, uh, the hiring teams, hiring managers that uh, did all the work to uh, fulfill uh, all of the needs or many of the needs. So as you can see from this slide, the MTA developed an aggressive plan to address the shortages 
Uh, you can see some of them listed here, not only for bus operators and train operators and conductors, um, but there was a lot of communication and advertising that went into this work. And you can see the results. Uh, over 2,500 bus operators hired, uh, 774 uh, train operators, and almost 740 uh, conductors. So a lot of work by a lot of people. Next slide, please. And you can see from this chart uh, the breakdown of the uh, population, the number of hires. Um, of the over 4,000 uh, new hires, 28% um, uh, were uh, females and 92% uh, uh, were uh, members of a minority group. Uh, so really, really good numbers um, based on the total number of hires. Next slide, please. Um, then we move to Grand Central Madison. Um, a lot of uh, challenges here. Uh, the pool for uh, talent in the industry or in the uh, workforce, uh, as we know, was uh, very difficult uh, coming off of uh, COVID, uh, as well as some stiff competition in, in the market. Um, so again, a lot of creative approaches, some advertising, uh, some large testing events, uh, and a number of other activities to try to um, uh, hire uh, the needed uh, staff. And as you can see from the slide, uh, 762 um, new hires uh, were hired as part of the Grand Central Madison uh, opening. Next slide, please. And here are the stats uh, for, bo for both uh, groups. So out of the 762 new hires, 13% uh, um, were female, and about 50% were representatives of uh, minority groups. Uh, so again, a lot of hard work uh, and good results from a lot of people. Hi, I have a question. Hi, this is Midori. Um, can we go back to, to another slide, maybe two slides ago for bus operators? Um, yes, this slide. Thank you so much. Obviously, a lot had to a lot of good partnership between HR, and it you know it sounds like the um, your office, Michael and Dr. Green. So what I'm seeing here is I have females accounted for 28 percent of the hiring. So definitely you know a good a good perspective given that I believe it's 19 to 20 percent female at the MTA. So that's higher than our, you know, our amount that we tend to see. But what we also tend to see is that um, women, because of either the COVID pandemic, um, issues related to, you know, flexibility of the job, that it's difficult for the MTA to keep women at the MTA. So I am curious as to the strategies related to ensuring that we keep um, these new hires, as we know, the transactional cost of recruitment is very high. Um, and I know that for myself as a, as a senior member of a nonprofit organization here in New York City. So I'm curious, the 28% female and the 13% female for the Long Island Railroad hiring, which is I think lower than what we would expect, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, we'd love to hear what are the strategies that you're looking at for retention? Uh, we're going to tag team this question, but the first thing I'll say is um, we are looking at implementing um, what we call stay interviews, where we're going to um, speak to new hires 30, 60, 90 days um, from hire to find out what some of the challenges are, what supports we could provide, and really try to um, make the uh, experience working at the MTA uh, that much better. Dr. Green? Thank you. Uh, some of the other strategies that we will be uh, embarking on is the exit interview hire. I mean, the exit interviews. We will also be looking to gain more information from employees as to what it would have taken for to keep them here at the MTA. We've also been uh, partnering with uh, talent acquisition and the people department in trying to find additional 
uh, training and development programs so that we can, again, as we saw those fantastic pictures in the other slide, how people where they feel like they this is a career path for them so that there is per career progression and we give the training and the tools to set them on the right path to progress throughout the MTA. We've also, as you uh, have probably heard before, we have some separate task force available that have been looking at telework. So we had that as a, a, tem uh, a pilot option right now, the, the telework program, so that we can have more flexibility. Now, while telework is not going to be an option for every position at the MTA, we are looking for those opportunities where we can remain flexible and competitive and make sure that we become the employer of choice for the mm -hmm. employees that we have here and future applicants. And um, Rose, so appreciate that. And thank you, Hugo, as well. I think the stay interviews are excellent. In the exit interviews, will you make um, specific questions that are more targeted given that I think the MTA has had a longstanding um, concern about retention of women in the workforce? Absolutely. Okay, great. And then I just wanted to understand, so obviously telework, probably um, irrelevant to this, this slide, right? Bus operators, train operators, conductors. I'm interested in sick leave as a person who's, you know, struggling with the triple pandemic that is happening right now and childcare duties is there is sick leave for MTA employees, specifically of field personnel, specifically related to um, if they themselves are sick or is sick leave also extended to family members who are sick? I just wanted to understand that more. There are several options for sick leave. So you can have sick leave that's related to yourself and you can have sick leave that would be available to you as a result of a family member being sick. Okay, great, thank you. Mike, would you have like a 10 minute presentation of all that the MTA does for diversity? You know, I, everybody knows we're at this fiscal cliff and we're going to be going with our hat in our hand to funding partners. I don't think the average elected official realizes how much we do for diversity at the MTA. I don't, I don't think there's anybody anywhere that does what we do for diversity at the MTA. And I think that would go a long way. Uh, you know, we're going to Albany or we're going to Washington for funding to, to let them know exactly what you But you need to have like a, a really crisp 10-minute, yes. you don't want to them those and offer anything but if you hit some of these highlights i think it'd be very important you know when we go to look for some money that's a, that's that's a, a great great thought and and we will create something um more condensed and um i will be going to albany uh with will swartz and uh we will go and talk to some of our elected officials about the more funding we have the more we can do with respect to our MW, DBE, and SDVLB firms. But your, your, your point is well taken with creating a more condensed presentation. Thank you. So the next slide, we'll be talking about what's next for 2023. So in 2023, we're gonna have a busy year. We have three of our federal programs that are going to need to be updated. Our federal programs are those that are sent to the FTA and they require FTA approval. And they're typically three to four years that we have to, um, we have the program in place and then we update the program again. So those programs are gonna be the Equal Employment Opportunity Program, which is a all agency equal opportunity program, but it also have an agency specific equal opportunity programs as well. So we have goals that are agency specific and we have the all agency goals. Those are, uh, primarily dealing with our applicants and employees. Uh, then we'll have the uh, all agency Title VI program that's also uh, up for um, uh, submission and approval to FTA. The, F the Title VI program is everything, um, uh, access and equal opportunity uh, that pertains to our services, our service area and our customers. So while the equal opportunity program is, is is focused on employees. 
the Title VI program is focused on our communities, our service, and our customers. And then we'll also have our Disadvantaged Business Enterprise program that will need to be updated and new, new goals established. Uh, as for the state programs, uh, we will be developing our first five-year uh, diversity and inclusion strategic plan, and we'll be submitting that to the state in uh, July 2023. And then we'll also have our annual goal setting for our MWBE and our SDVOB program that will be based on the agency's proposed budget for the next state fiscal year. After we um, determine what our goals are in our Equal Employment Opportunity Program, we will be developing targeted uh, strategies to address any areas of underutilization that may, be, uh, that may come about. Next slide, please. This is yours, Eager. Excuse me. Some uh, robust uh, planning that we'll do for uh, 2023 as it relates to recruitment strategies. So continuing to participate in events um, in uh, diverse uh, ethnic communities, um, like the event in Harlem called Harlem Week. Uh, continue to partner with um, uh, the Department of Labor and other participating in other career events. Uh, another area of focus is really uh, more activity around uh, recruiting veterans. Um, partnering with the New York City Department of Veteran Services um, and really looking at uh, career events uh, throughout different uh, military installations. Um, more participation in uh, women's organizations, uh, for example, the Women, women Builders Council, as well as Forte, which is a uh, professional women's organization. Um, and then a lot more focus on working with our local colleges and universities. There is a, a fantastic um, program with CUNY uh, that has uh, uh, 100 or so interns uh, around the MTA, so going to continue to look to build um, that program, as well as uh, some on-campus recruitment events um, throughout New York. That will end our presentation. Any questions? Yes. No, just one comment. I think it's fa fantastic that you're looking towards veterans uh, for, for next year. They usually don't get considered when you start talking about diversity and equity and stuff like that, they kind of like fall by the wayside. And I just want to think that's great. And that's it. <laughs> um, if I may, just to echo on that, I, I feel like actually the MTA has been um, pretty um, on the forefront of focusing on veterans. Um, so always appreciative of the MTA to kind of lead that way. Michael, obviously you guys got a lot done this year. Um, it's super impressive to see and just echoing the other commissioners um, remarks around how we work to package this um, when it comes to the amount of jobs that, you know, you're helping to build the amount of um, small businesses that you're helping to support. I think I think that'll be really critical as we look to, you know, your discussions with folks in Albany. Thank you, Midori. And, and just because we have such a full agenda, I think, moving into 2023, both on the uh, EEO side as well as on the procurement side, um, I think we've talked before about perhaps making this diversity committee meet more regularly than, than once a quarter, especially as we move towards the 2023 dates, the strategic plan, the Title VI issues, and then as we uh, approach our capital plan and the infrastructure dollars that are coming in and the requirements that are going to come with that with regard to procurement and workforce. Um, I'm going to encourage uh, the MTA to have us meet this diversity committee on a more regular basis to discuss this as it comes around. Mike? You know, and, and, I'm, and I thank you for, for, for your support of this, this diversity committee. But let me also say that you just don't build a program like this in a silo. It takes a lot of stakeholders. And I just wanted to personally thank Chairman uh, Jan Lieber for his support and in, in, um, in support for us and more staffing and more resources. Um, the, 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 like the board of the MTA board uh, should be committed for, for their support also as well. Jamie Torres and C&D, 
uh, we, we have an effective partnership where we are showing, once again, the nation how we can build inclusively, how we can finish our projects safely, timely, on budget, and inclusive of our MWBE goals. And Jamie's staff, um, Evan Island and, and Steve Pachaki, who's been my partner, we've, we've been bound by the hips, and we, we have done some great, fantastic work together. And Kavesh and his, and, his, and, his, and his HQ's team, including uh, Christine Norman, let me also say um, Chris Bennett, Melissa Jones at CND has been great partners. Uh, we, we talk about DDCR. It's the best team anywhere. Uh, they work nights, weekends, holidays. We were on, on email yesterday on Sunday afternoon honing this presentation on a Sunday. But, but that's, that's what it takes to get the job done. Um, Ray Burke and um, George Cleary. Um, they work hard every day in, in driving uh, these programs. And let me just t talk about tra uh, trans transformational leaders, those leaders who don't accept no for an answer, and that's Dr. Green. She comes to the table with a focus on solutions, and she's not blinded by problems. Um, and, and, and I mentioned Christine Norman also as well, but and then last but not least is Tracy Mitchell who is out on the construction sites driving MWDBE change, and Mark Roach and his team also as well. We, we, we are partners. This organization has created one, if not the most effective MWDBE program in the nation, and I just wanted to simply say thank you. Thank you, Mike. You have a great team, uh, um, and leadership comes from the top, and it's all the way on top here at the end, the MTA. Unless there's any other matters, any other comments, uh, I'd like to s uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Second, you got the second. <laughs> okay, this meeting is adjourned. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Wonderful season.
Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it falls to me to call the December Capital Program Committee meeting to order. Do we have members of the public, Ms. King, who would like to provide comments? Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Today we have a total of five members of the public registered to speak. We have three in person and two remote. As a reminder- Are any of them pre-recorded? No? Okay, go ahead. Please go ahead. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. The first speaker will be Jason Anthony, followed by Lisa Daglian. Hey, General. Hey, Jamie. Uh, good catch on that one. That was in the diversity committee, by the way. Uh, I was at Penn Station last night. It's looking marvelous. Especially on the east side, in the east side concourse. It's looking gorgeous. But... We need to unclutter the crowding that is there because you, we could utilize the central concourse. But we should, um, what about our subway stations that look abandoned? About, let's mention the Chamber Street along the J and Z, 6th Avenue on the L, among others, that need some attention, Jamie. And even though that Penn Station is long overdue, but these subway stations are Guys, hello. Thank you. We know that Penn Station is a tourist attraction, but these subway stations need attention too, Jamie. This is why 2023, we should put it in our list. This is why Chamber Street, among others, should be done as part of a subway redesign. This is why... I commend you guys to do a redesign of the subway system. I'll see you guys in finance. Have a good luck. Thank you for your comments. Now we'll have Lisa Daglian. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Lisa Daglian. I'm the Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA PCAC. This month, again, you'll be referring $2.5 billion in projects to the board for approval. Importantly, these include resiliency work, Park Avenue viaduct construction, and new elevators and maintenance contracts. We're glad to see these go hand in hand so that these important accessibility features can reliably get all riders where they need to go and hope that maintenance will be part of all accessibility upgrades from private developers, including zoning for accessibility improvements. As you work toward the goal of 95% access 95 accessibility by 2050, if not sooner, we know that Metz Willits Point will be top of mind for both the Long Island Railroad and Seven Line stations. We look forward to working with you to find funding for that important project, particularly in light of the new planned Willits Point development. As we've said before, a UBS Elmont style funding arrangement with 90% private financing and 10% from the state is a great model. The number of projects being moved through the process is indicative of the system's needs. Riders will benefit from the improvements. The committee book says that in 2022, the MTA plans to commit nearly $8.1 billion worth of capital projects. That's impressive. The dollar figures are again testament to the need for congestion pricing as reliable funding stream for the capital program. We'll ho we're hopeful that bundling projects and streamlining the process will hold down costs and speed up delivery, and that next year we'll see more green and less red, as festive as that may be. We continue to urge the federal government to return a finding of no significant impact, a FONSI, 
USA as expeditiously as possible to ensure we see many more $2 billion days and improvements for all riders. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you for your comments. Now we'll have Alita Dupree followed by Christopher Greif. Um, thanks again, uh, Chair Jano Lieber. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, my pronouns are she and her. It's good to be back as I talk about capital. Uh, again, thank you for doing reduced fare on Omni and Omni is part of capital and uh, we should have our uh, schematics and drawings of how it will work on the railroads. That will help a lot of people. I still have trouble picturing how you do Omni on 67 tracks of Grand Central Terminal. And uh, I hope that we will get the Grand Central Madison open soon. Uh, so, so, so I could use it and enjoy it. And uh, it's a very different architecture, but uh, I certainly would say that it qualifies as being stately and holds a legendary ideal. So I, I wanna participate in that. And as I said before, ADA is essential. We should aspire to completing our ADA work way before 32 years that is planned uh, because there are many who cannot climb stairs. And sometimes I, I'm, I'm having a rough day. So I did climb some stairs in BART and I made it, but um, we just got to stay ahead of that. And um, how do we get our, our systems, our buses and our our trains all powered by renewable energy. How can we get to the point of buying hundreds of these uh, battery powered buses and become our own power company? Uh, because I don't know how well we can depend on others to deliver us the energy that we need uh, because we're still producing lots of emissions. And um, this BART in my background, perhaps some of you have gotten to see it, is virtually emission free pretty close, so we, we can do that too. So I hope to be back on the system soon uh, because it's something I enjoy. It's legendary and stately. I wanna be back and I'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Our next and speaker is Christopher Greif. And good afternoon, everyone. Christopher Greif, hope everyone's doing well. I'd uh, like to remind one thing, and I definitely agree with the other speaker earlier. Mets Willis Point needs accessibility because if Yankee Stadium for Metro North and the subways have one, we need one for the Mets Willis Point for Long Island Railroad and the subways. Because it is important some people can travel now to getting to the Mets game, but it's really hard because for them, they have to go all the way to mainstream flushing, doesn't matter if it's Long Island Railroad or the 7, and pray to get on a Q48 bus, which if it ever shows up, uh, to get to Mets Willis Point. Now with the redesign, thank God. But today I'm here to also remind that the capital is very important as you are getting ready to build a lot of stuff with customer service stuff. Please make sure that some of this stuff is truly ADA accessible because remember, we, I may be standing, but a wheelchair could be sitting or lower wheelchairs. We need to remind them that we need to have easier access. And since they're all going to be building a couple of, in Brooklyn, Stowell Avenue, you've got plenty of room. Atlantic, I'm going to be really shocked saying where are we going to fit it in Atlantic? And especially if it's going to be in the Long Island area, we have to make sure where, if it's more visible. So please let's make sure everything is truly ADA accessible and let's keep the spirit keep going forward. Everyone, happy and healthy holiday to everyone. Thank you again. Thank you for your comments. Our final speaker is Matthew Pfizer. Hello, I'm Matthew Pfizer and I'm speaking about uh, having Penn Station access to connect to uh, then and W lines connecting to the LaGuardia Airport because right now it will take takes a long time for people on the New Haven line to get to LaGuardia like an hour and a half and this would cut it down to an hour in ten minutes making it more feasible for people to go to LaGuardia instead of taking their cars. 
and this I'm happy that we're getting to work on the Penn Station access and hope to have a better future for rail for future to come. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, that concludes the public comment session. Thank you, Liz. Uh, copies of the November Capital Program Committee report minutes, uh, Capital Program Committee minutes have been distributed and are available on the website. Changes or comments on the minutes? Going once. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Uh, the minutes are approved. Michael, are there any changes to the work plan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, there is one change to the work plan. Um, for this month, the capital security uh, program that was uh, originally scheduled for this month will instead be taken up in January. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me turn it over to Jamie Torres Springer for the President's report. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. December's uh, been an extremely busy month for MTA construction and development as we hit major milestones on projects across our portfolio. You can see pictured here, and I'm grateful to the last uh, member of the public commenting about the importance of Metro North Penn Station access. We had the groundbreaking event for that amazing project uh, within the last couple of weeks, and thanks to the leadership of Governor Hochul, Senator Schumer, and many others, Penn Access will deliver those massive benefits to riders in the East Bronx through the creation of four stations and the uh, incredible improvements to the commute for folks in the East Bronx and, and to the North. Uh, it's not just about our mega projects. We also celebrated the opening of the Clifton Maintenance Shop serving the Staten Island Railway. This is a cutting edge facility that we were able to rebuild with the assistance of uh, Sandy Resiliency funding from the federal government, and uh, it's a cutting-edge facility. It's going to make sure that we can do the work for the Staten Island Railway maintenance uh, on Staten Island rather than having to, to move trains uh, over to Brooklyn if an AC unit goes out. Um, and we're, uh, we're very grateful again uh, to the federal government for support on that important package of resiliency projects that we're undertaking. And as we approach the end of the year, we're also advancing commitments for our historic capital program. Last month, the board approved nearly $2 billion in design build contracts. This month, uh, we're submitting for your approval more than $2.5 billion worth of design build contracts. And along with additional awards that we're making before the end of the year, um, we expect this to be a historic commitment year demonstrating just how effective uh, MTA construction and development is at prioritizing capital improvements to this uh, system to keep it in a state of good repair. I want to acknowledge, I can't acknowledge them enough, but um, particularly the, the, uh, the procurement uh, department of C&D led by Evan Iceland and David Cannon who are here, um, but really working in tandem with Tim Mulligan in the development group, Mark Roche uh, running our delivery group. <clears throat> Everyone comes together. It's our procurement folks in particular who are strained over these last few weeks, um, and uh, but really delivering uh, what we said we were going to deliver this year. Uh, before I highlight some of the projects, I want to just say it's it's all it's not just about the projects; it's about how we're delivering the projects. And so I'm very excited that building on years of community engagement, we're piloting our first ever local hiring goals in three of the projects that we're bringing to the board this month. We have for those projects a local hiring goal of 20% of the New York State labor force coming from the communities in which the project is based. This is both a policy change that we made for our locally funded projects and also was spurred by some rule changes that the Biden administration has made to encourage local hiring. So it's similar to the great success that we've had in the MWBE field, which you've, you've heard about uh, in the prior committee meeting. We're excited to put equity first as we advance these projects to make sure that local communities are benefiting from every aspect of construction delivery. Some of the projects I want to highlight this month, uh, another round of ADA station upgrades with four more stations being made ADA accessible under the contract that will be issued today. Uh, you can see those new stations uh, have uh, yellow dots in the, the map that we're showing um, today. This is among our local hiring projects with residents who live near the stations being prioritized for jobs constructing the upgrades. With these stations added, it brings us to commitments for 13 newly accessible ADA stations in 2022. 
This is a new standard. Uh, we'll be maintaining and even ramping up further as we implement the commitment to make 95% of stations accessible by 2055. I'm going to move on because I see Board Member Albert looking carefully at the map I want before <laughs> before he notices we, we've we've got anything wrong here. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I'll go, I'm just kidding. I'll, I'll go. I'll go back. Um, uh, because we're also awarding a contract this month uh, to replace 19 elevators at nine stations. So not just making stations newly ADA accessible, but maintaining that accessibility across the system is really critical for our program. Also advancing the reconstruction of a new Jamaica bus depot. The new, new depot will improve bus operations, but also it will be the first uh, zero emissions bus facility, fully uh, equipped zero emissions bus facility. Um, it's very exciting that we're able to do that, particularly in a community that has, um, you know, as, as, uh, as the state senator often points out, has felt the impacts of climate change in significant ways um, and of emissions locally. So very exciting. And also uh, a local hiring requirement pilot project, as I mentioned. So bringing jobs to, uh, to that portion of Queens. The scope of this project carefully takes into account impacts on the local community with sound barrier walls to shield residents from noise from depot operations, new trees planted around the facility, quality lighting, an art mural wall installed along Merrick Boulevard as part of a restored sidewalk. So really bringing benefits to the local community from that project. And speaking of bringing benefits to the local community, we'll award a bundle of resiliency and rehabilitation projects on the Rockaway A line in Queens. These projects build on previous investments to make the A-Line more resilient after it was one of the hardest hit, hit parts of the system during Superstorm Sandy. It's the third of our local hiring project, again, bringing local hiring benefits to this portion of Queens. And I'm particularly proud. The, these are huge investments. They're critical um, to the future of uh, subway service to the Rockaways and uh, our team, particularly our, our development team. But again, our, the, all of the, the departments uh, of our agency worked very hard to figure out how we could bring together a disparate group of projects here and take advantage of the outages that we'll need in order to build this, but to get all the work done that we need to get done. So it's a, it's a very innovative approach that we're taking uh, on the Rockaways. We're also awarding the contract to modernize the signals on the Crosstown line, the G, between uh, Court Square in Queens and all the way to Church Avenue in Brooklyn, where it will meet up with the improvements we're making on the Culver line. Last month, you heard me present on our new approach to CBTC delivery. This project will be the first that implements those principles uh, with simpler specs and new milestones in place that treat this as the technology project that it is. We're continuing to build on uh, the CBTC program. For the railroads this month, we're advancing a different kind of mega project, the Park Avenue Viaduct. More than 98% of Metro North trains traverse the viaduct as they enter Manhattan toward Grand Central. It's more than 100 years old in parts, and it needs replacement to ensure we can continue safe and reliable service for another 100 years. Rebuilding our infrastructure may not be as flashy as opening new lines, but it's every bit as important. And again, uh, just as important is how we're doing it. We'll have more uh, information on this this week before the board, but we've reached a historic agreement with our partners in labor to deliver this project with enhanced efficiencies and labor benefits. With that, I want to introduce our Bridges and Tunnels business unit for their presentation to the committee. As you'll hear today, B&T is yet again meeting their goals and then some. They are keeping our aging but critical bridge and tunnel infrastructure in a state of good repair, um, providing new benefits for all bridge users as well, including pedestrians and bicyclists, who as a result of the awards we're recommending to the board this month, will see ADA-compliant bike and ped ramps added or improved on the Randalls Island bridges, the Cross Bay, and the Henry Hudson. These were three spans that were featured in the draft bike and pedestrian access plan that was presented to the board recently, and we're fulfilling those commitments uh, with contracts this month. Uh, unfortunately, Joe Keene, who leads the biz business unit, is out today, so I'll turn it over to Deputy Business Unit Lead Aris Stathopoulos uh, for his presentation before hearing from the IEC. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good afternoon. I am Aris Stathopoulos, Vice President and Deputy BNT Business Unit Leader, and I will be presenting an update on BNT's capital program on behalf of Joe Keene. First, a quick overview of the BNT business unit. Shown here are seven major vehicular bridges and two vehicular tunnels, which are owned and operated by MTA Bridges and Tunnels, 
and are vital transportation links between the five boroughs of New York City, on average serving more than 900,000 vehicles daily or approximately 325 million vehicles annually, more traffic than any bridge and tunnel authority in the nation. We are responsible for ensuring the structural integrity of these facilities, which range in age from 52 to 86 years. As they continue to age, a robust capital program with high levels of investment is required to ensure they remain in a state of good repair. BNT's 2020 to 2024 core capital program is 2.8 billion. BNT's capital program addresses the state of good repair and safety needs of our aging infrastructure, while at the same time integrating this critical work together with resiliency, regional interoperability, and accessibility improvements to maximize efficiency and minimize impacts to our customers. We are proud of our 2022 performance as shown here with our commitments and completions. Our planned commitments for 2022 are 512 million. We have received proposals for all of our remaining 2022 commitments and we anticipate in coming close to achieving our goal. Regarding completions, we, we will exceed our goal by approximately 60% with over 900 million in completions. Listed here are three of our most significant completions, which are highlighted in the following short video. In 2022, the Bridges and Tunnels Business Unit completed 16 projects worth close to $900 million to keep our bridges and tunnels in a state of good repair. Thanks to strong project management and innovative construction methods, these projects were completed on or ahead of schedule while minimizing impacts to customers. Here are three project highlights. At the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, we completed a $222 million project to reconstruct critical components including the upper level approach decks, the Lily Pond Avenue exit ramp, and strengthening of the anchorage spans. The decks of the upper level approach spans, which were original from 1964, had provided over 50 years of service. This project has replaced these decks with a new design that extends their useful life by 75 years. The new decks have improved load carrying capacity and seismic resiliency. As part of the project, steel support beams were replaced and strengthened. This was very challenging work, requiring the lower levels to be closed at night to facilitate the segmental installation of the new steel. At the RFK Bridge, we completed a $96 million project to perform structural upgrades and steel repairs to keep it in a state of good repair. Much of the work focused on strengthening existing steel members and connections to improve live load capacity and seismic performance. Once steel repairs were complete, the structures were painted with a three-coat paint system. B&T's high-performance three-coat paint system provides corrosion protection for up to 30 years. In addition, concrete repair and structural waterproofing was performed at the main span anchorages. This project successfully bundled together several different work items to achieve cost efficiencies and minimize impact on bridge customers. And later this month, we'll complete a $336 million set of roadway and safety upgrades to the Throgs Neck Bridge. This includes a new, lighter, more durable deck on the suspended spans with a waterproofing system, new median and side barriers, and a new fire standpipe system. To minimize impacts to our customers, a new steel roadway deck was fabricated off-site and installed on the bridge in six construction stages. The deck installation was performed at night using a system of gantry cranes. Welding and bolting up of the new deck followed during daytime work shifts. To facilitate the stage construction without impacting rush hour traffic, a movable barrier system was used 
which maintained three lanes of traffic in the peak direction. Next, I will discuss projects that integrate state of good repair work with significant accessibility improvements. Some of these projects are ongoing while some are planned for the near future. The RFK bridge connects the Bronx, Queens, and Manhattan to each other as well as to Randall's Island. The orange circles indicate the locations where we are implementing significant accessibility improvements as part of two ongoing state of good repair projects. The photo on the upper right shows the RFK suspended span and is the location of a notable upcoming state of good repair and wind resiliency project, which also includes significant accessibility improvements along the area highlighted in orange. These projects, once completed, will improve interborough bike and pedestrian connectivity. Here's a view of the Harlem River lift span at the RFK. This project is replacing the tower fenders and building a new ADA compliant bike and pedestrian ramp to connect Randalls Island Park to the future New York City EDC Greenway in East Harlem. This project is an example of efficient bundling and is approximately 30% complete. The new ramp is scheduled to be completed by July of 2023 with the overall project on schedule for completion in December of 2023. The project remains within budget. On the Randalls Island side of the RFK, this second design build project will construct two new vehicular ramps and three new ADA compliant bike ped paths. Shown here are renderings for the bike ped paths which connect Randalls Island Park to the Harlem River lift span and Manhattan. Reconstruction of these ramps will facilitate the future reconstruction of the Manhattan Plaza structure in a subsequent capital plan. In addition, not shown here, another new bike ped path will also be constructed connecting Randalls Island Park to the Bronx span. This project will be awarded later this month and once completed in 2025 will transform access to and from Randalls Island Park, providing end-to-end -end ADA connectivity between Randalls Island, Manhattan, and the Bronx. These improvements will benefit thousands of people during special events on Randalls Island, as well as hundreds of everyday park users. The third and most consequential project at the RFK is a design-build project, which is a comprehensive, integrated rehabilitation of the RFK suspended spans. This project includes structural upgrades to improve load capacity and wind performance, while at the same time improving bicycle and pedestrian access between Queens and Randalls Island. This bundling approach maximizes efficiencies and minimizes overall customer impacts. The project also includes dehum dehumidification of the suspended span main cables to preserve their long-term strength. Shown on the right, is a rendering of the new ADA compliant bike ped path. As part of the accessibility improvements, all existing stairs will be eliminated and replaced by ADA compliant ramps. This project is planned for award in 2024 and will be completed in 2028. Once completed, the new ADA compliant bike ped path will transform access from Queens to Randalls Island Park. Next, a recently awarded project at the Rockaways. This design-build project at the Cross Bay Bridge will rehabilitate the navigation spans and strengthen the bridge to meet modern truckloads. The project also includes the construction of a new ADA-compliant bike ped ramp on the south end of the bridge. This ramp will tie into the existing sidewalk, which was recently improved with signage and striping as shown on the right. Design is ongoing and the project is expected to be, to be complete in November of 2024. Once complete, there will be an ADA compliant ped, bike ped path across the entire bridge connecting Broad Channel to Rockaway Beach. And finally, we have work planned for the Henry Hudson Bridge connect, connecting Spite and Dival to Inwood Hill Park at the northern end of Manhattan. Here, we will widen the lower level sidewalk and construct ADA compliant connections at both ends of the bridge. To minimize impacts to customers, 
This work has been bundled with structural rehabilitation at the north end of the bridge. This project is planned for award in 2023 and we will be completed in late 2024. Once complete, there will be an ADA compliant bike ped path across the entire bridge. This concludes my presentation. Following comments from the IEC, I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Harris. Uh, Mr. DeVito of the IEC, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. The IEC report on the Throgs Neck Bridge orthotropic deck replacement begins on page 18 of your books. Overall, this project is 90% complete and well under budget with an estimated completion now forecast to be $300 million. The IEC analysis finds that contributing to the favorable project cost are underruns in material, unexpended contingencies and reserves, as well as scope credits. Regarding schedule, the six-stage deck replacement work exceeded its planned duration. However, effective project management actions mitigated all but one month of this delay, which remained, <clears throat> and is now forecasting substantial completion to occur this month. Sorry. It's the IEC's opinion that due to the number of concurrent activities which remain, meeting this date will be challenging, but with sufficient contractor resources is achievable. The project team has also minimized potential customer impact of extended lane closures through its hands-on management of the contractor and its work. Regarding risk, at this point in the project, most schedule risks have been mitigated effectively or have not been realized and are closed. Inclement weather is the only significant risk remaining on this project. And this concludes the ISU's report on the Throx Neck Bridge deck replacement. Mr. Chairman. Any other topics you want to cover, Mr. Vita? Just the point that there's the uh, traffic light report for the third quarter is on page 43 of your committee book. Thank you. Well, I would just comment that broadly speaking, this outfit is a model performer in terms of budget and schedule. And, you know, we're always grateful. Um, the Throg's Neck that uh, was just commented on was a tough job. It started out, the contractor struggled at the beginning, and it really was the team that kind of nurtured them to figure out how to get the schedule back. It was a significant accomplishment. So, um, you know, we, we're, we're sort of accustomed to you guys delivering on time and on budget. I just don't want it to go, I want it to go uh, un unacknowledged. The other is the significance, uh, the, the, the role that bike and pedestrian infrastructure is playing in the, in the, uh, the bridge and tunnel group's capital agenda. In, in virtually every project, we see major improvements to bike ped access, and um, that's very much in line with the bike ped plan that was uh, rolled out uh, by Jessica Matthew a month or two ago at this meeting, and, uh, and we appreciate how quickly you have moved to implement it. Please convey that to your colleagues as well. Um, I think it's questions, by, questions or comments from the board now that the chairman has gone on to great length. Others? Mr. Solomon. Just a question on the local hiring, which uh, i certainly pleased to see baked into the few projects that you had. So you said your target's 20%. Um, just curious about 20% of what? Is it 20% of hours worked? Is it by trade? Is it, how are you measuring how that 20% is reached as a goal? I believe it's 20% of hours worked. That's great. And I think the, um, in terms of recruitment, what are the recruitment processes that you have to really make sure that people in the community do actually take, you know, take us up on the opportunity? Well, it's the, the key to this is it's a, it, it is a provision within the contract. So our contractor, you know, just like with MWBE requirements, is going to be highly incentivized to show that they're making best efforts. Um, one of the things that we're doing at CND, and I think I was showing an image of, um, of a recruitment uh, session that we were holding in East Harlem is that we're really working hand in hand uh, with the contractors, our PMCs, our, our program managers, um, other, you know, DDCR, other uh, portions of the MTA to go out and do that active recruitment. One of the other things, uh, and we'll, we'll actually highlight this um, when we talk a little bit more about recent labor agreements, is um, you know, local hiring can involve employment in a number of different types of trades. It can also be back office, administrative work. 
We want to also ensure that local hiring results in real quality unionized jobs within the trades, and so we're looking at opportunities to incorporate pre-apprenticeships within our projects. There's a number of really good programs out there. The city, through Small Business Services, has been a pioneer in this. Um, so we're talking to the Building and Construction Trades Council about creating those pre-apprenticeship slots, which can then become apprentices if they, you know, they get retained within that project, and then they help to meet local hiring goals, but also they're providing a real pathway into skilled uh, trades for the folks that are doing the work. Anybody else? Ms. Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up on um, this particular question on local hiring, um, does the contractor then submit reports to the MTA with respect to, you know, what happens after the initial hiring and performance, et cetera? Yeah, yes, they do. And I'll also look to our general counsel, Evan Iceland, if there's anything you want to add on, on how we're actually enforcing this provision of the contract. So they They'll report similar to um, through the MW and DBE reports. It's a report in their contract that they're obligated to fill out. It'll probably be based on um, their certified payrolls as well. Um, but we'll be able to monitor that, and we'll work with Mike Garner's group to make sure that they're meeting those goals. Thank you. Can I just give it here? I mean, this is his, this is a major change, right? The federal government historically has not permitted, let alone encouraged, local hiring as part of the federal pro federally funded infrastructure projects, programs. And they, the Biden administration has done that, and now we are at the, you know, at the leading edge of major uh, infrastructure organizations to put in place an initiative to do it. So, um, I mean, we're very proud of that. I just want it not to be missed. This is new. Um, this is a significant step in the direction of equity. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you, the IEC, Mr. DeVito. Um, Mr. Cannon, procurements aplenty. Have at it. Thank you, Chair Lieber. Construction and development is presenting 19 procurement actions totaling $2.5 billion to the Capital Program Committee for approval this month. The procurement package includes 18 publicly advertised and competitively solicited contracts, including contracts for design build services for a new state-of-the-art bus depot in Jamaica, a new communications-based train control system for the New York City Transit G-Line, together with a maintenance contract for equipment, phase one of the replacement of the Metro North Railroad's Park Avenue viaduct. With this one, we are also seeking approval to enter into a project labor agreement for this project with the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York, a contract for installation of new elevators and other improvements at four New York City Transit Authority subway stations, and another contract for the replacement of 19 elevators and other ADA improvements at another 10 stations, together with maintenance, maintenance contracts for the new elevators. A new transit rail car accepting, acceptance and testing facility in Brooklyn, rehabilitation and flood resiliency work along the New York City Transit's Rockaway Line, power redundancy and resiliency improvements at the Bronx Whitestone and Verrazano Narrows bridges, flood mitigation at 26 New York City Transit substations, a new Long Island Railroad substation in Queens, Replacement of two AC traction power substations for Metro North. Replacement of Metro North Fulton Avenue and South Street bridges in Mount Vernon. An upgrade for fire protection system at the Long Island Railroad's Hillside facility. Replacement of an abutment wall at Transit's Coney Island Yard complex and the replacement of the St. Mark's Avenue bridge. And finally, an upgrade of the auto fueling systems at Metro North's Brewster and Harmon Yard facilities. There is also a ratification to an east side access contract for providing services in support of operator training prior to revenue service. All of these items are described in detail in the staff summaries contained within your committee books, and I hereby submit them for your consideration and vote. 
I'm going to take the privilege of making a motion on this one. This is, this is, this is big stuff. This is where we always wanted to get. Where we're pumping out a couple billion dollars in a single month on, on projects that you heard it. Those are all trans many of those transformational mm -hmm. projects. So I'm going to make the motion. And are there any questions or comments? Question, uh, Mr. Jones. Uh, this is just uh, a question. I see you bundled uh, maintenance contracts with the elevators, in a, and it's going to be sorted into, I don't know, how many different maintenance contracts, as opposed to doing this as a unified contract of maintenance. W why divide it up that way? So these are, these are design, build, and maintain contracts. What we've been doing with the elevator contracts is we've required that the elevator installer be affiliated with the elevator maintainer. We've given them a little bit more flexibility and the ability to design the elevators for our use, knowing that they're going to be responsible for maintenance at the end. And so that's how we've been setting them up. So, so there's the four stations, comes with an elevator maintenance contract, and as well as the 19 new elevators, similarly has an elevator maintenance contract with it. And the key, Jamie, do you want to speak? Yeah, it's it's just it's the uh, fulfillment of the principles of C and D, which is the you know aligning the the con, you know the who bears the risk with who controls the risk. So as Evan said, you know we have the installer responsible for maintenance. They're highly incentivized to install it in a way that it can be efficiently maintained. The last piece of their compensation hinges on the delivery of of elevators that meet meet meet, meet, meet the service standards. Um, Mr. Uh, Albert and then Mr. Brigham. The uh, rail car testing facility in Brooklyn, I looked and I don't see a location. Where is that expected to be? Is it Coney Island Yard or East New York or where? It's, 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 it's by Industry City over there. It's, it's, a, it's, a park, yeah. it's an e, It was an EDC-owned facility, provides an entry point into the system, and you can take, the idea was that you can take rail cars off of barges and get them over there. So it's yeah. in that, yeah. third, I think it's 37th Street. Somebody correct me? Yeah, it's in that area. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mr. Bringman. Uh, yes, you mentioned something about uh, services required before revenue service and east side access. Aren't we looking to have revenue service there within the next couple of weeks? <laughs> it seems yeah. kind of. Yeah. So that, that, just that's a, a, a clarify. That's yeah. a ratification of, a, of an authorization that the president made in, in order to do the physical characteristics training, which was teaching the operators how to operate on the new line. We had to, before we had the automatic power that allowed us to operate the power on, power off, we hired these contractors to do that for okay, us. Okay, so it's already, already done. Yes. All right, We're that's, just I just seeking want the your clarification. ratification of this change. Yeah. All right, thank you. Brett, any other questions or comments? We have a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? The motions carry on to the board with that pile of procurements. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that that concludes today's agenda. Is there any other comments or questions before we break? All right. Hearing none, may I have a motion to adjourn? We are adjourned. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to call the meeting of the Finance Committee to order, please. Mark, are there any public speakers? Uh, yes, there are. There are three, one in person and two uh, remote. Uh, the first speaker is Jason Anthony. Hey, Mark. Hey, Neil. I hope that you're feeling well. Hey, Kevin. Uh, I, I don't like to start the, the week with bad news, but unfortunately, the Port Authority last week approved their fare and toll increase is bigger than the proposed fair and toll increase that you propose for us, Kevin. Theirs is a, around 8%. The proposed fair and toll increase that you're proposing over here, Kevin, is around 5.5%. Uh, honestly, I'd rather go with the 5.5% fair and toll increase that you're suggesting. Because honestly, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, uh, they're a self-sustained agency, but they tore the bucket forward to everybody else. In other words, they charge me every time that I go to the airport. In terms of facility usage, they charge literally everything to everybody but I know that Neil is not happy about fair and toll increases but we should find uh, more more sources to avoid another future fair and toll increase because every day when I go to work I see people not paying their fair share like I do but I'll see you guys on Wednesday for my job on Amazon Stand Island. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Charlton D'Souza. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Passengers United. Uh, and one of the things I'm concerned about is in the finance booklet, you guys have the details of the new combined Long Island Railroad Metro North ticket. So if someone pays, let's say $5 for city ticket, I'm assuming, um, but then they want to get on Metro North, do they have to pay another $5? This is where it's confusing. I mean, I, I think, you know, if you buy like a $10, uh, $10.45 peak ticket from Queens Village and you want to go to, let's say, uh, Connecticut, how is that going to work? And is the New Haven line, um, in agreement of this, because I know once it leaves New York State, it's a different territory. So does the tariffs represent that? Because I don't see that mentioned inside the book, um, the, the one I read in the finance book. Otherwise, um, I just want to say that we should not have any fair increases right now. Our city is struggling. Uh, minimum wage people are struggling. So what we need right now is an expansion of the fair fares program. Uh, we also need, you know, unlimited Omni cards. And we need to encourage people to come back and even have transfers. Like if you buy a city ticket for the Long Island Railroad or Metro North, you should be able to get a bus or subway transfer. So I just want to wish all of you a very happy new year and a Merry Christmas from all of us at the Passengers United. And um, I know the MT has difficult times ahead, but we all need to talk to our elected officials because at the end of the day, it's a state assembly it's the state Senate and Congress that controls the budget. So on behalf of all of us at Passengers United, uh, my name is Charlton D'Souza, and thank you. Thank you. The final speaker is Marcel Dijon. So the MTA should implement integrated fares. So integrated fares means that every railroad ticket to the terminals would include a free subway transfer. It would mean that every intra-city trip would cost the same amount whether you take the express bus or you take the railroad. 
it means that if you took a trip from the Long Island Railroad to the Metro North service area, it would cost the same amount as the longer railroad trip and not a separate Long Island Railroad and separate Metro North fare. It also would mean that every trip to a destination in Westchester would include a free transfer to Nice Bus and or to, to B Line, and every trip to Nassau County would involve a, would include a free transfer to Nice Bus, and it would mean that every subway and bus trip would include unlimited free transfers. Now, this is achievable with just minor tweaks to the technology that the MTA already has in place. A railroad ticket, which would be purchased through the Train Time app, could be linked with an Omni account or a card to provide that free transfer. No new uh, devices required. Uh, a new tap for free transfer uh, pads could be placed at subway station exits and at the rear door of buses, which would provide a 30 or 15 minute free transfer window to another local bus or subway. And the main goal of this is to make a framework where the MTA can increase all day ridership. And the purpose of that is not necessarily to increase the amount of money that comes in through fares, but it's also to uh, dilute the MTA's enormous fixed costs across a larger uh, ridership base. So I hope that you look into that. Thank you. This concludes our comments. Okay, thank you very much. Next, we have the approval of the November 29th minutes. May I ha please have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Any questions, comments? Yeah, a very important correction. Okay. On page 34 on the top where it's listing the uh, new elevators, it's got 161st Street, B and D on the IRT Jerome line. It should say on the IND concourse line. And below that, 161st Street Yankee on the IND 4 line. It should be the IRT 4 line. With those corrections, I'm happy to approve. Okay, duly noted. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. And a vote? Aye. Thank you. The November meeting minutes are approved. The committee book contains the proposed finance committee work plan for 2023. There are no substantive changes to the work plan from 2022. I urge committee members to review the draft work plan and advise Chair Zuckerman and staff if you have any recommended changes. The work plan will be formally approved at the January committee meeting. There is no formal budget watch report this month, but Mark, can you provide the committee with a brief summary of financial results through November, please? Certainly. Uh, the November results are consistent with uh, what we've been speaking about the last few uh, meetings. Uh, fair box revenue in the month of um, November exceeded the mid-year forecast by 6.7%, um, and that's $23 million. Uh, and that's primarily due to the higher average fare than we had originally budgeted that we have budgeted in the forecast. Uh, uh, year to date, fare box revenue is $173 million above the mid-year forecast. Uh, and toll revenues continue to track very closely to the original budget and forecast. Uh, and there are $7 million above the, uh, the projection. Moving to operating expenses. Uh, they were $641 million below the mid-year forecast through the end of that of November, year-to-date. Uh, the trends that we've discussed before continue. Year-to-date, uh, payroll spending was $212 million uh, below the forecast, and that's primarily due to the existence of vacant positions that we've seen during the year um, at the operating agencies primarily. Overtime spending was $214 million above the mid-year forecast, and that's primarily due to absentee and vacancy coverage in New York City transits. Uh, Non-labor expenses were $484 million below the forecast year-to-date, uh, and that's mostly due to the timing of materials purchases, contractual pur uh, purchases, and lower than expected expenditures for employee COVID testing that we had built into the budget earlier in the year. And that's a high level summary of the results here today. Thank you, Mark. Are there any questions from the committee? Jamie, I have a question. Yes, um, Mark, hey, vac vacancies. How many vacancies do we, are you talking about? Um, yep, just hold on one second. I got that exact number. $6,000,000. 
So as of the end of uh, November, there were a total of, throughout all the agencies combined, non-reimbursable and reimbursable, there were 4,117 uh, vacant positions, uh, of which 2,500 roughly were non-reimbursable and 1,500 were reimbursable. So 4,100, okay. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, Pat, you're next to present uh, Finance Watch, please. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Finance Watch appears on uh, page 19 in your committee materials. We have three um, transactions to report. The first is a refunding. Um, we use the payroll mobility tax bond credit to refinance outstanding transportation revenue bond anticipation notes that were maturing February 1st of next year. And what we did is we just refinanced those notes um, uh, out to um, for a two-year period. Uh, at a yield of 2.677%, and that, that um, issuance was uh, bid competitively. Uh, next, we have a remarketing. Uh, we have um, 148 million of TBTA general revenue bonds. These are variable rate refunding bonds uh, issued in, originally in 2018, and we um, uh, replaced an e exiting uh, letter of credit provider with a new letter of credit from UBS AG, and this is our first time working with UBS AG as a letter of credit provider. We were pleased to do that with them. And then lastly, on November 30th, we executed a fuel hedge um, for ULSD, um, approximately 2.8 million gallons, and we locked in a price of $2.76 a gallon for that issuance. Um, and that concludes Finance Watch. Thank you. Um, there are four action items for the committee today. Pat, will you present the first two items? Yes, I will. The, um, the no, that's okay. The, um, the first item is that our, our normal, uh, normally we come in, in the month of December to seek authorization for um, uh, debt obligations that will be issued in the coming year for capital projects. And what we're seeking is approval for uh, $2.425 billion for the issuance of, of debt obligations for transit and commuter capital projects, and $1.474 billion for MTA bridges and tunnels. And that includes, um, if necessary, $325 million to be issued for the uh, Central Business District tolling capital, pro, um, uh, uh, capital work to be done on that. I, I would just note that this is a, 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 a two-year authorization, uh, but we'll, we'll, we will come back next December uh, to, to um, to, to provide an update on what we've issued and, and what remains outstanding and so forth. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take those now on this staff summary. Any, um, thank you, Pat. Any comments or questions? Okay, then I'll need a motion. motion. Second. Second. And a vote. Aye. Thank you. Next, I'll turn it over to Kevin to present the next two action items. Yeah. Uh, also included in the uh, in the in the in the resolution package is refunding authorization, so that uh, to the degree that market conditions um, are are attractive, uh, we're able to um, get into the market and issue refunding um, bonds or notes as as needed uh, in the coming year. So that includes that's included in the what we call this omnibus package. It allows uh, it, it provides flexibility to use any of our existing credits, um, and so I think that's. Um, uh, the, the refunding authorization is included there. Okay, good. Then okay. Um, I'm going to need to have any comments or questions on this action. No, and, the, and then we have the, the last one. We have there's there's one okay, one more one additional, which is the um, uh, the resolution to provide um, to provide for the uh, uh, subordinated contract obligation for the P3. ADA project that was actually approved last month, and this is just the final piece that uh, provides for that project to, um, uh, for the, uh, for the there's, there's two elements of, of availability payments that will be, that we're contemplating with the developer on the, pro on the project. There's a, a capital availability payment and a maintenance operating, uh, maintenance availability payment. And this authorization um, authorizes up to 350 million of subordinated contract obligations. So this is after our, our uh, debt obligations are paid, uh, before money drops down to pay for operations. This is what we call a subordinated contract obligation. This would be the first time we've uh, done this type of obligation in connection with a P3. 
And so that's what this authorization is seeking. That's right. So we'll need to vote on this as well. But are yeah. there any questions? Yeah, I think this got into the elevator issue as well. This this relates to the elevator maintenance issue as well. It, it, it does, but this is this is unique to the P3 um, uh, project delivery method for the 13 stations and 35 elevators, okay. not the design build, uh, not to be confused with the design build elevators that were okay. just authorized at the Capitol. Um, How long does the maintenance contract uh, go for? So it's a it's it's a 15 year agreement with two five year uh, renewal options at the at the uh, at the option of the MTA. Okay, and we start paying in in segments when they've completed something, or just we pay up front? No, no. This 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 comes at the, 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 there are very specific milestones in our agreement with the developer, so this wouldn't come up front. This comes as milestones are met um, with the, with respect to the installations. Thank you. Okay, good questions. Um, any other comments, questions? Okay, so we we'll need to vote on this. Um, can I have a motion? Second. Second. Thank you. And a vote? Aye. Okay, appreciate it. Now I think I can turn it over to Kevin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Um, the next action item is include, included and begins on page 36 and relates to the launch of Grand Central Madison service. It requests board authorization to establish Grand Central Madison as a Zone 1 station on a temporary pilot basis and also requests board authorization to launch as a temporary fare pilot the one-way combo ticket for trips combining travel on the same day on both Long Island Railroad and Metro North. Um, Mark's available to answer any specific questions board members may have. I have a question. Any questions? Yes. Blanca, yeah. Thank you. Um, just to, for clarification purposes, so for the first leg of the ride, it's a fare to the equivalent of off-peak, or is it, I, I just want clarification what the cost is, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. So the, the way the ticket is priced, the, the, you have two legs of the journey. The, uh, on the first leg on the railroad, the price, no matter what time, the price will be the off-peak price for that ticket. The second leg is a flat $8 fare, no matter what the however long the trip is. Regardless if it's peak yeah. or off-peak, it's an off-peak yes. fare. Thank you so much. Okay, yes. Sure. Yes, following up on the combo ticket, uh, what if somebody has a monthly and you want to go, can you use your monthly and just pay $8 to get the second leg? Or If I have a monthly from Patchogue to Penn and I want to go to New Haven, do I just, can I use my monthly and just pay $8 for the second leg? Or no? No, that's not contemplated at the present time. Okay, just one clarification. Andrew? Um, I understand why the combo ticket is a temporary thing, as it says on here, but why would the naming of Grand Central Madison, which is obviously going to be in Zone 1, be temporary? That's the part I don't understand. It's, uh, if I could answer that, it's just because technically... Uh, Anytime you establish a new station and put it into a zone, it really requires, on a permanent basis, it needs to be the subject of public hearings. So on a permanent basis, it will be part of the fair policy hearings later uh, next year. For the time being, we need to introduce it as a temporary pilot. Any other questions? Okay, then um, I need a motion to vote on this. So, second. Vote. Thank you. Kevin? Okay, the um, next item and, and final action item is included in the exhibit book and seeks board approval of the 2023 budget and the 2023 to 2026 financial plan. It also authorizes staff to take the steps necessary to begin the fair toll public hearing process. Um, I just wanted to read a few a few items. The uh, staff summary for the consolidated budget is um, in the exhibit book, pages 52 to 56. It's the same. The, the, the budget proposal has not changed since the presentation 
I gave in November. So it's the same as the uh, November financial plan. And again, it's a uh, before below the line adjustments. It's a $19.4 billion annual budget with um, $3.2 billion allocated to debt service and $16.2 billion for other, other expenses. Uh, primary revenues are on fair and toll revenue, $7.8 billion, and dedicated taxes and subsidies of approximately $8.6 billion, again, below, uh, before below the line adjustments. To um, refresh everybody's uh, memory, um, the proposed budget that I presented for 2023, before any actions, had a deficit of $2.6 billion, of which we're proposing to, to close that deficit with $100 million of MTA operating efficiencies, $111 million of savings from retiring the municipal liquidity facility borrowing, um, additional fare and toll revenues above the 4% base assumption, that's uh, an additional $50 million in 2023 on top of the, the um, approximately $150 million that would be generated by the 4% increase, and then a $1,785 billion of using the benefit of federal COVID funds to offset operating and debt costs in 2023. That leaves a remaining deficit of $600 million that we talked about that the current budget assumption is that'll get covered by um, new government funding that we've requested, and we'll report back to the board in February on that, or, or whether we would need to take additional MTA actions for, for that amount. So in, in the staff summary, just to walk through what you're gonna be recommending to, to the board, is to adopt the 2023 final proposed budget and four-year financial plan, um, the uh, approval of this plan will supersede prior board plan approvals for this period. Uh, it'll authorize MTA staff to initiate administrative procedures required for the consideration, but not implementation, of fair and toll changes in 2023. Administrative procedures include any required notices and conducting any required hearings. Only after required public notices and public hearings have been held will specific proposed fair and toll changes be submitted to the board for approval. It'll also, your uh, recommendation will to the board to approve the supplemental resolution, which is the first step for the retirement of the uh, municipal liquidity facility, the 2.9 bi billion borrowing with the Federal Reserve, we'll, we'll take the unspent proceeds and put them in a, in a redemption account for the retirement of the note in 2023. Um, it, it'll authorize the Chief Financial Officer to apply funds consistent with this approved budget and financial plan, which is, as I've laid out, which will target throughout the financial plan period covering operating deficits directly, looking, uh, uh, reducing debt costs, retiree health expenses, and or pension costs. Um, it'll authorize staff or their designees to take actions to implement the policy actions set forth in the plan, authorize technical adjustments when we bring the 2023 February plan Authorize adjustments of budgets to reflect labor settlements approved from time to time, um, and to take all other uh, budget and cash management actions as has been done in the past budgets to uh, for the purposes of the plan, which includes using uh, the advancing of the uh, Triborough Bridge and Tunnel operating surplus, applying certain dedicated subsidies the uh, MRT2 corporate account monies, payroll mobility tax, and MTA funds to offset operating costs um, pursuant to board action, and will allow certain cash management actions such as interagency loans 
and use of the stabilization reserve to manage the, uh, the cash flow of the MTA and the operating agencies. Um, at that point, I'm happy to take any questions. So, Chair Albert. Yep. Thank you. Because it appears that congestion pricing won't be online until 2024 at the earliest, does this budget anticipate still using PAYGO capital as part from the operating to capital? So the, uh, this current plan does assume congestion pricing comes online in 2024. And to, to remind everybody, the congestion pricing revenue is separate from the operating budget. It's all dedicated capital funds. The PAYGO money that's in the operating budget of approximately $100 million for this year is to fund past commitments of PAYGO capital that were made with respect to the 2015 to 2019 capital program, which specifically had a um, requirement for, for PAYGO capital. So if that's for prior, does that mean there is no PAYGO in this year 2023 budget no, no the hundred million roughly a hundred million is in the 23 budget that was uh, committed for in prior I see prior capital I programs see. but not spent okay yes, David. yeah I just wanted to uh, get a status report on congestion pricing um, it, it's like you know we keep hearing it we know it's been legislated where does do those negotiations stand without <laughs> yeah, messing I, up the negotiations. Um, I, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't have any updates other than we're continuing to go through the, you know, the, okay. the federal environment. Fine, I, I don't want to push the issue. So can I just have a point for clarification? We're taking a vote today to just move the action to the full board? Correct. OK. Yes. Board right. members. So we're just, we're just saying move it to the board. OK. That's right. Not a yes board. OK. That's right. Board Member Poor? Uh, yes, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, I had a number of questions regarding the proposed budget that I had shared with the uh, board members. And uh, I just want to report that Kevin and I have uh, discussed all those questions in detail, and they've all been answered uh, satisfactorily. And I thank you and your team for that. Thank you. That's great. David? And actually, a, a couple of us uh, before this meeting were discussing the notion of trying to change the uh, fiscal year to match that of the state. So I think a lot of us, this came up uh, with uh, Vanderpool before. Yes. We're, you know, sort of voting on things in the absence of understanding the state budget contribution. <laughs> and it makes, at least me, as one board member, a little nervous because we don't know the real deal. Now, in prior requests, we heard some examples that this might cause some fiscal dislocation uh, for us in the short term, but would even out over the years. Um, I think I'd like to bring this back to, to the discussion of how we might uh, bring this into line with, with the state's fiscal year. Yes, Sharif. I too would like to echo mm -hmm. um, what David was saying. I believe in 2018 there was quite a robust discussion before the Finance Committee about a resolution that was proposed to uh, switch the MTA fiscal year from a calendar year to another fiscal year, be it the state fiscal year, the city fiscal year, that was open for discussion. Your predecessor, Kevin, did explain and gave a presentation on um, how it would actually cost the MTA some money in the short term, not long term. So I think it is worth surfacing that again so we have a better understanding of the implications of making such a change um, so that when we actually do vote for a budget it's um, not loaded with so many assumptions we might have better information at our fingertips so I think that would be helpful to raise that again just for everyone's benefit um, and I too sure. just on this I understand as Hayda mentioned we're moving this to the full board for discussion I reserve comments that, and questions that I'll have at the board on Wednesday about the Understood. full budget. Thank you. Kevin, do you have any comment? 
now happy to look uh, at the, uh, you know, re-up the analysis on the fiscal year and the, the benefits, the pros and cons of moving it versus, you know, mm -hmm. keeping it where it is, whether we'd match the, the state or the right. city fiscal year and, you know, what the different consequences are. So right. Can you, report back. you know, that's something that I asked you um, time and time again, but can you tell us what the difference is if we moved it to, say, uh, April 1 or July 1? I know, not now, but... Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great conversation um, for the items that Kevin outlined and the clarifications. I need a motion, please. I make a motion. A second. Thank you. And a vote? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Now we can move on to procurements. Lou? Uh, excuse me, be, before we go to procurements, there was one information <laughs> item that I, that I neglected to mention in Finance no Watch. I just want to bring that. Back. Um, okay. So um, uh, the MTA All Agency Investment Guidelines were adopted by the board uh, in May of 2003 or annually uh, reapproved by the board. Um, in March 2020, due to the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on our revenue and the decline in the market generally, the board had adopt, uh, approved a, um, a limit increase to be, in, uh, to be invested in any bank or corporation from $250 million to uh, $500 million. In December uh, 20 of 2021, the uh, Treasury Department was faced with uh, enormous challenges to adhere to this $500 million limit per issuer for commercial paper, and that's our typical investment vehicle um, for our investments. And this was due to the, to the unusually large amounts that needed to be invested in the year-end market conditions. Uh, the investment portfolio at that time was $12 billion uh, due to, the, um, to the, uh, the, the COVID aid that we had received as well as a, a note that we had issued um, late in 2021. Funds would have been left uninvested with very limited options, and so in order to complete the necessary investments, Treasury had requested a temporary limit increase to $1 billion, which was approved by the former CFO. That increase uh, facilitated the investment process at the end of the year. Uh, it, it's important that we mention this because this was uh, the result of an internal audit where, the, where this matter was raised, and uh, Treasury had committed to bringing this um, verbally to the board as an information item. Uh, we don't anticipate uh, events like this occurring in the future, but um, we are, are on top of this and I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any on this. My head hurts. Explain this. So well, the, the investment guidelines that the board adopts for the investment of, 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 of our monies are, are very restrictive. Right. So, well, it's, it was originally adopted in 2003, but every year we bring that back to the board for a refresh and just right. r remind the board that uh, to the degree that we have in money to invest, there are very uh, strict limits on how we can invest it and where it can be invested. For example, for commercial paper, we, 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 we go to large commercial banks uh, who have ratings, the highest ratings were the A1 or P1 level from Moody's and S&P. So we're not going to go down the rating curve and invest in, in lower quality uh, commercial paper. So um, this, is, this is really just to adhere to that $500 million limit. There was a, there was a, a, a necessity to exceed that. Um, the, the banks that we were working with at that time on that day were MUFG Bank, which is Mitsubishi Bank, the largest bank in Japan, uh, Rabo Bank, which is a large Dutch bank, and the last one was Credit Agricole, which is a very large French bank. And, and they meet our credit quality standards, but at the time we had, we had trouble adhering to the $500 million limit. That was a one-day issue. But uh, again, it's raised here because uh, this was a, a, an audit matter, and we wanted to make sure that the committee was aware of the, of the issue. I appreciate that. That's good sure. information. It makes a lot of sense. Okay. Any other uh, comments, questions? Okay, now um, can we move up, oh, Sharif? <laughs> there you are. That's okay. I just have a technical question. I, I think it's an info item. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, related to the um, um, the repayment of the federal municipal liquidity, uh, you're creating a sub account for the PMT to be able to pay that. I just had a technical question about why that was needed. If now's the appropriate time, if not, if it's not the you know the appropriate time to talk about that, I'm happy to talk about it another time. Um, no, I'm I'm happy to address it. Um, 
uh, whether it was needed or not, we took it as the first step to set aside the monies in the redemption sub account to invest it. And part of the 111 million of savings is the earnings. We're going to, you know, know that the money's there to be able to um, put in into the budget. I think one important item in that redemption sub account is that um, r right now we're planning to you know, hold on to the funds. The note doesn't come due in December if the interest rate market changes where we save money by retiring it early versus earning the interest on it, frankly, then we can, we'll, we'll have approval to, to do that. There's also a provision that um, if the board decides at a later date, if we haven't redeemed the money, if the board decides at a later date that you want to move forward with the deficit financing, we can take the money out of the redemption account and bring it back into the, into the operating funds. I, which I assume satisfies maybe what you're looking for. <laughs> Anything else? Any other comments? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, now we can move on to procurements with Lou. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. There are no action items for MTA headquarters for finance committee approval this month. There is one information item for Long Island Railroad and Metro North approved by the respective committee earlier today. There are three information items for New York City Transit, also approved by its re respective committee earlier today. There are no information items for bridges and tunnels. There are no information items for FIMTAC. And this concludes the, uh, the procurements. Thank you, Lou. Um, the MTA consolidated financial and operational reports are included in the committee book. Uh, staff is available to answer any questions. Next. For real estate, David, you're up with the uh, real estate agenda, please. Thank you, Chair. Real estate has three action items for consideration and approval. There's one item for MTA Met Long Island Railroad. It's an authorization to acquire property interests by negotiated settlement or eminent domain in support of the Yap Hank EM Landfill Remediation Project in Brookhaven. The second and third items are for MTA Metro North Railroad. The first is the acquisition of easements. Um, at the City of New York's Hutchinson River Parkway extension in the Bronx in support of the Penn Station Access Project. And the second is a settlement agreement with Rite Aid Corporation for its retail space in Grand Central Terminal. There are in addition four information items, and I'm happy to answer any questions regarding any of the foregoing. I have a question. The, um, the property you're taking from the Hutch, where is it? And it says under amount to be determined. Right. The, law, the, the uh, statute passed a few years ago allows us to take the property first right. and evaluate a second. Right. And I will, we'll happy to provide you with maps of the specific locations. Please. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I'd like to see if I can get that map. Mm -hmm. Okay. Board Member Brigham? Uh, yes. Regarding the Yapank property, uh, you said something about landfill remediation. <laughs> Right. There's been work being done by the railroad to rem remediate certain problems at the, on the right-of-way, and uh, this project will acquire property to facilitate that. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out why that's our problem. I just, it's on our, it's on our right-of-way, then. Correct. Okay. And this has nothing to do with the grant we got from the state for the relocation of the Yapank station? That's something totally separate That's and correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, hearing no other questions, we need a motion. A second? I second. And a vote. Aye. Thank you very much. Um, Kevin, do you have any comments? I do. Um, just a couple uh, personnel items, um, sad to say, but um, one. Uh, Pat McCoy, after 25 years at MTA, will be moving on to uh, drive the Gateway Development Corporation um, full-time, uh, obviously an important project to the region, but, um, you know, we'll certainly um, miss Pat and, uh, you know, the uh, thank him for uh, the great, great service he's uh, given MTA over you know, many years. Had uh, thank you very much, Kevin. I appreciate it. It's uh, uh, bittersweet. Um, I, I've really uh, enjoyed and, and loved my public service here at the MTA uh, beginning in 2002. 
and um, I'm, I'm excited to continue that public service for an important regional project, um, and um, I intend to stay in touch with my colleagues here who I've really grown to appreciate and admire very much, and I, I thank the, the board for the opportunity to have served in this role. Uh, it's, been, it's been an honor. Thank you very much, Pat, Thank and you. I'll see you on the other side. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, right. and he has one more. And, and one more, um, Mark Young, a 15-year veteran of the MTA, um, again, is... Uh, Moving, moving on. So I want to thank Mark for his uh, tremendous service, um, both at uh, the railroad and now at, uh, here at, at Budget at he headquarters. Um, we're going to miss you, miss you also. Thanks. Um, as, like Pat said, it, I mean, working at the MTA for 15 years, um, I mean, working on these policy issues and finance issues, I can't tell you how fulfilling and enjoyable it's been. Um, and then as far as the board, many of you know me from pre-transformation. I spent most of my time in the railroad, Long Island Railroad, and did a lot of work with the railroad committee last two years here. It's been fantastic, and I really appreciate the opportunity. And I also, even though I'm here and, you know, a few of us are here before you, I just want you to know how hard the staff works. You don't see all of the staff. But there's a lot of staff that uh, get us to the point where we're able to present this information to you. So I... Really appreciative of it all. So, just I, if I may just jump in for a second, sorry from the peanut gallery, but um, and I'm sorry I can't be with you, Jamie. A great job today, but uh, I'll, Pat and Mark, I'll miss you both. Thank you for your service. It's um, been an honor to work with you. I've learned from you both a great deal about operating and capital, and so um, it means a lot for your service, and uh, we'll miss you. So, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. I'm sorry, I'm off camera, but Pat and Mark, what a loss for the MTA. And Pat, um, Mark, both of you, I've learned so much from both of you over the years of, of my interacting within the MTA. So thank you both so much for your service and um, see you both soon. Mark, I'll see you in the neighborhood. <laughs> Thanks, Midori. I didn't see you. Kevin, you have more? Yeah, no, just one thing in terms of timing. Um, Pat will be around for the January board cycle, so he's here through through the end of January. And I think, Mark, you're departing early January or mid-January, right? So this will be your last uh, last hurrah with the, the board. So okay. that's it. Okay, all the best. Um, next, we need a motion for the Finance Committee to adjourn. Motion. Second? I second. And a vote. Aye. Aye. The Finance Committee is adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>